Carter Zion stood under a single yew tree on a hill casually leaning on the hilt of his broadsword. The point of his blade dug into the dirt as he gazed out across the black leaves of Spectre Forest and the fog waters of Devil's Cliff. Out of the corner of his eye, Cutter Zion caught a figure approaching him from the bushes to his right. Cutter kept his attention locked on the peaceful view until the coward attempted a stealth strike. Then, in one graceful maneuver, Cutter Zion dodged the attack and kicked the figure into the trunk of the tree. Wake up earlier next time you try to get one over on me. A small smile turned off the corner of Cutter Zion's mouth. The figure crossed his arms. I am Death Hammer. Cutter Zion smirked. Of course you are. Death Hammer raised up a hammer in gulped in fire. I challenge you to a battle of glory. Accept my dual request. A sigh escaped Cutter Zion's lips. I hope you brought good loot for me when I cut you down like the peasant you are. Death Hammer sneaked. You think you're so tough, Cutter Zion. I've been training for this very fight since I got my fire hammer. To kill the great warrior is the reason I got in the business. Cutter Zion spoke in a calm voice that belied his disdain for the challenger. Trained, huh? Hope you can make this interesting for me then. Death Hamster, is it? Death Hammer clenched his fists. Hammer, Death Hammer. You know, this is the weapon covered in flames? Uh, forget it. Prepare to die. Cutter Zion worked an eyebrow. Take your own advice, kid. With a swift motion, Death Hammer leaped and swung his flame-covered hammer. Cutter Zion deflected the attack with ease. You can't escape your destiny. Death Hammer taunted. Cutter Zion parried another swing. Of wiping your blood off of my blade, you're right. Might as well give up now and save the both of us some time. Their weapon decked in a flurry of strikes and parries. Death Hammer grunted. Ah, you're no match for my power. Cutter Zion's response was unwavering. Strength alone won't save you, Death Hammer. Hammer! <laughs> Death Hammer's face crinkled in annoyance before he charged. The battle raged. The two adversaries exchanged no more words, only the clash of the steel. In the end, there was no doubt. Cutter Zion emerged victorious, fulfilling his destiny. He wiped his blade off on his opponent's shoulder as Death Hammer crumpled to the ground. A cascade of virtual blood pulled around the fallen challenger. The glow of his gaming screen highlighted the sharp cheekbones of Quinn Reeves, the professional player who had been controlling the avatar of Cutter Zion for the past seven years. And an esports champion for the last five, he chucked his voice dripping with arrogance. <laughs> Stupid noob, he scoffed. The bright screen was the only light in the otherwise dark room. Quinn reached for the cigarette nestled in his ear, popped it into his mouth, and lit it. He smoked and continued playing with the keyboard one-handed without missing a beat, pouring a beer into his victory stein with his free hand. He saw the next challenger at the foot of the hill and the green sheen of their emerald shield. He knew to equip a more functional weapon against that type of defense. The jagged daggers would do. He tapped the microphone button to directly address the players in the game and then spoke into his headset. Anyone else feeling optimistic? He asked, grabbing the Death Hammer's fallen fire hammer and twirling it around his right hand as if it were a little toy. His girlfriend, Sarah Alexandra, smiled as she entered the room. Three seconds to win. That's a new record. If I had to toast every time you win, I'd be an alcoholic. Quinn laughed, never turning from his screen, a smug grin on his face. Sarah was used to Quinn focusing on the game entirely when he played. 
She'd been his best gamer buddy since before the beginning of his professional esports days. They met in high school when Sarah was an awkward teenager and Quinn was the quiet and gangly gang. She often thought about how they had both grown so far from those past lives. Quinn was now a loud, arrogant champion, hard to shut up. And Sarah was no longer shy herself without the matted hair and bracelets to distract from her natural beauty and long, silky black hair. She cleared her throat. <coughs> Ready? Her tone carried a hint of tension. Quinn perked up. It's time to go? Sarah nodded. It's time. Well, we don't want to keep the guys at Club Elite waiting now, do we? Quinn dismissed a dual request notification from his next opponent. He detached his access card from his dedicated login device for the world's largest online RPG in the name of glory, grabbed his jacket, and followed Sarah out. Quinn dragged on his cigarette. You think they've been watching replays of my 1v1 wins? I bet I'm getting a raise. Sarah's face tensed. It's probably about our most recent match. We need a meeting over that? Couldn't this have just have been an email or something? He asked. It's our first time losing. Like ever. Maybe they think some FaceTime is due. Sarah responded. Ah, oh, this is about my teammates sucking so much. And this will be a complete waste of my time. Sarah glanced at Quinn, but refrained from responding to his cockiness. In Club Elite's conference room, the walls were adorned with digital screens displaying the rankings of the In the Name of Glory Professional Alliance, along with coinciding skill statistics. Quinn announced his presence with an arrogance that some, like Sarah, but not all, found in dear. So, is this about me being too good, or y'all being too bad? Elite's members surrounded a figure at the center of the room named Sonny Layton, who was noticeably ignoring Quinn's entrance. Those who did acknowledge Quinn only returned annoyed glares. Sonny, Club Elite's second best player, was the only person who seemed relaxed in the room. He was a tall, thin man with lanky arms and a glory. His glasses hung loosely on his bony face. He watched Quinn approach with black, beady eyes and a sly smile. You're in my seat, Quinn said to Sonny, slightly annoyed. But Sonny just sat there, ignoring him. I don't know who you think you are, but that seat? is exclusively for me. Still, Sun did not get up. It's okay. We'll find another. Sarah said, leading Quinn to the other side of the table. As soon as Quinn and Sarah took their seats, a short, pot-bellied man in a suit addressed the team. I know losses happen. We're all human. But losing this early in the brackets and to Blaze Esports is concerning. The players of the professional gaming organization quickly eyed Quinn accusingly. Quinn scoffed loudly, already over this meeting. The pod-bellied man fixed his eyes on Quinn. You must be Quinn. I'm Harry Void, new org manager. Quinn's face dropped. Yeah? What's up? Harry's eyes probed Quinn's with directness and not a hint of emotion. Leorg has decided to appoint Sonny as the new team captain, and he will take control of your Cutter's eye on account. Sarah gasped and stepped forward. Quinn's subtle tug on her sleeve made her hold back. He smiled and nodded, his eyes gleaming with hidden assuredness. Sonny snorted. I'll make sure this account is used to build up the team and not just for noob stomping. Sonny turned to address Quinn for the first time, speaking to him from Quinn's former throne. Sarah couldn't help herself. Quinn built this org up. The tension in the room grew palpable. You should show some respect for the one person who single-handedly kept this team from dropping out of the brackets altogether. A team member chimed in, paying no attention whatsoever to Sarah's position. 
We're tired of Cutter Zion constantly running into every team fight without us. Maybe if you'd get better at the game, you'd keep up with my initiations. Quinn shouted back. He then hastily pointed towards Sonny in disgust. You think someone like Sonny can create openings like I can? Harry interrupted. His potential is immense, Quinn. He was the most outstanding rookie and led the Golden High Org to 8th place last season. We brought him in for precisely this moment when things aren't working. You're crazy if you think giving him Cutter Zion will work, Harry quipped back. Well, Cutter Zion in your hands isn't. Quinn stepped menacingly close to Harry. Cutter Zion wouldn't be a battle god if not for me. Harry's face remained cold and impassive. The team's eagerness to embrace Sonny is evident, Quinn. Save yourself some embarrassment and step aside with grace. No one here takes you seriously anymore. They haven't since you stopped holding practice. It's very clear to us that Sonny is the best fit as the org's new leader. Sonny stood up triumphantly. Face it, Quinn. You're just a pub stomper. I'm actual esports material. His new team members cheer and clap infuriating Quinn only more. Quinn's eyes darted from the manager to the new kid, Sonny. What is happening? This wasn't a meeting. This was sabotage, a coup. His mouth hung open, dismay all over his face. The rug was being pulled out from under him, and he didn't have a floor to fall on. His life was completely sustained through the ore. It's how he made a living. To lose this income would be... Devis. Hand over the account card for Cutter's eye on to Sonny. Harry demanded. Look at him. A team member shouted. Once an unfazed, carefree battle god. Now he looks like he's about to cry. Quinn shook his head in denial. Cutter's eye on and I are... There's not one without the other. I forged that identity in the world of glory. Years and years of grinding and looting. Now I'm supposed to just give it up without any answers? He clenched his jaw and thought. Cutter Zion has been my constant companion for a decade. He evolved that character from a novice to the renowned battle god in glory. Harry held up a finger. If you remember, Quinn, when you entered the professional scene seven years ago, you signed a contract that transferred all rights of Cutter Zion to the Oregon Exchange for pay should have always known this day would come, and now it's here. Sarah watched as Quinn's fingers trembled when he held out his account card. It can't be happening. Not to Quinn. Not this. Sarah turned away, unable to watch. Sonny smiled. Take solace in the fact that transferring Cutter Zion to me will unleash the potential he deserves. The team members cheered. Sonny grabbed the card, but Quinn didn't release it from his grip. Let go, Quinn, Sonny taught. Or are your hands too old to keep up with your brain? Maybe you should retire. To everyone's surprise, a hint of relief flashed in Quinn's eyes as he handed over Cutter Zion. Quinn realized that without the Avatar, he no longer needed to listen to anyone. He was the champion of glory, not his fictional character. Quinn's trembling hands suddenly steadied. You know what? Fine. Quinn locked eyes with Sonny. Maybe I will retire. Let Cutter Zion and Club Elite sink off into oblivion without me. No way you have what it takes. Watch what you say. Sonny snapped as he tried to take the title of Battle God. Sarah sensed a strange sense of inferiority in Sonny. His face twitched in an unexpected lapse of composure. Sonny stared at the card, eager to have it. You think I'm the problem? Quinn said. I'll enjoy watching you steal in your own mistakes. He released the account card, then turned to leave. Quinn! Sonny's sudden call stopped him in his tracks. Quinn turned his head slightly. A smile formed on Sonny's face. Look, maybe we've all been a little too eager. The recent loss has made all of us anxious. But you don't have to leave. You can stay on staff. Be our training partner. Quinn gritted his teeth. Training partner? 
I didn't sign up to an org to not make its roster, especially since I've been team captain for this stupid team this whole time. Not in your life, Sonny. Sonny found this amusing and laughed. Oh, oh, come on. Someone with your skills would be wasted just out in the wild. You deserve to be the Alliance's top training partner. Quinn turned to the manager. I'm canceling my contract. You canceled the contract? Are you sure? Harry seemed surprised by such a drastic reaction. Quinn nodded affirmative. Yes. Cancel it. Sarah rushed over to intervene. Quinn, I'm concerned you don't quite understand what it means to cancel your contract. No money, no apartment. Don't do this. She whispered. Quinn was resolute and whispered back. Too late. I know this new org's ultimate goal is my departure. I'm a scapegoat in a room with amateurs. Wait for Mr. Falco to get here. He owns the team. He won't let this happen, Sarah suggested, hoping to calm Quinn's frustration. Quinn had noticed Sonny's mocking expression. The rest of the room sat there awkwardly as they let Quinn and Sarah finish their conversation. Quinn shook his head and laughed wryly. He raised his voice and said, Sarah, if they can't see my value to the team, then screw them. You know, it feels bad to not make the roster, but if you show them that you're the best in the training session, maybe they'll reinstate you. Sarah argued, matching his tone. It's not about skill. This is politics. Quinn explained. They are using me to hide their own inadequacies, and if that's their game plan, then I want no part of it. The manager, overhearing the recent exchange, interjected. Indeed, you have a choice here. Don't be hasty and make the wrong one. Sarah remained silent. She thought. I've witnessed Quinn's journey and his struggles to drag this org to the top. Her eyes welled with tears, knowing that he genuinely wanted to leave, and blocking him would only prolong the agony. Harry placed a hand on Quinn's shoulder. This is indeed your choice. Then let's discuss the terms for canceling the contract. To be honest, you've been with us for many years, and your achievements have been significant. We won't push too hard. Let's sit down and work out the details. Tell me the conditions plainly. Quay demanded. Sure, it's simple. Announce your resignation voluntarily, the manager declared. Sarah squinted. Voluntarily? If you leave instead of being fired, that means you trigger the non-compete clause. She was angry. She pulled Quinn to the side and said, Quinn, this is career suicide. You'll be paid out. The manager quickly interjected. I can bounce back, Quinn said with quiet confidence. Sarah responded with great concern. Quinn, you're 25 already. People who push 30 retire from professional gaming. A non-compete stopping you from continuing in this year's tournament play is practically retirement. Harry interceded. That's our terms if you'd like to leave, Quinn. We're just trying something different. That's all. We still want you in the or, And if you want out, then we don't want you using your skills against us. Quinn shrugged. Sonny called out. Come on, Quinn. Be my training partner. You're perfect to sharpen my skills for the big stage. A smirk grew on Sonny's face. Retirement is exactly what Sonny wanted out of Quinn. Sarah shook her head in refusal. Blocking him from playing for a year is a considerable setback. She whispered to Quinn. You're getting older, Quinn. Your reflexes will slow down. It'll be difficult to get up to speed if you take a year's break in your late 20s. Sarah was desperate to get Quinn to acknowledge his own physical limitations. Quinn may be a god in his fake video game, but he wasn't a god in real life. Quinn could not outrun his own age. But Quinn's mind was already made up. I'm out, he turned to Sarah. I've worked hard for so many years. Can I take a year off? Quinn said. What are you planning to do? 
Sarah was bewildered. Nothing much. Harry pulled the document from his briefcase. Gwyn glanced at the prepared documents and chuckled. <laughs> I see you've been ready for this moment. With that, he signed his name quickly. As he turned to leave, he glanced back at the place that had been his home for seven years. He locked eyes with Sonny, who grinned back. Quinn left without a farewell, and Sarah followed him in silence. With few words, Quinn left Sarah with a promise. I'll come back in a year and show this org the mistake they just made. Sarah remained silent, only nodding. She knew there was no use convincing him to stay. Quinn had made up his mind. Outside, snowflakes came down heavily on the street. Quinn's breaths were visible in the cold night air. Standing by the team's entrance, Sarah watched him walk away until he vanished into the distance. She wiped the tears that had run down her cheeks. When she returned to the conference room, it was loud with renewed mockery. She put her hands on her hips and turned to Sonny. How can you do that to him? Sonny rolled his eyes. Look, Sarah. If all Quinn wants to do is pub stomp 1v1s, then he's not a real player. Sarah clenched her teeth. Don't act like you're doing him a favor. Sonny looked squarely at Sarah and addressed her with a cunning smile. You're right, we're not. But face it, Quinn hasn't tried in a long time. He's not the champ he once was. The room filled with renewed cheers for Sonny, their new team leader. The king is dead! Long live the king! And to Sarah's dismay, the mocking of Quinn quickly resumed. Dude thinks he's our hard carry, but we're actually carrying him! Some Jeff. Locked out of a tournament for a year? Can't believe Quinn would ever accept something like that. Sarah bit her lip. At Sonny's reveling, she tried to remind herself that these people were still her teammates. Harry nonchalantly straightened his papers. He had no other choice but to accept. Sarah's eyes glared at Harry. Because he can't pay the penalty fee. Sonny laughed. He's a five-time champ. Did he just get nothing from all the screen time he got? Harry rummaged through his briefcase, avoiding eye count. Esports was smaller back then. It's not the juggernaut it is now. You weren't in that generation, so you wouldn't know. In the Alliance's early days, pro players didn't have the lucrative deals you players have. Thanks to players like Quinn, someone like you can make a pretty good living nowadays. Sarah sucked hopelessly trying to defend Quinn's honor to the bitter end. Quinn was a genius, and most of his earnings went to friends who needed help after they got fired from the team. Sonny glanced at the company logo on his game chair. Why wasn't he getting huge sponsorship deals? They still prayed pretty decently even back then. Harry finally looked up from his briefcase. No one knows. Maybe he purposefully ignored them. You would know more than us, Sarah. I don't know too much about his personal life, actually. Sarah admitted as she sat down. As I'm closer to him than anyone, he never talked about it much. He has his secrets. Sonny lifted up the Cutter Zion card that Quinn had given him. Good riddance, I guess. Time to make this character mine. The atmosphere in the room was growing more toxic. Sarah had heard just about all the trash talking of Quinn she could take. She quietly slipped out of the room on the pretense of going to the restroom. Harry buckled his briefcase shut. Okay, let's not talk about the past anymore. Mr. Falco has a busy schedule today and can't make it to congratulate you. But he gave me this bottle of wine from his collection just for your welcoming. A wide grin spread across Sonny's face. Thank you very much. With me, the elites will be champions once again. Wandering down the snow-filled street, 
Quinn finally decided to go home, where he could think about his options. Along the way, he stopped at a convenience store for a quick snack, potato chips, and a Coke before continuing. As he walked, he shoved one chip after another into his mouth and fumed in anger with each bite. Everything he had built was now gone in seconds, thanks to some jerk of a manager he barely knew. What a fickle industry. Erection. What a doggy dog industry. What was I even doing in it? Approaching his place, Quinn dumped the rest of the chip crumbs in his mouth, discarded the empty bag on the sidewalk, and slid the key into his lock when he heard a voice behind him. With all your gambling debts, do you think you can afford a fine for littering as well? Marlin Swan, a collector or bone breaker, depending on the situation. And the last person Quinn wanted to see on the same night he'd lost his job was behind. Quinn spun around. He tensed at the broad torso of his unwelcome visitor. So nice to see you, Marlin. Looking good. Marlin cracked his knuckles. Cut their ball, Quinn. You got their money? Quinn nervously looked over his shoulder. Of course I have the money. I mean, not on me, but I have it. Marlin took a step towards Quinn. Upstairs? Quinn shoved backward. Not quite, but I can get it to you soon. You better give me something now, because I can't go back to Miss Shaw empty-handed. Marlon was adamant. Quinn held out his soda. All I have is this Coke and... Marlon grabbed the drink from Quinn and started chugging what was left of it. Let's take a look in your apartment and see what we can buy. Quinn smiled sheepishly. Just so you know, Marlon, I'm a real minimalist. Don't get your help, Seth. I bet you got all kinds of gaming gear that can go for a pretty bet. Let's go. Marlin took the key from Quinn and unlocked the door. By the time Marlin turned around, Quinn was gone. Quinn didn't need this hassle. Not tonight. He knew he should have never played poker with real people. Quinn was a master at figuring out a game's mechanics and using the math to his favor. He frequently won in online poker circles that gave him confidence to play in person. But once he got face-to-face -face with an opponent, the human element became a bigger part of the game than he had realized. And he was never good at reading faces. And after several huge losses, he had incurred a healthy debt. Now, his foolishness was coming home to roost. As Quinn wandered the streets, he didn't have a destination in mind. Thoughts of money and how he'd lost his only source of income tonight swirled in his head. He had hoped to walk until his mind cleared. But the weather had different plans. The snowfall intensified, steadily soaking his shoulders with a relentless flurry of ice-cold flakes. His ears hurt, his lips shivered. He soon realized he needed to get in from the cold and fast. He knew a dive bar, Hudson's, at the corner of 3rd and Madison. That would be a good place to keep warm. Upon entering Hudson's, Gwyn took a seat at the farthest bar stool from the door. The bar was dim with little flick. Booths surrounded a ratty pool table. Next to him were two 21-year-olds playing a Galaxy bar-top arcade game. Gwyn knew the game well. He played it on plenty of nights after dominating the challenges of Cutter's Ion. The simplistic arcade game freed his mind to think. He ordered a shot and a beer, downing them both in quick succession. Alcohol usually helped ease the frustrations of the day, but tonight it did nothing. Slumping on the stool, Quinn's figures absent-mindedly tapped the wooden countertop. The remnants of his professional gaming career bubbled in his mind. The sudden firing replayed over and over in his thoughts. You're with but a team now. No matter how awesome you are, you still need teammates for glory. 
His gaze wandered over to the flickering Galaxite gate. The two guys, clearly struggling, hunched over the controls. One man jerked his entire body as he shifted the joystick. The other man gave his friend absurd instructions that wouldn't help the worst gamer in Galaxy, given the lack of progress. Left, 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 up, up! The friend yelled in the gamer's ear. Quinn watched the gamer go right and crash into an alien ship. You guys are really making Galaxy look like a Gonzag spore. One of the men apparently heard him and shot back. You talking to us? What are you, the coach? Get off it, pal. Quinn smirked. Looks like you couldn't be coached to learn your left from your right. Without taking his eyes off the screen, the gamer scoffed. I know what I'm doing. I almost reached the score bar. He pointed to his score, which wasn't even close to making the top ten. Quinn's grin grew. You look a good hundred thousand from the list. I would make it if this... QNN character wasn't all over the board, he replied. The friend snorted. I doubt you could do better. I could get top ten with one hand tied behind my back. Oh, yeah? The challenge was laid out like a high-stakes bet in a seedy poker game. Unaware of Quinn's history with the game, the two young men threw down the gauntlet. Get a score to put you in the top ten and your tab's ours. They yelled confidently. But lose, and you pay both of our tabs for the rest of the night. Quinn glanced at the bartender, who offered a knowing nod of approval. You're on. My tab for yours, he replied. With the agreement sealed, Quinn slipped onto the stool, fingertips hovering over the joystick. He dove into the game, a seasoned player in his element. The Galaxy Galaxy became his playground the beeps and bloops guiding his moves as he easily shattered the high score, which, of course, had been his own high score. As victory flashed on the screen, the men's faces contorted in disbelief. What the hell? One of them exclaimed, his voice heavy with accusation. An escalating tension filled the room, the air charged with animosity as the men felt the sting. What are you, some kind of hustler? Quinn shrugged. Just a guy who knows how to play. One of them pointed furiously at Quinn. We're not paying that tab. The bartender cleared his throat. Someone is. The bigger of the two men grabbed Quinn by the collar of his shirt. Get out your wallet. You cheated us. And you're going to pay for it one way or another. Police! Quinn shouted, pointing behind the men. As the two young men looked over their shoulders only to see nothing. Quinn ran for the door. I'll freeze in the elements before I pay the tab of some noobs like yourselves. The men chased Quinn out the bar. Get him, one shout. Quinn bolted down the street, veered into an alley, and out the other end. He zigzagged the streets, hoping the men wouldn't be able to follow him. Once again, he found himself trying to outrun someone who was after him in the freezing cold. His flimsy jacket did nothing to protect him against the harsh winter elements. He made a beeline for the closest establishment with the lights still on. Inside, the warmth welcomed him as he shook off the internal frost. It wasn't until he reached the reception desk that he realized it was a gamer's cafe, Area 51. He had never heard of it. That didn't mean anything. Gamer cafes were in abundance since the open-world role-playing games took the city by storm. Gaming computers, high-speed internet, and comfortable chairs were all that were needed to set up a cafe and rake in college kids' money when they wanted a break from study. The attendant at the reception desk rattled off the number of a computer for Quinn to use. Area 3, number 47. She handed him an ID card to mark the computer, only to find that he had already moved away. Unfazed, she put away the card familiar with such occurrences. Quinn scanned the cafe. It was spacious, with numerous computers and even a second floor. He made his way to Area 3, number 47. Just a heck of it. As he entered the gaming area, he tried to remain inconspicuous as he wandered down the long line of virtual reality bays. Gamers of all types played, some fairly good, 
others in need of some serious practice. When he reached number 47, he found it occupied by a woman engaged in a game in the name of glory. As she drooled in the arena, her ponytail whipped from side to side with her every move. Clumsy is the best word Quinn could find for her fighting style in the virtual world. As he observed her from behind, he almost mistook her for Sarah, but the contrast and demeanor was stark. Sarah exuded a calm gentleness, even in intense battles, unlike this girl, whose anger seemed to seep from every core. Quinn stood behind her, silently judging her tactics. She has some decent moves, but her aggression is getting the better of her. She's running into battle without a strategy. A shame. Her character was in imminent danger. And, as Quinn had predicted, an error led to her swift defeat. The player, Jen, abruptly shut down the game. Damn it! Her fury echoed across the room. Before Quinn could say anything, Jenny stormed out of the VR bay, almost colliding with him. You up? She pointed to the VR bay. Quinn nodded yes, and she stomped away. A smile tugged at the corners of Quinn's lips as he thought of her anger at losing. I know the feeling. I've been there too. He slipped into the bay, put on the VR headset, and slid his hands into the gaming gauntlets. He bounced on his toes a few times to loosen up. Quinn was back on his turn, the virtual landscape of In the Name of Glory. Except, of course, he wasn't playing as himself this time. He was playing as the Bay's previous player, who, in her fury at losing, had left the ID card behind. Jenny ambled down the gaming corridor, feeling dejected, having lost 52 consecutive duels in the arena against one player. Frustrated, she shoved her hands in her pockets and hung her head. I'm well geared. My account is decent. Why am I still losing? Despite her five years in glory, her opponent, with fairly common gear and even a few levels lower than her, outmatched her every time. Jenny stopped in her tracks to think. Maybe my opponent is secretly a professional esports player, trying things out on normal players like me. That has to be it. She heard her name. Hey, Jenny! A regular at the cafe was calling out to her. Why is that person playing on your account? The regular gestured towards her recently vacated station. When she looked closer, she saw that Quinn, the man who had been waiting for the bay, was battling the exact same opponent she had lost to 52 times in a row. And on her account. What the hell? Jenny flailed. Bay! You! She rushed back to VR Bay 47. With Glory's widespread popularity, the login devices had become essential in internet game cafes. Jenny had fallen prey to the common oversight of forgetting to remove her ID card and log out. Now, her character was in the hands of a man she didn't know, and who could do God's know what with it. When she reached the bay, she let out a sigh of relief. At least he wasn't looting the virtual goods she had spent the past five years acquiring in the game. Instead, he was immersed in arena battles, using her character. Jenny yanked the VR set from the man's head. Listen, you thief! I'm not sure how you do things where you're from, but in this cafe, we... we don't... Before Jenny could finish berating Quinn, a single large word appeared on the screen. Victory! Jenny stood there with her mouth open. What? How did you... Oh, hey, you're back. Quinn took off his gamer gauntlets and handed them to her. I saw you had some trouble with this guy, so I helped you out. Don't mention it. Quinn brushed past her, heading for the exit. Don't mention it? Jenny's mouth was still open from shock. Who do you think you are? Playing from someone else's account. Fifty losses is quite a losing streak. 52. That doesn't matter. I don't want randos snooping on my hard-earned character. Quinn shrugged casually. You're welcome, and it'll never happen again. She stopped him from turning to leave. How did you do it? Quinn gestured towards the screen. I'm just reading the meta. 
The opponent had a heavy weapon that could do a lot of damage, but made him move slowly. So I disengaged your sword and used lightweight arrows. They don't do much damage, but their speed more than made up for it. You had a high amount of damage output on your side, and you didn't realize it. Jenny's thought raced. Huh. She was stunned by this mysterious gamer's insight. Take it easy. Gwyn turned and walked toward the exit. As he looked outside, the snow continued to fall, and he had only that lightweight jacket. As he grabbed the door handle, a sign flopped against the glass. It read, Now Hiring, Night Manager. Quinn stood by the exit, staring at the Night Manager sign. He'd never done anything other than play video games before. The uncertainty of taking a retail job loomed over him. It's an internet campaign. And a night shift, too. I already stay up all night playing video games, so this is probably the closest I can get to that with a real job. Jenny Chen waited for Quinn to speak. She didn't know what to say to this disheveled man in front of her who just owned with her account. The word victory flashed in her mind as if she was still reading it on the game screen. How long had he had been using my account? She wondered. Jenny checked her wristwatch. Fifty seconds? Fifty seconds tops? Not even a minute had passed from the time she left the game to the time Quinn had used her account to win a round. Yet, her opponent, the one to whom she had previously lost 52 matches in a row, went down in less than a minute to this random person. Curiosity gripped her. She wanted to see this guy battle again to make sure it wasn't a fluke. Catching Jenny's wide-eyed stare, Quinn quickly explained before she could speak. You hadn't logged out yet, and when I put on the VR set, the fight had already started. Don't worry, I won. Jenny decided to get to the bottom of this. What did you do? Quinn sensed Jenny's impatience, and it amused him. I don't know, just played the game? Not well, though. That took longer than I wanted. Jenny's face dropped. She was astonished when he somewhat regretfully added, It's slow, I know. But your sets are inside-out type of motion tracking. I'm used to the outside-in tracking headsets. More precise movement detection when you have stations. On my old setup, it would have taken 30 seconds or so. Jenny's mind raced 30 seconds to defeat the opponent she had lost to 52 times consecutively. Who is this guy? Could he be a professional gamer? Nah, no way. Not this schmo. Jenny scratched her head. She'd never seen a professional gamer grace her cafe before. Although, if she was being honest, there were many esports players she wouldn't recognize in person. She'd only followed the scene for one team, so she barely knew the actual names of the other professionals outside of that. It was possible this guy standing before her was a pro, but chances were slim that she'd run into one in her cafe of all places. The pros don't need a cafe like mine to play in. Jenny stood there for an awkwardly long period, staring at the smiling guy in front of her. When Jenny didn't bother to comment on his speed defeating her opponent online, Quinn straightened himself and changed the topic. Do you work in this cafe? Jenny nodded. Yeah, I own it. Quinn pointed to the night manager's sign. Oh, that's good. I just saw the help wanted sign. I'm interested. Jenny's eyes went wide. Ah, yes, of course. Jenny hadn't expected him to be interested in the night job. She had been hoping to get a few gaming tips before he left. But if he worked here, that would be the perfect excuse to pick his brain. Without prelude, Quinn started pitching his abilities with confidence. Look, you won't find a traditional work history for me, but I know computers, games, and gamers inside out. I'd be well suited for the job. Jenny folded her arms. 
You know games and gamers, eh? Prove it. Beat me in a duel in glory. For the manager position? You don't have a traditional work history, right? Well, why do things the traditional way, then? Consider this your interview. Gent smirked. Quinn stared blankly, realizing that his victory was too professional, too good. This woman was curious about his skills. Maybe she was curious about him. With a bitter laugh, Quinn shook his head. I can't beat you. That startled Jenny. Why? Because I don't have an account that can be yours. Jenny furrowed her eyebrows, finding his explanation hard to believe. You learned to play that well with a low-level account? This is a man who in 40 seconds had defeated the opponent I couldn't beat in more than 50 tries. This man doesn't have an account. How did he practice to acquire this level of skill? Quinn shrugged. I gave away my original account. A puzzled look crossed Jenny's face. Why give away a high-level account? Jenny sighed. Do you split or something? Jenny's mind went wild with speculation about Quinn's motives. People sell their accounts when they want to quit. Or maybe he's a part of some shady account selling ring. They just definitely against TOS and Bannable on Glory. Quinn forced a smile. In a matter of speaking, I suppose. The account he had been referring to was the Battle God Cutter Zion, account that he had relinquished earlier that night. On the open market, an account like that would have sold deep in the six figures, maybe even in the seven figures. He would have been set for life, but the account belonged to the organization he had worked for, so he had no choice but to give it up when he canceled his contract as a professional player. Freedom is priceless, Quinn thought. Just then, Jenny had a thought. She remembered that Glory was opening a new server. It was not unheard of for players to sell their old accounts to start over on a new server. Jenny pressed him on this. Was it to get ready to play on the new server? New server? Quinn cocked an eyebrow and glanced at the date on his phone. The next day was in the name of Glory's 10th anniversary, and the company was opening a new world for play. That gave Quinn an idea. Okay. Well, if I start playing on a new server, I'll avoid all these esports chops. This can be my fresh start. Oh, yeah, I'm starting over on a new server, yes. Jenny cleared her throat. <clears throat> so, are you serious about the night manager position? It's from 11 at night until 7 in the morning. Quinn nodded. Yeah, that works for me, she told him the pay which was more than her employees who worked during the day. And she also told him that he would have free use of the computers when he wasn't working. Knowing he couldn't go back to his apartment, given the fact that creditors wanted to bash his face in, Quinn broached the subject of a room to sleep in. I, uh, need a place to stay as well. Any chance you have a room that I can bunk in? Jenny stared intently at the man who stood before her. She was certain she was going to give him the job. Up until now, no one had expressed interest. After all, who wanted to work overnight? It was a heck of a way to ruin any kind of social life. And if you had a significant other, well, the night shift didn't bode well for a relationship. But upon close inspection of the man she intended to hire, Jenny realized he did look a little worse for wear. His hair probably hadn't been combed in at least half a month. His face didn't look like it got a lot of sun. It was sickly pale. His eyes gazed at her listlessly. The youths that frequently visited her cafe often looked like this, as if they had never poked their heads out from behind a computer. But this guy was older and bore a stiff demeanor. And he looked dejected. Jenny almost laughed out loud. He's perfect for the overnight shift and perhaps she could sneak a few glances at his play to learn. After a long pause, Jenny told him that she did have a place for him to leave. But it's not exactly high-end. Quinn nodded. He wasn't expecting the type of luxury apartment that his old org had provided. Just some place out of the way, and, hopefully, safe. 
Before she hired him, Jenny sought to elicit a promise from him. Look, if I give you this new job, when your shift isn't busy, I'd like you to help me in glory. You know, just some tips so I can level up. A smile tugged on Quinn's lips. That's it? You got it. Jenny clapped her hands. Okay, then you're hired. Relief flashed across Quinn's face. Thank you very much, boss. Just then, Jenny wanted to kick herself. What am I doing? Hiring a guy whose name I don't even know. I didn't even do an internet search on him. Just a background check. For all I know, he could be a criminal. In her mind, she imagined banging her head against the wall at her own stupidity. She pictured her as criminal friends one night coming to her establishment and raking havoc. A knot formed in her stomach. Oh, God. What have I done? Jenny's face went white, and Quinn noticed her sudden nervousness. He thrust out his meaty hand as if reading her mind. By the way, the name's Quinn. Quinn Reed. Jenny put her much smaller hand in his and shook. I'm Jenny. During the brief handshake, Jenny couldn't help but repeat his name over in her head. Quinn. Reeves. Do I know that name? The name did ring a bell, but it wasn't the name of any of the players she followed. Come with me. Jenny instructed as she led Quinn to the reception desk to fill out an employment application, which she filed away with the intent to later examine every inch of to reassure herself he wasn't a criminal. After he was fully onboarded, Jenny turned to her new hire. You ready to start now? No time like the present. Jenny asked Quinn to tidy up a pile of keyboards and move them to the second floor for storage. Quinn complied and moved the keyboards to a concrete wall storage room. As he did so, he passed a small, empty conference room with big windows and enough space to stretch out in. He wondered if this was the room where Jenny was going to allow him to stay. It was modest, not nearly as nice as his apartment, of course. But until he could pay back Shaw and shake himself off Marlin, the debt collector, this would have to suffice. Gwyn figured that in the meantime when he wasn't working, he could hide out in the cafe and work on leveling a new character. As he worked in the storage room arranging the keyboards, he continued formulating a plan of attack. I can probably make some money even away from tournaments. Just being good at the game means people will throw money at you. Getting rare items for them, beating records for guilds, subbing in for qualifiers. Then I'll pay back Shaw and show those idiots at Elite what they gave up. He looked up to see Jenny leaning against the doorway, her arms crossed in front of her. You like it? Quinn looked at the concrete walls. It's okay. She pointed at the small bed crammed into the corner of the storage room. Good. That's where you'll be sleeping. Quinn stared blankly. Huh? He imagined that he would be sleeping in that bright and clean conference room. The sofa in that room would have been sufficient. Jenny looked down in embarrassment as she realized her new hire wasn't enamored with his accommodations. She cleared her throat. Sorry, as I said, it's not the greatest. Quinn looked around. On the west wall of the small storage room was a tiny window that directly faced the streetlights. When the storage room door was closed, dusky light shone through the tiny window, making it look as if the room was haunted. Quinn let out a sigh and accepted. No problem, no problem. It's so work. Using his better judgment, he refrained from asking to sleep in the conference room. The small storage room truly wasn't suitable living quarters, but he figured he could do worse. Could be out on the streets instead. Beggars can't be choosers. Satisfied, Jenny turned to leave. In your free time, you can go on the VR and play. Maybe you can start your new account on that new server Glory is starting up. In fact, if you do, let me know. I'd like to watch you level up your new account. Gwyn sucked in a breath. You're very generous. His voice carried the chill of sarcasm. Jenny was oblivious to Quinn's tone. I'll be here with you tonight to show you the ropes. No problem. Quinn gave her two big thumbs up, but the scowl on his face was still judging the room. Jenny put her hands together. Okay then, let's go downstairs. I'll treat you to a quick dinner. Quinn perked up. Oh, I'm starving. 
There are not many restaurants open at this time of night, but there is one nearby. Go pick out a few dishes for us and bring them back. I don't eat celery. Jenny fished out a hundred dollars from her pocket and slipped them to Quinn. It's snowing now. Quinn glanced outside with a concerned look. Jenny brushed off his concern, unsure what to make of it. A little snow won't hurt anyone. The restaurant is just across the street. So if I were you, I'd hurry up. Oh, and I expect a change. She shooed him away. Quinn tucked his hands under his arms and sprinted to the restaurant, shaking off a shiver as he got inside and felt the warmth envelop him. Believe it or not, there was a line even at this hour. As he waited, it gave him time to ruminate on the last 12 hours. His entire life had been blown up. He lost his job of seven years to some kid named Sonny. His apartment was now off limits until he raised enough cash to pay off his gambling debts. And now he got to sleep in a concrete box. But he wasn't about to let the day's events get him down. It won't be long before I'm back on top. I'm gonna cut Sonny down to size. Show Elite they made a huge mistake. And, hell, maybe start my own team after that. As he walked to get the food, Jenny pulled out Quinn's employment application, more determined than ever to figure out why his name seemed so familiar. When Quinn arrived at the restaurant across the street, he realized that he was much hungrier than he thought. He bought several orders of steamed dumplings, two cups of noodle soup, and a big rotisserie chicken to feast on. Indeed, Quinn had a case of the munchies. He returned to the gaming cafe Area 51, where Jenny was shocked by the sight of this veritable feast he had brought back. Quinn smiled with pride. Hey, tonight's celebration. Here's to my new employment as the night manager. Seeing there was more than enough food for two people, Jenny invited the reception desk girl and a few other employees to join them. The two cheered their cups of soups together and dined quickly. Jenny scarfed her meal down, having worked up her own appetite with all this late-night energy. She kicked Quinn's stool softly. Done yet? Quinn wobbled in his seat. What's the rush? Jenny showed her watch. It's almost time. It was 11.53 p.m. With only seven minutes until the opening of Glory's 10th server. We're going to be late. You're going to? Quinn was surprised. If Jenny's avatar, Smoke Shy, had started on the server's opening, it would be five years old now. While not comparable to his professional account, it was formidable among basic players. Take a look at all this excitement, Jenny said. The opening of a new server turned an ordinary day into a bustling one at the cafe. The rooms were filled with players, all eagerly waiting for the registration interface to open. Players rushed to climb leaderboards, clear dungeons, and be the first to kill a boss. The atmosphere was infectious, but Quinn, still picking at his food, seemed unaffected, lacking the go get -em spirit. Jenny crossed her arms in irritation. What are you waiting for? Quinn remained calm. What's the rush? I'm enjoying my meal. Lori's successful marketing had made it highly competitive amongst new players, but to a seasoned veteran like him, it was another day's work. Seeing Jenny's determined expression, though, he decided to give in and reluctantly put down his plate. What kind of gamer needs me to go to him in the play? Jenny grumbled behind Quinn's back. The receptionist stifled her laughter, realizing their new manager was no average game. Jenny took the VR station beside Quinn. She put her gaming gauntlets on and registered her avatar. The popularity of the other nine servers hadn't diminished much with the opening of the tent. Older servers retained their appeal, and starting a new in glory meant an intimidating amount of content. To grind... Jenny had invested five years in Smokeshy, making it a respectable character. She'd miss it as soon as she'd abandoned it. 
Moreover, everyone aimed to reach the cross server, heavenly domain, later on. This heavenly domain isn't just a map. It's a whole other world, Quinn. A vast expanse equivalent to the combined territories of five other servers. A realm of challenging dungeons, valuable gear, precious materials, and unparalleled freedom. The cream de la cream of players converge here, making the heavenly domain the ultimate destination for any game. Sure. Quinn's lack of enthusiasm shocked Jen. As midnight approached, the cafe buzzed with anticipation. In the final ten seconds, a collective countdown reverberated through the space as the echoing zero marked the end. The once dull gray shade of the tenth server login window vanished. In unison, everyone inserted their account cards into the login device. The tenth server was now open. Jenny turned to quit and nearly choked at what she saw. While everyone's eagerly diving into the game, this guy's literally browsing a beginner's guide on mission sequences. She raised an eyebrow, noticing it was some sort of hand guide detailing the order of missions. Damn, who did I just hire for my night manager? She asked him sarcastically. You really need a guide to Glory's early game? Quinn certainly didn't act the way she expected a skilled dueler in Glory to act. Calm down. It's been countless mega patches since I even touched the early game. Quinn smirked confidently. Jenny crossed her arm. Those things never help. Quinn yawned before saying, Oh, you know what they say. New server, new meta. Jenny was now visibly irritated. But you won that battle in 40 seconds. Quinn flipped the pages of the beginner's guide. I just so happened to spot the meta of that fight. Doesn't mean I'm going to immediately spot every meta, right? People with no time don't come to play. Gamers are people with spare time, Jenny argued, growing more and more suspicious of him. Quinn shrugged. I've been busy. Jenny curiously prodded. Doing what? Quinn smiled mischievous. Playing on old servers? Jenny was intrigued now. Oh? Are you a professional gamer? Quinn laughed. <laughs> I was a pretty high level one, in fact. Pretty high level? Pro gamer? Jenny probed playfully. Quinn nodded. Yeah. Then you must be retired. Jenny smirked, still not fully aware of who she was talking to. How did you know? It's obvious. You're already so old. Now Jenny was the one with the mischievous grin. Quinn laughed loudly. <laughs> Old? You should save that trash talk for the game. Jenny's eyes widened. The game? She'd lost track of time trying to understand this enigmatic gamer and now wanted to get moving. Okay, quit fooling around in the beginner's guide and let me hear your game plan, old man. As she started to slip on her VR helmet, Jenny couldn't help but ask. If you don't understand something clearly, you can just ask me. Quinn stood his ground. I want to research a bit first. I'll only do missions for attributes or skills. Other missions with rewards like experience or equipment. It's faster to go through dungeons. Right. This is the type of thinking a noob would have. You need to work toward leveling up. Only, you don't need to take too much time researching. Flip to the last page of that guide. Oh? When Quinn flipped to the last page, he saw this hand guide hadn't changed much over his ten years of experience. For missions and dungeon play, it stated a player should level up and said nothing about Quinn's strategy. Foolish, he thought. Maybe I should write a guide myself and give away all my secrets. Would be better than this out-of-date hogwash. Quinn took a step forward in game. And suddenly, he teleported back to where he was. Whoa! Quinn shook his head with his eyes closed. Heavy traffic plagued the opening of the 10th server. When he reopened his eyes, he saw players all around, trying to walk around and phasing through each other. Some managed to make more progress than others. Quinn merely stood there, 
Crowds and crowds of players blocking the majority of his view. He was buried deep in a crowd of lagging players. Hey, watch where you're going. Take the new weapon out of my face. How come we can't move? Player complaints about being stuck in a crowd quickly filled his ears, and Quinn tapped a hotkey on his gauntlet and muted player voice chat. Quinn reflected on his next steps. This reminds me of the chaos during the launch of the second server in Glory's history. The influx of players had overwhelmed the starting village, causing a mass freeze and prevented thousands from logging in. Seemed not much changed. <laughs> Eventually, the servers calmed and the crowd started to dissipate, everyone rushing to start their beginning quest. Quinn looked down at his own avatar. He named it the Ludhaw. In the name of Glory's username system had two spaces for players to name their characters. The developers had originally intended for players to name their characters with realistic first and last names, such as John or Jacob. Players that were accomplished in other servers would sometimes be awarded a third space intended for a nickname. But since the second the game dropped, no one took it seriously and the game ended up being filled with characters named after random nouns or objects. The developers rolled with it. Bloodhawk was a tall, muscular warrior archetype, wearing a simple but thick leather tunic with a colorful plume of feathers fanned out on his right shoulder. He donned leather shorts that weren't fancy, but were effective starting gear. I see they've given more stats to the starting gear for the 10th server. Should be gay. He glanced around at the nearest non-playable characters for his first quest and sighed when he saw that's where all the players had flocked to. Throngs of players converged around the lone NPC, creating a chaotic cluster. Bodies formed rings, restricting avatars from moving in and out. Players attempt to navigate by bouncing energetically, but at level one, their jumping abilities fell short. Quinn laughed as the growing cluster of players became a comical sight, with individuals repeatedly bouncing up and down. At least the server's not lagging as much anymore. Even seasoned experts found themselves powerless in this situation. Jenny, with a mix of joy and resignation, observed the scene, her gaze fixed on Quinn's avatar, noting his username, Bloodhawk. Amid the loud noises of players shouting, the situation gradually improved. Taking charge of his avatar, Quinn directed Bloodhawk to undertake several quests, guiding the character through educational tasks to familiarize himself with the 10th server, specific controls, and the game environment. I'll take the level 4 task, Bloodhawk told the NPC in the tavern. Not wise for a level 1. The NPC suggested, Bloodhawk boasted. You let me worry about that. Bloodhawk knew that tasks just above a player's skill level were doable and a great way to lift an avatar's skills in the early stages. Very well. The NPC barked and performed a funny, overly animated gesture. Go out and find my horse, stolen by a bandit hiding out in the caves of Phantom Dunes. Bloodhawk took to the quest with ease, his knowledge of the game and gameplay ability adapted to the new server immediately. He found the bandit without much searching and cut his legs out from under him with the rusted saber he bought from the level one weapons dealer. On his way back to the tavern, he battled a warthog for quick skill points and helped a bear cub get to a beehive. This led to a frantic chase as he ran away from the mama bear. A smile curled on Quinn's face. He hadn't had this much fun playing since his early days. These were seemingly simple quests. Quests meant to help him address player-created issues like other players stealing kills from him, kill-stealing, or KS. But to Quinn's surprise, they took an unexpectedly long two hours. Jenny couldn't help but sigh in realization prompting Quinn to comment on the futility of expertise in the vast sea of players. Finally done with the initial rigmarole. I'm now level 7, Quinn announced after turning in the last quest, only to find Jenny had succumbed to sleeping in a chair while still geared up in the VR equipment. 
Amused, he draped his jacket over her and returned to his gameplay. Reviewing Bloodhawk's progress, Quinn found a substantial 340 skill points at his disposal. In Glow, skill points were crucial for learning and upgrading skills. Different skills demanded varying points, ranging from 10 to 50. A max level character could accumulate up to 4,000 skill points through quests, with a potential limit of 5,000, although that required a bit of luck and strength. Glory characters had four basic attributes, strength, intelligence, vitality, and spirit. Strength affected physical attack, defense, and increased maximum inventory weight. Intelligence affected magic attacks, magic defense, and mana points. Vitality naturally affected hit points as well as stamina. Spirit affected the resistance to and duration of status effects. The four main attributes naturally grew as the character level. Only after level 20, when players began changing classes, did the growth rate change. Quinn. Despite forgetting certain quests and dungeon strategies, retained his skills without the top-of-the-line game equipment at Elite. He proceeded to strategically allocate points, opting for two level 5 beginner skills, Swift Run and Roll, from the Universal Beginner Skill Tree, allowing for versatile movement. Swift Run boosted running speed, utilizing stamina without a cooldown. Roll facilitated agile rolling movements in various directions, also without cooldown, but requiring some time to execute. With these master, Quinn delved into class-specific skills, choosing battle mage skills like Sky Strike and Dragon Tool, as well as skills from other classes. As he curated Bloodhawk's skill set, Quinn's choices reflected his expertise and versatility. However, to noobs and amateur players, his selection might have appeared unconventional, potentially eliciting ridicule. But through all this, Quinn found himself relishing a type of excitement he hadn't felt in a while. It was the feeling of starting over. Quinn was ready to reinvent himself in the game, and there was so much possibility ahead. Bloodhawk continued the quests. The early levels flew by. Skill matching was not an issue. Folks skipped the intricate planning, opting for a blank slate till level 20. Despite the freedom to pick a profession below level 20, most players had a basic idea between mage, swordsman, or gun. Then there were players like Quinn, exercising his mastery of the game trying his hand at every class. The greatest strength of skills was weapon bomb. For instance, learning the sharpshooter's floating bullet was useless with a sword. Bloodhawk would need to carry weapons from every class, a cumbersome hassle. Only the unspecialized players bothered with such things. Unspecialized players were a relic from the level 50 cap era. They were extinguished by class awakening. Current players glancing at Bloodhawk's skills wouldn't think of unspecialized types. More than likely, they just scoff. Quinn didn't care. When he got enough coins, Bloodhawk brought a bronze sword, passing a shot. Quinn quickly sold it. Next, he checked the warehouse chest, revealing an unexpected piece of equipment. Transferred accounts should be bare, no experience, no gold. But Bloodhawk on this tenth server held a mysterious item in his hands. Not every player would comprehend the weapon he held, but Bloodhawk did. Finding the equipment didn't bring instant joy as it should have. Instead, grief clouded Quinn's face. A rare tremor. Last seen on the night he lost his avatar, Cutter Zion. He shook as he took out the item. The Thousand Chance Umbrella, level 5. Weight, 23 kg. Attack speed, 5. Physical attack, 180. Magic attack, 180. 
No bells and whistles, a blank canvas, a weapon. The thousand chance umbrella's word color wasn't the usual white. It gleamed a metallic silver. In the name of glory, an equipment's tear was evident by the color of its words in order from least to most rare. White, green, blue, purple, and yellow. The silver hue of the Thousand Chance Umbrella didn't fit these categories. If Jenny were awake, her jaw would have dropped. Silver was reserved for self-made equipment, a hallmark feature of glory. Unlike in-game manufactured items, self-made gear came from an equipment editor, constituting end-game content. In glory, the saying went, Self-made equipment wasn't always powerful, but all powerful equipment was self-made. The battle god Cutter Zion wielded the self-made Silver Battle Lance Evil Annihilation, a standout, renowned, one-of-a-kind weapon. A typical feature of self-made equipment was its difficult creation process, resulting in its uniqueness. It could either be an exceptional peak epic item or just a piece of unique trash. So, the Thousand Chance Umbrella, either treasure or trash. He looked over at Jenny sleeping beside him in the gaming booth and wondered, If she were awake, would she know the weapon's details? Could she make an instant call? He knew. Top quality. The Thousand Chance Umbrella truly stood as top quality, surpassing the same level yellow equipment. With 180 physical attack and magic attack, it rivaled the best level 10 weapons. High attack weapons were bulky and sluggish, but the Thousand Chance Umbrella defied the norm. Maintaining an average attack speed of 5, this feature alone elevated its status. There was an apparent weakness. The Thousand Chance Umbrella possessed only fundamental attributes with no additional boosts. Moreover, being at level 5 meant it would quickly become obsolete. Quinn paid no mind to these drawbacks because he recognized the true value of the Thousand Chance Umbrella. After numerous equipments and failures, creating a level 5 Thousand Chance Umbrella was a significant achievement. A unique feature of self-made equipment was their adaptability. Through reasoning and planning, they could undergo continuous upgrades. Self-made weapons never became outdated and could be consistently improved using the equipment editor. Quinn equipped Bloodhawk with the Thousand Chance Umbrella. Let the games begin. Having the Thousand Chance Umbrella ready to go, he moved his avatar in the direction of the Green Forest Dungeon. It seemed as though Bloodhawk walked with a new air of confidence as he heeded the command. Green Forest Dungeon was a five-person dungeon requiring a level five player to enter. Achievements for players level 10 and above were invalid, excluding them from the dungeon leaderboards. Numerous open parties gathered outside. Bloodhawk received several invitation pop-ups. Quinn chose a team quickly, without quibbling over stats or records. He dipped. The party leader, Wolfclaw, jumped up and down as the players entered the dungeon. Nice, nice, nice! Looking like a formidable group of warriors. Quinn looked around and sized up his party companions. How are we splitting the drops from the hidden boss? Wolfclaw scoffed. Oh, how thoughtful of you. Quinn noticed Wolfclaw's response indicated he wasn't a complete noob. He knew what a hidden boss was, that's for sure. A party companion stepped forward. What's a hidden boss? Quinn acknowledged to himself. How oh, that's a noob. He spoke to the party. To encounter the hidden boss, a party had to be formed and the system would provide us hints for entering the dungeon. While the hidden boss is definitely stronger than the final boss, it dropped equipment that wouldn't be found otherwise. 
The party responded with excitement, showing Quinn that he and Wolfclaw were the only experienced players in the group. Quinn knew, with his peak professional skills, he could solo the small dungeon. But forming the party was necessary to face the hidden boss. And he saw the materials dropped by the hidden boss to upgrade the Thousand Chance Umbrella. He understood that compared to leveling up Bloodhawk, upgrading the weapon was a more significant task. In low-level dungeons like Green Forest, any dropped equipment quickly became obsolete. Except for experience, materials from the hidden boss attracted players. These materials never lost their value, drawing many even on the old servers to Green Forest. Wolfclaw seemed aware of the situation, swiftly proposing the distribution plan. Everything dropped by that boss is worth money, so we'll decide everything with a roll of the dice. The inexperienced party members were eager for Quinn's response. Sounds good. He had no grounds to claim everything for himself. Good. Now that we're all set, let's go, Wolfclaw declared. After receiving everyone's confirmation, he entered the dungeon. As Quinn entered, a loud snore resounded. Damn, any boss already? The sound simulator, it, in the name of glory, was remarkably realistic. The game was programmed with a sophisticated audio engine, where you could pinpoint the precise location of anything just by sound alone. No background noise, only the wind rustling through the grass, and similar sound effects echoed. When the headphones were worn, it felt as if a player had seamlessly melded with the virtual world. Hey, everyone, follow me, hurry up. Gwyn figured the person shouting was Wolfclaw, who clearly already knew where to find the hidden boss, Midnight Phantom Cat. A loud, booming laugh echoed as Quinn typed. Keep an eye out, Wolfclaw's voice followed, questioning. Why are you typing? Speak up, noob. Gwyn responded while extracting a cigarette from his pocket. Is someone asleep? So it's not smart to talk too much. He placed the cigarette crookedly between his lips in the real world and lit it. Oh, Wolfclaw acknowledged. Got it. Amid banter and laughter, the team continued. Green Forest, a low-level dungeon designed for player familiarization, seemed like a walk in the park. Monsters started crawling out of the shadows. Bloodhawk was first to warn his party. There's a horde of poison rats coming from the left. Try not to get bit, but let me know if you do. The team easily defeated these horrid beasts. Wolfclaw was no novice, skillfully orchestrating the entire journey. After Quinn had Bloodhawk cast two protection spells, Wolfclaw promptly designated him as a priest. This made him a pure support role. Although this low-level dungeon didn't necessitate an iron triangle battle tactic, Wolfclaw, accustomed to it, directed the group as if it were routine. He assumed the role of party leader. The other three players moved to the front line, dealing damage. Bloodhawk kept watch at the rear, playing the significant logistics leader. Steel clanged, killing and shouting sounded among the five-person party as they advanced swiftly through the dungeon. Gwyn's adept handling of techniques earned him unbridled praise from Wolfclaw and the rest of the group. The battles and onslaughts of monsters increased the deeper they trekked. In a daze of excitement, Quinn won. When was the last time I entered a dungeon with other players, especially as a support player? Years? It's more fun than you would think. He smiled as he invested in healing his team. As monsters crumbled one by one, Quinn's mind wandered. Memories of adventuring in the dark forest of the first server flooded back. This was all reminiscent of experiences from a decade ago with the friends he first started playing with. Quinn took a deep breath. Playing glory with a close friend, experiencing the game for the first time, 
joking and laughing nonstop, and the meticulous planning. Oh, the meticulous plans of strategy and defense. Gwyn's fingers gently glided over the keyboard. You had a great talent in glory from the beginning. A successful talent. The one thing I was good at. Better than most. Bloodheart cast a healing spell on Wolfclaw's body, momentarily distracting Quinn from the game. Wolfclaw regained his strength and commended Quinn, but quickly after stabbed his blade into a monster. His eyes widened, sensing a bigger threat approaching in the distance. Okay, here comes the Midnight Phantom Cat. The mention of the Midnight Phantom Cat brought Quinn's focus back to the game. Wolfclaw observed the area and strategized. The Midnight Phantom Cat's attack might put you in a cursed state, but there's no need for fear. However, it's fast, so it might take me a while to aggro it. Everyone, support me, stay calm, and stick together. Heads nodded, and Quinn remained silent, agreeing with the party leader's plan. Wolfclaw's excitement elevated everyone's spirits. He was a good leader. The system hasn't announced it yet. Comrades, we might be the first in the tenth server to kill a hidden boss. Forward! Wolfclaw commanded his team into formation. The five continued their advance. Black clouds shrouded the sun, casting a gloom over the green forest. Glory's first-person perspective led characters to lift their heads when looking at the sky. A quirk Wolfclaw noticed as everyone constantly gazed upward at the black clouds. Dragon Rider, no need to keep staring at the sky. The Midnight Phantom Cat won't fall up from there. Wolfclaw remarked in amusement. The party pressed on quietly, maintaining vigilance on their surroundings. Suddenly, a rapid rustling emerged from the depths of the forest. It wasn't the familiar sound of footsteps. Quinn sensed the slight change in the rustling. It's here. Cigarette still in mouth, he tapped his finger twice on the gauntlet keys. Bloodhawk swiftly leaped back, turning around in a single breath, staring into the Midnight Phantom Cat's direction of attack. Witnessing Bloodhawk's quick reaction, everyone understood that their priest had given them a timely warning. Everyone, retreat! Wolfclaw shouted, but he himself stood firm. He aimed to draw the Midnight Phantom Cat's first attack. The other stepped back and joined Bloodhawk maintaining a safe distance from Wolfclaw. All eyes were fixed on the forest. The rustling things ceased. An unsettling feeling spread throughout the group. Dragon Rider began. Why? But before he could finish, a black shadow shot out, accompanied by a shrill cat shriek. The midnight phantom cat's first strike had landed on Wolfclaw. Wolfclaw unflinching, brandish his sword. Good time, A small and agile monster tested a player's precision. Quinn had been assessing the skills of these players, expecting the Midnight Phantom Cat to take some time to aggro. He doubted his healing might snatch away the enemy, but that wouldn't be an issue. Quinn alone could handle the Midnight Phantom Cat. Wolfclaw's skills shone nevertheless. His precise sword timing cut through the air just as the Midnight Phantom Cat missed an attack. He executed a roll, and saving a heal from Bloodhawk, the Midnight Phantom Cat, quick to react, attempted another attack, but Wolfclaw blocked it with a well-timed shielding skill. Quinn couldn't help but praise Wolfclaw's unexpected skill. The Blade Master's ability surpassed Quinn's initial judgment. With a swift counterattack, Wolfclaw knocked back the Midnight Phantom Cat and unleashed a series of powerful moves. Cheering erupted as he skillfully coordinated with the team, creating a powerful combo. Wolfclaw command. Slaughter it! The team unleashed their skills. With Bloodhawk's healing support, they trapped the Midnight Phantom Cat in a vulnerable position. The situation seemed favorable. The Midnight Phantom Cat's cries filled the air, and everyone was jubilant. Quinn had a different perspective, however. Red Blood, stay vigilant. The Midnight Phantom Cat's life plummeted below 10%, entering the critical Red Blood phase. Many bosses exhibited more dangerous and unpredictable patterns during this stage, and the hidden nature of the Midnight Phantom Cat suggested 
it had such special abilities. And just as he thought, the cat transformed, increasing twice in size, massive, long saber teeth growing from its mouth. It went berserk. Its attack speed and damage escalated. The pressure of healing intensified as the battle entered a more challenging phase. No one could land a strike or stay clear of the cat's vicious, stabbing claws. The Midnight Phantom Cat's berserk mode increased the villain's strength and speed. It rampaged across the group with little adversity. Wolfclaw watched and moved to attack the monster when it went for the rest of the party. The novice players had trouble avoiding attacks and pushed Quinn to heal as quickly as his level 7 skill allowed. The pressure to keep up his healing cadence increased with the hidden boss's constant successful hit. Quinn assumed that, given Wolfclaw's skill, evading the cat's attacks would make healing it less challenging. To his surprise, Wolfclaw continued to engage the Midnight Phantom Cat directly, exhibiting somewhat restrained counterattacks. Quinn checked the parties through the in-game UI panel and ruled out mana issues. Wolfclaw's sudden shift to a less assertive stance made Quinn suspicious. Wolfclaw began a rallying cry just as Quinn was about to issue a warning, and the party faced their challenger. OT! Dragon Rider dropped back. OT? Quinn shook his head. OT, short for off tank, main tank in off tank. Roles within a war party engaged in combat. We use these in encounters where managing enemy aggro or aggression is crucial. Main tank takes the position in front to draw the attack of the enemy, while off tank attacks with little fear of retaliation. With the information, the war party took to the rules without question, Quinn thought. Middle of a battle was no time to argue, and Wolfclaw clearly knew this. With the main tank's grip slipping, chaos ensued as the off-tank struggled to redirect the berserker boss's attention. The shift in dynamics tested the group's cohesion, unraveling a tale of unexpected challenges and the intricate balance between survival and sacrifice. The Midnight Phantom Cat abruptly whipped his tail at Wolfclaw, tossing him aside and clawing at the nearby party member, Dragon Rider. Ah, oh, so sorry, Dragon Rider apologized, left vulnerable as he was alone. Wolfclaw hastily clarified. Mistakes like this can't be blamed on the main tank. All part of the game. Wolfclaw was becoming frantic. Stay still, don't attack it. Rushing. The Midnight Phantom Cat redirected its attention to another party member. Wolfclaw angrily protested. A chain OT? Are you kidding me? Shields up! The confused party member, a mage in cloth armor, couldn't withstand the berserk cat's onslaught. Reacting swiftly, Quinn ordered Bloodhawk to cast a heal. But the cloth armored mage's fate was sealed. Seven seconds later, the mage fell victim to the relentless attacks. In glory, a player's death in a dungeon meant their expulsion from it. The original five-member party dwindled to four. Wolfclaw exclaimed in frustration, Damn it! Lining up to OT! You guys are killing me! With the mage gone, the Midnight Phantom Cat targeted the third member, another cloth-armored mage. Quinn opted not to heal the mage and focused on keeping Dragon Rider alive instead. Healing could only stave off death for seven seconds. But in Dragon Rider's case, those seconds were critical. The Midnight Phantom Cat had inflicted a bleed status effect on him, and Quinn watched his life bar drain at a rapid rate. Even if the mage could be saved for seven seconds, both would perish within that time frame. Quinn rushed to prioritize saving Dragon Rider over the mage. Quinn's cigarette bounced on his lips. I'm losing faith in Wolfclaw. He's letting the team die while he dodges and barely attacks. If I didn't know better, I'd say he's doing this on purpose. Quinn controlled Bloodhawk to directly abandon the mage to tend to Dragon Rider. This abrupt move triggered anger in Wolfclaw. Why are you healing him? Do as I say and protect the mage. Quinn didn't reply. Without assistance, the mage collapsed instantly. While Wolfclaw angrily cursed at him, the Midnight Phantom Cat pounced on Dragon Rider without hesitation. Dragon Rider moved in a frightened man. Attack? 
Wolfclaw complained. Hit him, you ignorant noob! He swore while chasing the midnight phantom cat to pull aggro. Quinn calculated the time. Thirteen seconds. It was unclear whether Dragon Rider had bad luck or this was just the turn of the tide. Right when the bleed status wore off, the midnight phantom cat swiped at him again, immediately reapplying the bleed status effect on him. These status-inducing attacks had a small probability of occurring but it seemed as if someone added a 100% probability halo around Dragon Rider. Quinn dodged an attack, cursed, plead. Every status effect that the Midnight Phantom Cat could give he gave to Dragon Rider. Thirteen seconds. This was the amount of time Quinn could keep Dragon Rider alive. In this time, Wolfclaw could pull the beast, aggro, and save him. But what was Wolfclaw doing? The one sharp wolf claw who began the battle with precision was hitting as if his hands kept slipping on his controllers. Slice after slice, his sword hit nothing, swinging through the air. In the midst of his cursing and yelling, Dragon Rider finally collapsed. The Midnight Phantom Cat finally attacked Wolf Claw head on. Bloodhawk was considered the least threatening because his level was low, and he focused on healing but no one knew just how good Quinn's skill was. He didn't make any unnecessary operations, so the boss's aggro attacks never focused on him. Wolfclaw encouraged his group. Bloodhawk, stand your ground! Do you still have mana? Quinn flicked his cigarette to the floor. You should be the one to stand your ground. Wolfclaw enabled a double-hit medallion on his sword. Don't worry, the two of us match well. Beating it down won't be a problem. In the end, his hands slipped again, and the sword swooshed through the air. The Midnight Phantom Cat clawed at his face. Wolfclaw wildly howled, Add, add, add. A command for Bloodhawk to add life, which would in turn attract the full attention of the Midnight Phantom Cat. No response. Bloodhawk had been healing promptly and effectively the entire time. But at this time, he didn't cast a heal. Quinn refused to follow Wolfclaw's games anymore. I can't add. It'll OT. Wolfclaw looked at Bloodhawk. You little. He suddenly turned his head and saw Bloodhawk leisurely sitting under a big tree, looking coldly at him. Wolfclaw realized the situation wasn't looking too good. Wolfclaw paused and thought. This Bloodhawk wasn't a newbie. It was still early for it to go to OT. How could he have made such an error? Wolfclaw moved to Bloodhawk. It won't go OT. Hurry up and add. There still wasn't any reaction from the priest. The Midnight Phantom Cat had breached Wolfclaw. Wolfclaw's reaction suddenly quickened. He sliced horizontally and blocked the claw. He immediately leaped and began skillfully attacking as he had when he first began the battle. Wolfclaw no longer missed all his attacks. Quinn shook his head. How timely. But this time, his combo hadn't been as smooth because it was a berserk midnight phantom cat. Wolfclaw's movements almost couldn't keep up with its increased attack speed and damage. After leaping up, his combo attack missed, and the midnight phantom cat bit down. Wolfclaw flailed in panic. Help me! Don't just sit there! Hurry up and add! Although he could fight better than the cloth-armored mage and dragon rider, he wasn't unequaled. Quinn played dumb. Add what? Add life! Quinn took a long drag of his cigarette. Oh, you need life right now? I thought you could handle this. Wolfclaw was beyond angry. You can't be so naive. Quinn smirked. What a pity. If only you could fight the hidden boss on your own. Then you wouldn't have had to get the party together, take command as leader, and lead us into the dungeon to die. How regretful. Your skill isn't good enough, so you need to rely on others to kill the boss. You deliberately aggroed and then let the boss OT at the right time. The other team members would have been wiped out, leaving you with a low health boss to solo kill. The items would have certainly been yours. Whether or not you could finish the dungeon wasn't important at all compared to those treasures. After Bloodhawk finished his rant, Wolfclaw broke out in a cold sweat. He didn't think that this guy who had only said a single sentence along the journey to the dungeon, had seen through his entire plot.
he had let the midnight phantom cat O.T. unto the other three members to kill them. He had hoped that when the healer was still frantically healing the other three members, he would move the boss's aggro onto him. But he didn't think that Bloodhawk would suddenly give up healing. Could it be that this guy had seen through his plan at that time? That guy knew that he couldn't save anyone else, so he deliberately controlled the aggro so that it wouldn't fall on him. Could it be that he wouldn't heal him and let him die under the Midnight Phantom Cat's claws? Wolfclaw hated Bloodhawk, but promptly began attempting to persuade him. Bloodhawk, priest, let's not argue about this now. We have a hidden boss to beat. It's not like you know those three players. Let's team up to beat this Phantom Cat. We'll each have a 50% chance of getting each of the items. That's pretty good, am I right? 50%? Nah, I like 100%. To be honest, Wolfclaw ground his teeth. Fine, but items won't be the only drops. When the time comes, you take the first pick. Everything else, let's roll the die for. I can give all the equipment to you too. Without the assistance of healing, Wolfclaw knew that he definitely wouldn't be able to beat the boss. He could only say this. Who can believe you after the stunt you just pulled? Tending to be a leader and letting your team down. Those words almost echoed in Quinn's head as he considered his hands-off approach to his team at Club Elite. Wolfclaw immediately answered. Then, what's your proposal? His life had already dropped to half. He couldn't deal with the Midnight Phantom Cat after it turned berserk. Having to negotiate with Quinn only made it more difficult to avoid damage. He knew he would never forget Bloodhawk's name. He swore that he would definitely humiliate this guy one day. You don't need to worry about what I'm thinking. But if you must know, drop dead. You, you're crazy. If I'm dead, wouldn't you be dead too? Then no one would be able to take the items. Only a quarter of Wolfclaw's health remained. There's no need to get into a life and death struggle. Let's do this. You planned on taking it out by yourself. So, let's see what happens. Wolfie? Wolfclaw was losing health quicker by the second. You're an idiot. We'll both die. Have you gone mad, Bloodhawk? Do you know my guild's strength? Life cut down to one-ninth. You're finished, Wolfclaw. One hit point left. Done for! The midnight phantom cat clawed down, and the world turned quiet. Wolfclaw stared at Bloodhawk with dead eyes and fell to the ground. Bloodhawk had not moved in the last throes of the battle. He didn't fight. He didn't escape. After settling the matter with Wolfclaw, he immediately pounced over. Quinn laughed. His left hand flew across the keys on the gaming gauntlet, and his right hand moved the weapon control. For the first time, Bloodhawk brandished the Thousand Chance Umbrella. He opened it with a flourish of the wrist, and the umbrella glittered in Midnight Phantom Cat's eyes. He retracted the weapon a bit, making the Thousand Chance Umbrella into a lance. The Midnight Phantom Cat was in full berserk mode. Its eyes glowed red with rage. It turned to face the only opponent still standing, Bloodhawk. The boss lunged at Bloodhawk, claws protracted and dripping with the blood of his war party. The Midnight Phantom Cat lunged at Bloodhawk. One direct hit and his life would be drained completely. Quinn executed a well-timed roll, dodging the attack. He summoned Battle Mage Skill Dragon Tooth. The boss was stunned at the command. Bloodhawk's lance-like Thousand Chance Umbrella flew towards the Midnight Phantom Cat. The sharp steel cap of the umbrella stabbed straight into the chest of the opponent. The Midnight Phantom Cat wailed in pain. Bloodhawk leaped into the air, grabbed the Thousand Chance Umbrella, and swung the beast around. In midair, he placed the heel of his boot into the cat's face and kicked it to the ground. He dropped toward his fierce opponent, aiming the point of the umbrella at the monster's head. He whipped his tail but Quinn's agile skills shifted in the air, dodged the hit, and landed with the blade of the umbrella in the jugular of the Midnight Phantom Cat. Now, it was the monster who was bleeding to death, but that didn't stop the villain from its last full-force berserker attack. Jenny wasn't accustomed to pulling all-nighters, but with the launch of the Tenth Server, she stuck around to handle any problems and help manage the rush of customers. Open nights were always the busiest nights in the cafe. 
After working all week, preparing for the influx of people, she was quickly lulled into a drowsy half-consciousness, slumping back in her chair, missing all the action. She undoubtedly had a very poor sleep in the chair. Her head hung to the side. In this half-awake state, her ears tuned into the rhythmic keyboard taps and swift movements nearby. As a cafe boss, these sounds were familiar, yet there was something different in the urgency. Alternated between rapid and slow, gentle and heavy, the mechanical rhythm transformed the mundane into something resembling drums. Was this a dream? Sudden, jolting awake, Jenny focused on the noises. It wasn't a dream. The source was beside her, the newly hired network manager, Quinn. She sat up. Quinn's jacket slid off her onto the floor. She picked it up and noted his attentiveness to the game. For how long it took him to start playing? This guy is really invested in his avatar. Picking up the jacket, she got a whiff of the odor, which suggested it hadn't had a wash in quite some time. Jenny settled back down, intending to talk to Quinn. In an instant, she was dumbstruck. In front of her were hands that could move people to tears. Quinn's hands. These hands were unusually slender, with long, delicate fingers and smooth joints. They defied the rough appearance typical of most men. Clean and tidy fingernails contradicted his overall sloppy demeanor. His key taps were beautiful, like music. The tapping sounds were captivating, and his actions. Quinn's left hand danced across the keyboard on the wrist of the gamer gauntlet, giving Jenny an overwhelming feeling. His hands moved incredibly slow, but with great precision. Hand speed, measured in actions per minute, was crucial in games requiring numerous precise movements within a short period. Although glory wasn't a strategy game, complex skill usage demanded high hand speed. A player with high hand speed executed swift moves, directly influencing the in-game character actions. The strength and duration of each keystroke added complexity to battles. Longer presses added force to the hit of power behind magical spell casting. Not all changes were equally beneficial. Some players increased their actions per minute solely for show, continuously taking actions without purpose. True mastery, making every action count at a high rate, was reserved for pro-level players. The skill level divide in glory was publicly recognized at 200 actions per minute. Ordinary players attempting to surpass this limit often resorted to random key presses. Even for pro gamers, exceeding to 100 required specific battle scenarios against formidable opponents. Among ordinary players, 70% fell between 80 to 100 and 20 actions per minute. Experts who achieved 200 actions per minute signified a professional skill level. Jenny maintained a hand speed of around 120, occasionally exceeding it under certain circumstances. She considered herself an expert among ordinary players. Observing Quinn, she doubted his action speed had even reached 80. As this realization dawned, the rhythmic tapping sound vanished. The distinctive sounds were a result of his deliberate slow movements. I dreaming again? Jenny wondered, shaking her head. Attempting to hear that dreamy sound again, she strained her ears only to find it absent. The hands she now observed moved with an apparent disability, yet radiated a great skilled quality. Enthralled by these hands, Jenny forgot to look at the screen. When Quinn's hands finally stopped, she snapped back to reality and widened her eyes. Midnight Phantom Cat? The adversary collapsed to the ground at Bloodhawk's feet. Quinn began collecting his treasures. As she spoke, the Midnight Phantom Cat dropped numerous items from above. Simultaneously, an eye-catching system announced flashed on the screen. Tenth server, Midnight Phantom Cat first hidden boss kill, Bloodhawk. Damn! Jenny slapped Quinn's back. You've got talent, Quinn. You could make it as a sparring partner with pros using those skills. Disabled hands or not, being the first to achieve this was a feat even I haven't accomplished. 
Right as Quinn was about to inspect the dropped items, the unexpected slap almost made him swallow the cigarette. He lifted the VR headset and looked at Jenny. Disabled hands. Jenny shrugged. Yeah, you know, cause the way you move. Quinn's mouth dropped open. He put his headset back on. I don't want to be a part of this conversation anymore. Jenny was peeking at how Quinn played, but when she smelled the cigarette smoke floating in the room, she forgot everything about him being the first to kill the hidden boss. She pulled at Quinn's headphones and gnarled next to his ear. Who let you smoke in here? Huh? The cigarette in Quinn's mouth hung there habitually. He didn't even understand what Jenny was talking about. No smoking. Did you not see that sign? Jenny pointed at the wall. She took the cigarette from his mouth and tossed it in his water cup. Quinn turned and examined the two words on the wall. Are you kidding me? No smoking while I'm playing? It helps clear my head. Jenny pointed. It makes my head hurt. The smoking area is on the other side. Is there a gaming station there? Jenny shook her head no. Then what do we do? Quinn looked as if he had encountered an impossibly difficult problem. Jenny cocked an eyebrow. I guess you're going to have to not smoke or not play. Up to you. Gwyn scrunched his face. Sophie's choice. Jenny grunted. Quinn said, I'll go to the smoking area myself then. You should go get some sleep, Jenny. You're looking a little peakish. Jenny rolled her eyes. Wait a second. You never said how you got the first kill. Quinn casually rocked his head from side to side. Nothing much. The team all died. The boss's life was low. It was easy peasy. Jenny's face lit up. Oh, so it's like that. You know the reward for being the first one to kill this sort of low-level hidden boss isn't too special, but it is some good experience and money. There wouldn't be any top-quality equipment, of course, but this would be forever recorded on the standings, and you'll be somewhat of a legend on the server. Quinn showed no emotion. Oh, yeah? Jenny scratched her head. You know a lot of players like this sort of thing. Your name will be in the first boss kill records for as long as the server is around. To the majority of ordinary players, getting on this sort of standing could only happen at the beginner levels. Once the dungeons became harder, no matter if it was a regular or a hidden boss. Killing it required a certain amount of skill to beat. When they got to the heavenly domain, even those highly skilled teams had no chance. All of the records there were set by professional teams. Jenny moved closer to inspect what the midnight phantom cat dropped. I'll trash, except for maybe that cat fur breastplate. Might as well wear it. Low-level equipment isn't important. You can probably sell the midnight cat nails, claw, and opal. Not bad all around. Hidden boss gains are definitely worth a lot of money. A skill book? Damn, that's actually a pretty lucky find. Quinn, astonished like Jenny, also marveled at the low-level boss dropping a skill book. A low-level boss never has something this good. If it's not usable, it's at least sellable. Jenny shook her head. Sell it? No. Do you know what you have? It may not unlock new skills, but it does increase current skill points. This is one method to exceed 4,000 skill points. The book Bloodhawk picked up only added five points, but to have it drop from a hidden boss, it was still ridiculously lucky. Quinn promptly used the skill book. He realized what Jenny didn't know was that among the materials from the Midnight Phantom Cat, the Dark Opal and the Midnight Cat Nails were used to complete the Thousand Chance Umbrella. Quinn grinned, and he unexpectedly had Bloodhawk leave the dungeon. Jenny slapped Quinn's back again. You're not going to finish it? Even though Bloodhawk was the only remaining party member, the newbie dungeon could easily be sold. Despite knowing Quinn's lower action per minute, Jenny didn't think his skill level was that low. For him to defeat the opponent she lost to 52 times in 40 seconds, he could definitely clear the dungeon. Quinn prepared to leave the game. I need to change computers. Jenny glimpsed at the screen and suddenly shot her hand up to stop him. Wait a second. What is this? She saw in the chat window a wall of identical messages. She read, A shameless novice Bloodhawk, in order to steal the hidden boss goods for himself, 
didn't heal the party members on purpose and let them die? Everyone, be careful in accepting Bloodhawk to your party. These identical messages of anger and hate kept coming. Although the system automatically blocked profanities, people's originality was boundless. They used similar-sounding words to complete the insults. Quinn carefully examined the insults and found the culprit of the first one. He identified the name Wolfclaw. He also noticed the other party members, Dragon Rider and the Mage. Being the first to speak out, Wolfclaw had managed to twist the truth. Jenny looked puzzled. Did you really do this? Quinn opened his mouth to explain, but decided it wasn't worth the breath. Yeah, I love using noobs for petty games. Jenny growled. How, how shameless. Quinn nodded. Yeah, too shameless. Jenny tried to understand. Why aren't you mad? Quinn put a fresh cigarette in his mouth. I am angry. Some punks think I need help to take out a low-level boss. I could kill Midnight Phantom Cat with my avatar tied to a tree. Jenny tilted her head. So you didn't do it? Quinn stared at the screen, observing the wall of slander, yet his facial expression remained unchanged. Why let losers rile you up? Nah, don't need to give them the satisfaction. He even managed to smile as he logged out of the game and shut down the computer. Go into the smoking area. Jenny scoffed. What type of player are you? I closed my eyes for a minute, and suddenly all this? You meet a hidden boss, a skill book drops, and you even make a slew of enemies? Tomorrow morning I'll see if you're dead. Quinn bid her farewell with a smile. See you in a bit, Jenny. She watched him exit the VR bay wondering if he was as mean as he sounded. Jenny scrutinized Quinn as she watched him head to the smoking area. What a stupid troll. Luring new players into a dungeon with a hidden boss and having them slaughtered just so he can collect the loot? Dummies like that ruin the game. Jenny decided to sleep off the anxiety and talk to him when she had a clear mind. A haze of smoke floated around the smoking space, impervious to the relentless high-frequency ventilation attempting to clear the air. The ventilation was meant to prevent the smoke from leaking into the non-smoking section. Quinn seamlessly joined the company by lighting up a cigarette. He surveyed the area. It's much busier than the non-smoking section. Clayton, a chain-smoking gamer, exhaled a plume of smoke. When pulling all-nighters, few can resist the allure of a cigarette for that extra boost. Thankfully, there's a semblance of privacy. These booth partitions have the added benefit of safeguarding our play against wandering eyes. <laughs> he chuckled. Although, without these partitions, everyone's so engrossed in their games of glory, they are oblivious to the world outside their virtual lives. Quinn laughed in agreement. I'm Clay, or failsafe in glory. He held out his free hand as he took a drag from his cigarette. Quinn shook his hand. Quinn! I go by Bloodhawk when killing monsters. You see any open VRs? I think 23 just opened up. Quinn turned and spotted the available gaming area. Talk to you later. Clayton nodded to Quinn. See you in game, Bloodhawk. After saying the name, he paused to think why it sounded familiar, but he couldn't place it. Without much consideration, Quinn took the station. He logged back into the game donned his headset and immersed himself once more. Bloodhawk remained seated outside Green Forest where Quinn left him. Despite the crowded surroundings and conversations about the first night of the 10th server, navigating through this area was like strolling through a bustling market, but not so lively that he couldn't catch snippets of conversation. The constant party invitations from other players could easily be drowned out as he passed groups of avatars. They turned to him saying things like, That's the cheat who stole the loot of a hidden boss after letting his war party down. Quinn heard his name come up in many circles, and it was quickly followed by the words dishonor and coward. He ignored them all. Quinn scanned the chat box. The messages regarding Bloodhawk had already vanished. Players knew when a character logged off the game, their name was removed from the list of occupants of the local server. Wolfclaw 
being an experienced player, was well versed in knowing who was in and out of the game. Once Bloodhawk logged off, he stopped the messages about the treachery. It wasn't worth Wolfclaw's time to engage in futile arguments until Quinn logged back in. When seeing Bloodhawk's name on the server again, Wolfclaw took an evil turn. Bloodhawk's appearance in the records of the first hidden boss kill announcement had garnered attention. Wolfclaw's rage focused on attacking Bloodhawk's reputation. His trolling made people take notice. Quinn clocked Wolfclaw's messages as they returned. Damn it. That's why I can't get accepted into any war parties. Even the newest players want nothing to do with me. Bloodhawk struggled to find the party. All his requests were denied. Even if players didn't fully believe Wolfclaw's accusations, they began to guard against Bloodhawk. I can't blame them. Quinn could only laugh it off. If anything, not being able to join a team would only accelerate his leveling speed. As he found himself solo, he realized he wouldn't be splitting experience points with anyone. In Glory's dungeons, fewer participants meant more experience, although efficiency had to be considered. Having more people proved more effective, but Bloodhawk defied this norm. Building the powerful level 5000 chance umbrella sets me apart. While regular players mostly rely on insignificant beginner's equipment, the Thousand Chance Umbrella outclasses them by three to four grades. In glory, each grade equated to five levels, meaning the Thousand Chance Umbrella was on par with a level 20 or a level 25 expert weapons. This dominance in the early stages of the game could be deemed overpowered. Bloodhawk's weapon inflicted damage equivalent to four or five ordinary weapons. Considering character attributes, Bloodhawk was essentially equivalent to three P. Moreover, with Quinn's skills, his dungeon clearing speed matched or even exceeded that of a five man team. As Bloodhawk prepared to enter the dungeon, a player blocked his path. Without surprise, Quinn noticed it was Wolfclaw. He grinned and shook his head in disappointment. Hello, hello, Wolfie. Come to tell the truth or spread more lies. Maybe you want to write about how I stole your lunch money. Wolfclaw lacked any polite demeanor. Hello, my ass, Bloodhawk. You're not welcome on this server. Quinn burst into laughter. Want to join a party with me? I promise I'll wait till you pull some shady moves before I let you get killed by a mediocre boss again. The flat and nonchalant tone left Wolfclaw at a loss for words. He almost doubted that this was the same person he had raged against for half a day. While players on the servers may believe he was cheated, both he and Bloodhawk knew the truth. How can you act as if you're not a lousy cheat? You can't really deny it. Haven't you seen the message board? Wolfclaw quickly sent out another stored message twice. The shameless novice Bloodhawk intentionally let party members die to snatch the hidden boss loot. Everyone, beware. He eagerly awaited Bloodhawk's reaction. Bloodhawk casually ate a loaf of bread he took from his satchel. You're still at it? Shouldn't you be leveling up so you can sabotage more unknowing noobs? I... I want you to recognize your position, Bloodhawk. Your playing days are at an end. Do you now understand that my Iron Bee skill does not to be messed with? Gwyn clapped slowly and loudly. Wolfie, Wolfie, Wolfie. Sounds like you've been rehearsing this speech. To be honest, it feels a little forced. The context is entirely off. You should have waited till I was in a battle or in need of some kind of support. Let me get into a bad position so your meaning really sets in. This has to weaken the impact you hoped for. Hearing this, Wolfclaw turned red in anger and pointed at Bloodhawk. You know you can't find anyone to party with anymore. You're alone. Let's see you offend me again. To his surprise, Quinn laughed. Aren't you missing a priest? Why not add me? Wolfclaw was left dumbfounded. Damn, how low can you... Now that we know each other better, why don't we work together? Quinn sent him a party request. 
Wolfclaw did need a priest for his newly formed party, and it was clearly different players than before. Quinn examined his teammates. I see these other three players are all members of your Iron Beast Guild, so these are members from slightly older servers who had transferred to the 10th server. Makes sense why you wouldn't try to use them to steal the loot from Midnight Phantom Cat. You'd get kicked out of your great guild if you'd screwed them over. It all adds up. When you plan to claim the hidden boss for yourself, you needed inexperienced players to do, so you sought out four random players. Wolfclaw acknowledged this with a nod. Unfortunately, you were one of them, Bloodhawk. Who knew you would initially assist me and then betray me? It's not betrayal when you tried to betray me first, I think. I'm not sure. But I think that is called justice. Wolfclaw gritted his teeth. I couldn't use them to steal the loot, but my guild is helpful in slandering you. We tarnished your reputation in a matter of minutes. Wolfclaw eyed Bloodhawk, hoping for a reaction. But what was the result of tarnishing his reputation? This guy seems utterly carefree. With no one showing interest in him, he straightforwardly requested to join my party. I don't get it. Faced with this request, Wolfclaw found himself in a dilemma, unsure whether to accept or decline it. Wolfclaw felt lost. Having learned from his prior mistake, he sensed that Bloodhawk was no ordinary player. Definitely not a beginner. Wolfclaw hesitated. What's your goal? Before Quinn could answer, an Iron Beast guild member messaged Wolfclaw private. Snake Tongue messaged. That's it. This guy is asking for trouble. Once we're in the dungeon, we can do what we want here. What can he do? There are five bucks. Considering the advice, Wolfclaw weighed his options. He had four allies by his side, and there was no reason to fear this newcomer. Quinn joined the Green Forest Expedition with the four Iron Beasts. They traveled for an hour without any luck. They hadn't met a monster, not a small nest of insects, or a hidden boss. Quinn chuckled and asked, If you don't need me to heal, maybe I can leave a trail of crumbs so you don't get lost? Wolfclaw rolled his eyes. Just keep your head up and be ready for a fight. As Wolfclaw finished his sentence, a swarm of giant scorpions charged out of the shrubs. Wolfclaw commanded the four to rush and engage the monsters. Clearly, these four weren't absolute novices. Their well-practiced skills made a mess of the arachnids. Quinn watched. With this battle proficiency, two or three of them could easily clear the Green Forest dungeon. They meet to the mix significantly boosted their kill rate, and my healing lessened any threat of death. Quinn had no need for healing right now. He swung his thousand chance umbrella like a lance as he joined the onslaught. Sky Strike and Dragon Tooth were two attack skills in Bloodhawk's arsenal. In addition to these attacks, he also executed normal attacks. Players could control various attack patterns such as straight jabs, horizontal slices, vertical chops, uppercuts, and more through the direction and strength of the attacks. With Quinn's expert skill, his moves amounted to more than just the basic attributes. Sky Strike functioned as an uppercut attack with knock-up effects and damage surpassing that of a standard uppercut. Dragon Tooth, normally a straight stab, but in Quinn's hands boasted a quicker stabbing speed and the ability to stun opponents briefly. During a stun, the affected character couldn't perform any actions. Quinn found little need to rely on these skills. His normal attacks were more than sufficient to kill the green forest monsters effortlessly. Occasionally, when he withdrew his lance in an empty area, a monster would mysteriously be pushed onto him by the others. Quinn laughed and accepted the challenge, realizing that Wolfclaw and his companions were intentionally maneuvering these small monsters to surround him, aiming to create a dangerous situation. Being surrounded was no cause for concern for Quinn. He had faced more than his fair share of being surrounded by green forest monsters. Sending a sky strike toward one of the creatures, he broke out of the horde. 
with a horizontal sweep, his right hand chopped and slashed, causing the five little monsters to fall in line for their departments. The Iron Beast Guild watched without lifting a finger to help, witnessing Bloodhawk kill the monsters with lightning fast speed. His skill was nothing short of tyrannical, and the onlookers couldn't help but feel a twinge of jealousy. Snake Tongue watched awe. This guy's skill is impressive. The ranger of the group, Shark Hard, followed Quinn's moves. He's a veteran. Judging by his skill, he could easily solo the Green Forest dungeon. Wolfclaw crunched his knuckles. He knows this stuff. He soloed the Berserk Midnight Phantom Cat. Who would have thought this low-level player's skill level was above mine? Shark Hyde spat at the ground. With this level of skill, there's no way he would die in Green Forest. While Quinn battled the scorpions, Shark Hyde knocked an arrow in the string of his bow and aimed at Bloodhawk's head. I could take him out right now if you say the word. Quinn fought off the band of scorpions that the Iron Beast Guild pushed off on him. He was swamped, focusing on dodging, snipping claws, and jabbing stingers. Shark Hyde kept his arrow in his sight and pointed at the unwitting warrior's head. He waited for Wolf Claw's word to kill him. Snake Tongue casually sharpened his blade. How about we hit Spider Cave when we get rid of this dead weight and reach level 10? Wolf Claw scoffed at Snake Tongue. Spider Cave is a level 10 dungeon. It poses a greater challenge than Green Forest. Spider Cave isn't just a training ground for players to acclimate to the game. Spider Cave demands actual strategy and skill. Shark Hyde clenched his aim arm but turned an eye to the guild members. The name is meaningful, given that the dungeon's monsters are all spiders. Two types, to be precise. One type has a long-range attack, spewing webs that can bind players, while the other is a melee attacker, delivering bites with a high chance of poison. Webbed players aren't just bound, they are stuck in place, seeding ducks, and the poison has a strong dot. In Green Forest, only the hidden boss throws these kind of statuses at players. Hooded Vulture of the Iron Beast Guild cleared her throat. Hey, Spider Gate featured three bosses. A long-range fighter and a melee ranged, not to mention the ultimate Spider Lord. The hidden bosses include Spider Elite, Spider Warrior, and Spider Emperor. The rapid progression from levels 1 to 10 left many players still getting used to the early game. Opening the Spider Dungeon prematurely was an easy, instant death. Beginner guides wisely advised against attempting it, except for individuals with some level of skill, like Wolfclaw and other seasoned veterans. Wolfclaw watched Bloodhawk fend off the scorpions effortlessly. We take Bloodhawk in the spider cave. He can kill the spider lords for us, and after he helps clear most of the cave, then we can take down the guy. We'll only have four people, but we can still clear it with little threat. Snake Tongue nodded his head. As long as we avoid the hidden boss, we should be fine. Shark Hyde lowered his aim from Bloodhawk. You won't stand the chance against the hidden boss. Spider Cave is much tougher than Midnight Phantom Cat. Wolfclaw holstered his blade. All right, let's focus on leveling up first. When we hit level 10, we'll head to Spider Cave. Suddenly, Five-Ton Rhino, a previously silent guild member, raised his head. So we want to bring him a level up and then eliminate him? Is that smart? Startled by the comment, Wolfclaw realized the foolishness. Snake Tongue, however, quickly offered an explanation. Think of it more like letting him do all the hard work first, and then we cut him loose. Wolfclaw felt a sense of relief. Exactly. That's the idea. 
The four guys displayed a high level of aggression, engaging in covert discussions on one side while leaving Quinn to handle all the challenging tasks. Fortunately, they hadn't entirely dismissed Quinn as an idiot. After their discussion, they joined forces with Quinn to clear the monsters. Wolfclaw offered an explanation for leaving Quinn with the scorpions. Just a moment ago, our guild had some business to take care of. We were a little out of focus. We're good now. Quinn shrugged as if having no suspicion. Guilds are a work in progress. A lot of compromises to make them right. The Iron Beast Guild concealed their covert plans with the collaboration of the four seasoned veterans and the skilled Quinn. Navigating through this dungeon would be a breeze. Each kill brought them closer to the Spider Cave and Bloodhawk's demise. Their motives were well hidden. Snake Tongue leaned toward Wolfclaw and whispered into his ear. You notice this guy's DPS is crazy high? Wolfclaw grunted. It seems so. I don't know that lance like weapon, Snake Tongue admitted. I don't know either. I don't pay attention to low level lances. Wolfclaw eyed the umbrella. It'd be good if it dropped when we kill this guy. Snake Tongue swayed. Whatever. It's just a low-level weapon. I'm sure we'll find better DPS stuff pretty quickly. Wolfclaw nodded. True. Quinn and the Iron Beast Guild cooperated as they efficiently navigated in and out of Cream Forest. Despite their seamless collaboration, luck didn't favor them, and they failed to encounter the hidden boss Midnight Phantom Cat again. After multiple clears... Bloodhawk achieved the milestone of reaching level 10 before any of the Iron Beasts. This was a courtesy of the substantial experience gained from defeating the first hidden boss single-handedly. As Green Forest boasted only one hidden boss at that point, Bloodhawk swiftly climbed the ranks on the 10th server's leaderboards. Observing Bloodhawk's rapid advancement, Wolfclaw couldn't shake off a sense of nervousness. The fear lingered that Bloodhawk might abandon them mid-battle. The experience gap between Quinn and the Iron Beasts wasn't large. Following the dungeon completion, Wolfclaw and the others all reached level 10, acquiring a decent array of equipment in the process. Snake Tongue approached Quinn. Well, we make a great tea. Now that we've all hit level 10, why don't we tackle Spider Cave together? This sudden change of heart from Snake Tongue struck Wolfclaw as peculiar. Despite continuing to give evil glances at Quinn, Wolfclaw allowed Snake Tongue to play the role of a mediator. Quinn smiled. I think that's a great idea, but I should probably learn a few skills first. Skill points, whether acquired through quest rewards, leveling, monster kills, or dueling were all contributing to reaching the 4,000 skill points cap. Despite leveling from 7 to 10, Quinn hadn't accumulated enough skill points. Moreover, reaching level 10 presented an opportunity to acquire new skills. After slaughtering a few more nests of poisonous insects and cursed beasts, Quinn agreed to enter in Spider Cave. The entrance to Spider Cave was relatively deserted, as their swift leveling pace surpassed that of ordinary players. Newbies were unlikely to consider venturing into this dungeon so soon. Only a few randomly assembled parties lingered outside. Given the dungeon's difficulty, inquiries about equipment were standard practice before forming a party. Quinn and the others adopted a more direct approach, entering without exchanging a word. Wolfclaw and the three helpers took on a mischievous demeanor. Sharkhide spoke to Wolfclaw far from Bloodhawk's here. Should we immediately kill him or assess the situation first? Snake Tongue stepped forward. Let's observe first. If this person truly is an expert, let's utilize it. We can plan again when the boss arrives. No objections came from the other Iron Beast. In truth. Other than Wolfclaw, they held no grudge against Quinn. His exceptional skills and high DPS made them hesitant to kill him. They also refused to face their friend, Wolfclaw. 
they reluctantly proceeded with their leader's plan. Although unspoken, a tinge of regret weighed on their actions. Snake Tongue looked at his guild members. Did everyone bring antidotes? Only Quinn chuckled. <laughs> no need. Wolfdraw was uneasy about Quinn's confidence. This guy's asking for trouble. Snake Tongue grinned. Then let's go. The gloom of the spider cave hung in the stale air. Its rock walls were draped with spider webs that clung to every corner. The eerie scene was worsened by scattered bones and skeletons. Wolfclaw and the others inspected the dead with a hint of nervousness. In glory, death came at a cost. Experience loss. In the world, it was a mere 10%, and equipment had a slim chance of dropping. Once a player reached the heavenly domain, the stakes soared. Death meant a 20% experience loss coupled with a high probability of losing equipment. Bloodhawk bravely strutted through the cave, his battle lance raised for action. His confident steps were reminiscent of the sight of him in the green forest. Quinn pointed to the floor in front of Sharkhide. Stop, Sharkhide! There's a poisonous explosive at your feet! Wolfclaw and the others noted his immediate mind detection. Sharkhide froze. A fortunate turn of events for you to join us. Quinn, faced with these lower-level dungeons, found himself having a fuzzy memory of their contents. Almost a decade had passed since Quinn wrote guides to early game content, and the details currently eluded him. As Quinn sighed, a shadow lunged from a rock crevice, aiming directly for Bloodhawk. Swiftly, Quinn's left hand danced on the gauntlet's keyboard. His right hand manipulated his avatar with ease. Bloodhawk executed a graceful roll, evading the attack, and countered with an excellently aimed sky strike. A green spider closed in for a melee attack, but in midair, it succumbed to the sky strike's impact. Quinn seized the opportunity, unleashing a barrage of attacks. Four consecutive strikes landed on the spider, propelling it onto a rock. The arachnid landed on its back, dead. Its legs curled into itself. Snake Tongue watched in disbelief. No way. Puddin Vulture screeched, fear angled her voice. Pulled off a four hit combo in midair. Shark Hyde shook his head. At level ten? Oh. Wolfclaw could only stare in shock, unable to find the words. A four hit combo in midair, a battle mage technique known to few left the onlookers astounded. The simple yet precise sequence, straight jab, dragon tooth, and two hits from the level 10 battle mage skill double stab had been flawlessly executed. Nate Tongue faced his friends. Players with an action per minute of one spindy or higher can pull off this combo. No way he's a 70 plus APM player. Hooden Vulture scratched her head. Isn't Something only a pro battle mage can do after a speed buff. Wolfclaw ignored their admiration. He's still just an unspecialized character. Snake Tongue pulled his blade ready to help fight the spider. What's the speed difference between an unspecialized character and a battle mage? Wolfclaw shrugged. I don't know. Equipment comes into play, but it doesn't seem like any of his gear boosts speed. Bloodhawk's setup is pretty much like ours. Sharkhide looked at the Thousand Chance Umbrella. What about his weapon? Could that be the key? Wolfclaw calmed the group. Let's not get bogged down by the details. Even if you were a battle mage decked out in full set of speed boosting flowing light gear, could any of you pull off a four hit combo in midair? Silence followed. The sheer astonishment made a response unnecessary. The three members turned their attention to Wolfclaw. Just who is this guy? Snake Tongue, his tone grave as he directed his words at the other three, his gaze fixed on Wolfclaw. We shouldn't provoke him. Shark Hyde nodded. Absolutely. With his crazy skills, he must be an expert. Hooded Vulture stepped forward. 170 APM is just a conservative estimate. He's an unspecialized character without any gear. Yet he still pulls off a four-hit mid-air combo. His speed is probably above 200, right? Sharkhide rubbed his beard. 
Two hundred in our guild? Only our leader could match that skill up, right? Hooded Vulture looked at the guild members. Void fending him. We should recruit him. Snake Tongue's eyes lit up. An expert like him likely has a special background. As they discussed, Wolf Claw remained silent, understanding their rationale, but despising every word of it. After these dungeons, his resentment toward Quinn grew. At first, he only wanted to kill this guy. That would have made him content. But now... Learning that Bloodhawk was such a formidable expert and not easily contended with reignited his animosity. He couldn't quite articulate the feeling. Envy, jealous, and more swirled with him. Just as he was about to speak, he observed his three comrades gazing at Bloodhawk in awe, their mouths agape. Wolfclaw turned to look and saw that Bloodhawk's exceptional skill shone in all its glory. Green Forest's monster were too feeble for a full judgment. These creatures succumbed swiftly to Bloodhawk's high damage. Even the Midnight Phantom Cat, with its high health, fell under the onslaught of the War Party's multiple attack, observing the true extent of his abilities. Now, facing formidable spiders with substantial HP, Bloodhawk's skill level was laid bare. Wolfclaw grimaced. Doesn't matter. I'll make sure he never leaves his cave alive. Most of the guild members of the Iron Beast gasped in amazement, causing Wolfclaw to feel extremely annoyed. Just as he was about to speak, Snake Tongue turned around to face him. Snake Tongue pulled Wolfclaw's attention to Bloodhawk's skill. His combo has already reached 18. Wolfclaw nodded lazily, feigning injury. Hooded Vulture was equally in awe. It hasn't been broken ever since he made that four-hit combo. Sharkhide blinked rapidly. It looks like he's using the wall to rebound off and then use a normal uppercut. Wolfclaw rolled his eyes. Sharkhide saw Wolfclaw's annoyance. I really didn't think he would have been able to connect that sky strike. Wolfclaw inhaled deeply and crossed his arms. Okay. The guy has skill. So what? Snake Tongue approached Wolfclaw. Hear me out, Wolfclaw. Let's not take this guy out so quickly. We get that you and he have some bad blood between you two. But we think we should consider our options. Wolfclaw nodded in silence. A bit bitter, but aware that Snake Tongue and the others were gearing up to recruit this skilled player. What guild wouldn't want a player who can execute a mid-air attack with Sky Strike? I'm just guild fodder compared to this Bloodhawk. No one would go out of their way to make things difficult for this expert on my account. The green spider had been swiftly killed by Bloodhawk in a single breath. Snake Tongue and the others gathered around, genuinely impressed. Snake Tongue clapped. Bro, I see your skills are truly something to behold. Gwyn wiped the spider blood from his thousand chance umbrella. It's nothing much, just a little move I do in the other server to get rid of the pesky beasts that yield little to no experience points for me. Get the little bugs out of the way and make room for the big bosses, I say. Snake Tongue doubted any guild would get rid of such a skilled player. Bloodhawk was likely flying solo. In the other servers? Were the guilds in the other servers not good enough? Quinn proved Snake Tongue right. This tune has never been a part of a guild. Snake Tongue feigned astonishment with a look of disbelief. Really? You've never ever had a guild? Your level of skill can't be found so easily. How can any guild not want you? Quinn shrugged. I'm a fresh start. No guilds yet. Snake Tongue was puzzled. No guilds yet? There's no way I'm talking to a noob. He suspected a disagreement with his old guild that led him to start from scratch on a different server. This was an opportunity to make him feel welcome in the Iron Beast Guild. Hooded Vulture examined the Thousand Chance Umbrella. What server were you a part of before? Quinn didn't feel forthcoming. He didn't need the extra attention from anyone in his old world to know that he was playing on a new server. 
I forgot. It was one of the early ones, and I quit. Snake Tongue was a little hesitant. I oh, love Okay. How could we break the ice for this guy? It became clear that Quinn wasn't interested in chatting about his past. He continued deeper into the shadows of Spider Cave. This time, Snake Tongue and the others surrounded him closely, treating him like the core member of their party. Wolfclaw felt awkward, but remained silent. With Quinn overseeing them, they advanced smoothly through the dungeon. The four members who brought an antidote didn't need to use it because Bloodhawk skillfully aggroed all the spiders onto himself, dodging with running, growth, and jumping skills. At times, the group found themselves captivated by Bloodhawk's graceful movements, momentarily forgetting to attack the monsters. Snake Tongue slowed his pace. If I remember correctly, there should be a bunch of spiders back. After killing them, the first boss will appear. We won't know whether it's poisonous or a web shoot. It's one of the difficult parts of this dungeon. But take it slow, Ed. He noticed that Bloodhawk had already rushed ahead, initiating the attack. He had to correct himself. Okay, then let's go do this. Snake Tongue's memory of the caves were correct. This part of the cave indeed housed a nest full of spiders. Thirty poisonous and forty web shooting, totally seven. As they approached, all seventy spiders rushed out and attacked. Snake Tongue raised his weapon for defense. Wake up, iron beasts. Let's make mincemeat of these flakes. He hesitated to command Bloodhawk directly. He wasn't sure about the level difference between them. With 70 spiders, even Bloodhawk's skills might not be enough to aggro them all. At level 10, he lacked crowd control skills. So, Snake Tongue urged everyone to move forward and relieve some of Bloodhawk's pressure. Wolfclaw took his time to advance, hoping one of the poisonous spiders would get a lucky bite on Bloodhawk. Unexpectedly, with a swift motion, Bloodhawk shook the thousand chance umbrella battle lance in his hand. He executed a perfectly timed half-circle slash. Four spiders were instantly split open. Blood oozed from their thorax. Two spiders rushed forward, while two others shot out wet. Bloodhawk leaped backward, skillfully avoiding the spider webs. Mid-air, he spun, and with another shake of the battle lamp, struck down two spiders behind him. A no-look kill. He landed gracefully and flipped sideways, dodging another spider web. Rising with great speed, he executed a sky strike, sending the seventh spider airborne before it could even release its web. The Iron Beast Guild members were immediately baffled by the display of raw talent. Everyone held their breath, compelled to type out their astonishment. Make Tongue stabbed a small spider and looked at Bloodhawk. Is this to the fuck? Is he hacking? Hooded Vulture stepped back to get a better view of the moves. A 180 degree horizontal sweep! God! Shark Hyde dropped his jaw, spinning his body after a short hop backward and then striking two times with crazy accuracy. Hooded Vulture patted Shark Hyde's back. It's a perfect sky strike right after that roll! Not human! The unanimous belief resonated among them. While these were combinations of basic skills, not everyone could execute them with such precision. The 180-degree horizontal sweep was a standard attack, but the sweeping angle relied on the VR gauntlet control. Faster movement resulted in a larger angle. It also depended on the character's attack speed. At level 10, accomplishing a horizontal sweep like that wasn't within the capability of any ordinary player. Snake Tongue swung his blade, taking out a spider's legs, and turned to see Bloodhawk's progress. Bro, the way you use these battle mage skills is insanely good. I need to get you to show me some of that. Bloodhawk laughed. <laughs> it's not bad. Let's see if this works. Gwyn was surrounded by seven monsters, effortlessly stabbing, cutting, slashing, and chopping, as if handling a butcher's cleaver. The others felt embarrassed just watching him. Despite being veterans who could control aggro well, they wouldn't disrupt Bloodhawk's control over the seven spiders. What they initially thought was too challenging had been easily handled by Bloodhawk. 
Right after the seven spiders were killed, a strange shriek echoed, announcing the arrival of the first minor boss of the cave. Before they could even see the spider, a cloud of dense purple mist spurted into the cavern. Hooded Vulture covered her mouth. It's a poisonous spider. Stay out of the mist. The purple mist came out suddenly, covering a large range. Shark hide and snake tongue couldn't dodge it in time and immediately used antidotes. After using them, they were greatly alarmed. Their life was still declining. Snake tongue broke his antidote vial against the wall. Why isn't it working? Quinn continued dodging the purple smoke. The antidote gear is too low for this poison. Snake tongue and shark hide cursed aloud. What? No! They were under level compared to the cave spiders. It hadn't occurred to them to prepare for poison detoxification. They had meticulously readied two antidotes, only to find themselves unable to use them when facing the minor boss. What would they do against the big boss? Shark Hyde backed away from the spider. They've been cheated, Snake. Bloodhawk swung his arms and cast heels on each of them. Then he rushed up to face the poisonous spider. Simultaneously, he directed the two non-poisoned players, Hooded Vulture and Wolfclaw, pointing his lance backward. Hooded Vulture, stand at one o'clock. Wolf Cub, go stand at four o'clock. Wolfclaw coughed. <laughs> Wolf Cub, what? He knew it wasn't a time to argue. Without questioning, Hooded Vulture headed toward the her given position. Wolfclaw swiftly followed suit. Minor boss spider's poison mist had spewed out and was thinning. The spider was thick and strong, at least three times as big as the normal spiders. Bloodhawk moved forward. This massive beast was much easier to hit than the smaller midnight phantom cat. Large monsters have a different advantage. Due to their relatively heavy weight, uppercut or other displacement skills had a reduced effect. The extent of the reduced effect depended on its weight and the attacker's strength. The minor spider boss in front of them could be considered a huge monster. When Bloodhawk stabbed forward, it didn't even tremble. It was clear that this sort of normal attack would not inflict much damage at all. Quinn wasn't surprised by this. He's played for so long, he's seen it all. His fingers flickered, and Bloodhawk executed another powerful board hit combo. The minor spider screeched, raising its head and spitting out another thick paw. Anticipating the attack, Bloodhawk had already swiftly turned around and slipped out of reach of the death plume. Although this minor boss was large, its actions weren't slower than a normal spider. Its jumping power was remarkable. It leaped at Bloodhawk, attempting to crush him under its weight. Bloodhawk agilely flipped over and rolled away. Wolfclaw smirked, hoping to see the Avatar fall dead. Hey, bloody bird, do you want us to stand here so you can fight by yourself? Quinn kept moving with hate. Shark hide, snake tuck, one of you moved to seven o'clock and the other to nine o'clock. The poison spread through snake tongue and shark hide as they staggered into position. Life was fleeting with a dangerous foe eager to attack. Hooded Vulture hopped from foot to foot. How much of a gap between us? Quinn twisted to the back of the spider. A two-meter radius! After falling into position, the war party had formed a circle. They exchanged confused glances, unsure of their purpose. Wolfclaw scoffed. Are we just here to watch you play the game while you stole to the boss and get all the experience? Bloodhawk dodged left and right, bringing the boss running towards them. Coming your way, so you can prove your worth, wolf cub. The rest of the party immediately prepared for battle. Suddenly, the boss jumped high into the air, seemingly aiming to squash Wolf Claw. Despite wanting to dodge, Wolf Claw heard Quinn shout, Don't move! Wolf Claw felt his mind in a dazzling light. So this is how he plans to get his revenge. I knew he would take his first opportunity to let me die. Wolf Claw ignored Quinn's warning and rolled away. Turning around, he saw Bloodhawk executing a Sky Strike on the spider's stomach. Sky Strike had a greater impact than a normal uppercut. After the falling spider received this swift damage, it turned sluggish in mid-air, changing direction and facing the war party. Although the Sky Strike didn't have a significant effect, 
the monster fell nicely into the center of the war party. Snaketon, front kick it with full force. Hooded vulture, lunge, shark hide, repel. Little baby wolf cub, hurry up and return to your position. We'll have one shot to get this right, or we're all done for. The spider's mandibles twitched for blood. Quinn maneuvered his war party around the poisonous spider boss. Having spent enough time with the four players, he observed their skills and determined how to best use them in battles. Now, surrounding the spider, he directed each of them on which skills to use. The spider locked eyes with Bloodhawk, pulling its attention with aggro. It charged forward. Snake Tongue rushed up and delivered a front kill, a striker skill with a small knockback effect. Despite the reduced impact on the massive spider boss, it still managed to push the creature off balance. Simultaneously, Hooded Vulture leaped into action, executing a lot of Blade Master skill with a knockback effect similar to Snake Tongue's front kick. The boss was propelled backward and suffered another blow. By now, the seasoned players grasped Queen's strategy. Shark Hide embraced, countering with his repel, a knight skill renowned for its outstanding effects. The spider was inadvertently pushed to a position where no one stood. Originally, that spot belonged to Wolfclaw, who, suspecting Quinn's intentions were full of revenge, had dodged to the side. Though he rushed back to his position, it was just a bit too late. The war party comprehended Quinn's plan, turned the boss into a billiard ball, knocking back and forth between them. This tactic relied on the strengths of each player, rooted in their familiarity as veterans with a shared understanding of gameplay. Regrettably, this smooth coordination was disrupted by Wolfclaw's misstep, leaving Snake Tongue slightly discontent. Precisely when the boss was on the brink of escaping the encirclement, Bloodhawk suddenly jumped into Wolfclaw's position. A collective gasp filled the air. Bloodhawk had been stationed at the 11 o'clock position moments ago. Their eyes darted towards that spot, revealing another Bloodhawk. Snake Tongue was hit with the revelation. 10. Level 10 ninja skill, Shadow Clone Technique. The Shadow Clone Technique functioned as a sneaking skill, primarily effective against non-playable characters due to its difficulty in the system identifying the real opponent. When used in player-on-player -player duels, ninjas commonly employed it as an instant movement skill. Snake Tongue dropped his guard in awe. I've never seen someone use Shadow Clone like that. While his clone remains in its original position, every Bloodhawk employs the skill to swiftly take over the spot Wolfclaw abandoned. He not only recognized the mistake, he made up for it before the boss could react. Hooded Vulture witnessed the movement along with Snake Tongue. Unbelievable! Despite concerns about the lack of displacement skills for level 10 battle mages, Bloodhawk dispelled worries by showcasing technique over raw power. A sky strike lifted the spider boss, and in that brief moment, he surged forward, landing, who hit and nudging the creature toward Wolfclaw. Standing at Bloodhawk's original position, Wolfclaw felt a pang of embarrassment, anticipating criticism. Bloodhawk remained silent and skillfully directed the boss toward him. Understanding the task at hand, Wolfclaw executed a lunge, once again kicking the spider off balance. Prepared for ridicule by Bloodhawk, he was instead with amazement from Sharkhide. It's bleeding! I didn't even know the spider could bleed! The bleed status effect required either a weapon effect or a skill effect. Currently, no one's weapon possessed this effect but certain skills used in tandem could induce it. Double Stab, a battle mage skill, harbored a concealed bleed effect. Unlike a chance-triggered effect, this bleed relied on the player's deliberate activation. To trigger bleed, both strikes from Double Stab had to hit the exact same spot. It wasn't sufficient for both strikes to land. The second strike had to find the exact puncture created by the initial one. Only then would there be a chance for the bleed effect to manifest. Glory featured several similar hidden skill effects, each demanding intricate actions for activation. If an ordinary player managed to stab out a bleed, the others might chalk it up to luck. 
When Bloodhawk executed it, they attributed it to skill. They were thoroughly convinced of Quinn's high level of skill, not just in his individual skill, but also in orchestrating the team during the Poison Spider boss fight. He wasn't an ordinary expert. He stood out even among notable experts. Snake Tongue felt like an idiot for trying to recruit Quinn into their Iron Beast guild, considering they weren't even regarded as a top guild ranked over 50 in the heavenly domain with no dungeon records. Queen's Killer is way out of place in our small guild. He stayed active in the fight and suddenly considered Bloodhawk, decided to dungeon with him in that first place. Maybe a small guild is what he's looking for. I can work with him. While the others might have shared similar reservations, they attacked the boss in silence. Despite a few minor slips, Quinn's timely warnings averted any disasters, leading to the effortless defeat of the spider boss. The loot yielded decent equipment, though its low level made it inconsequential. Everyone insisted that Bloodhawk take it, and even Wolfclaw, without uttering a word, conceded. Examining the gear, Quinn found it a little better than an average level 10 belt. Graciously accepting it, he continued leading the group through the spider cave. Using a similar tactic, they confronted the second spider boss. This time, a web-spitting, long-range spider that mimicked an acrobat's agility. Under Quinn's guidance, the group corralled this web spider boss into a corner, employing consecutive stuns instead of billiards. Quinn's chain stuns neutralized the boss, preventing it from spitting webs again. The war party began to like Quinn more and more. He served as both their priest and main damage dealer, occasionally healing them and strategizing flawlessly. Sharkhide ran next to Hooded Vulture and followed Bloodhawk's lead. Words can't begin to describe his skill. He's leaving me baffled the more I see him fight. I feel like he'd do better without us. Sharkhide joked to ease his tension and test their reactions. He knew his strengths were the worst in his guild, and if anyone was to be replaced, it would hit. Hooded Vulture had more confidence in her skills. Speak for yourself, Shark. She could also read her worried teammate like a book. I'd pick up my damage rate if I were you, or you'll be in a guildless tavern begging for parties to dungeon with tomorrow. Sharkhide stopped running and stiffened at the thought. Hooded Vulture beamed as she left him behind to flounder in thought. The final challenge in the dungeon was the Spider Cave Spider Lord. This creature has a combination of all the strengths of the smaller boss. Strength, agility, web-spitting, and poisonous. But despite towering with eight hairy legs and a nauseating appearance, the Spider Lord didn't phase the war party. They knew that under Quinn's command, each was confident in the task at hand. Indeed, the fight proved as easy as the previous one. The Spider Lord, though a bit bulkier with added tricks, succumbed smoothly to Quinn's expert guidance. A loud, mechanical voice rang out across the entire server, reverberating to all players no matter where people were on the server. First clear! The announcement resonated with the names of their accomplished party, Wolfclaw, Snake Tuck, Hooded Vulture, Sharkhide, and Bloodhawk. The tenth server marked its very first Spider Cave clear. Snake Tongue and the others were awestruck, ecstatic over their unexpected achievement. While their leveling pace was faster than they could have hoped, being the first to clear Spider Cave was beyond their expectations. The credit went to the exceptional expert, Bloodhawk, without whom the endeavor wouldn't have been an uphill ordeal. Another party of five in the spider cave erupted into explicitives upon seeing the announcement. Hey, who the hell are these iron beasts? A sliver of health remained on the spider lord they battled, and with just ten more seconds, they could have triumphed. But... Those ten seconds slipped away, leaving them in regret and unwilling acceptance. The Righteous Warriors Guild, one of the three great guilds of glory, was the defeated party. They immediately theorized alternative attack plans that might have saved them ten seconds, but reality set it, and they left the cave empty-handed. 
Their guild's aspiration to be the first to clear every dungeon on the tenth server crumbled in their second dungeon. The Spider Lord had fallen, and though the five players had successfully cleared the dungeon, their joy was overshadowed by disappointment. The warriors spoke amongst themselves. Bloodhawk, wasn't this the player who killed the Midnight Phantom Cat? I think so. Where did this player come from? He's been announced twice. Sunrunner, he might be just as good as you. Sunrunner, much like Bloodhawk, had garnered server announcements twice. His background overshadowed Bloodhawk's, or what was known as Bloodhawk's current identity. Sunrunner was the tenth server's guildmaster of the Righteous Warriors. In the Heavenly Domain, Sunrunner embodied the Blademaster, ranking among the top five experts of his guild. Seasoned players understood that great guilds like Righteous Warriors had impressive professional clubs supporting them, and the true experts, though not professional, lay within those teeth. Behind Righteous Warriors Guild stood another professional club-supported team, Threatening Death Guild, a guild overseen by a pro gamer from the Heaven's Reigns team named Hugo San. Hugo was renowned as the Sword Saint in the Glory community. His Blade Master account, Severed Devil, rivaled the fame of the battle god Cutter Zion, during the 10th server's launch, Righteous Warriors Guild dispatched Sunrunner and others as pioneers to establish dominance by running through the new server, gaining as many titles as possible to better aid in gaining recruits. Only players from the three great guilds dared to fight for dungeon records on a new server. Little did they anticipate their plans crumbling within the spider cave, falling short by a mere 10 seconds. The disappointment weighed heavily on Sunrunner and his comrades, casting a shadow over their spirit. The mention of the name left Sunrunner confused. Bloodhawk. This Bloodhawk never surfaced in our extensive list of known names. How could he slip by unnoticed? The power struggles among guilds, especially against the Righteous Warriors Guild, unfolded in the Heavenly Domain. Over years of rivalry, they had become well acquainted with each other's experts. Sunrunner turned to his second-in-command, Grouchy Means. Any intel on his four teammates? Grouchy Means shook his head no. None. They're practically nobodies. Sunrunner nodded. Reach out to all our guild members in each village. Find out if anyone knows him or the Iron Beasts. The allocation of beginners to villages was random making it challenging even for Righteous Warriors guild members to connect easily. Most ventured alone, simultaneously leveling up and scouting potential recruits. Reaching level 20 and departing the beginner village, they would unite and form a guild. Sunrunner led the Righteous Warriors guild, turning his side into the de facto command center. In reality, no major guild could cover all beginner villages, given the randomness of player distribution. As Sunrunner delved once more into the spider cave for swift leveling, the awaited information finally reached him. The information they received added more chaos to the situation. The report disclosed an incident Outside the Green Forest Village, where Wolfclaw had accused Bloodhawk of deliberately deceiving the party and kill-stealing the hidden boss, Midnight Phantom Cat. Grouchy means sheathed his blade. This is some kind of a mess. Bloodhawk allegedly tricked a player to secure the first hidden boss kill, then formed a party with that same player to be the first to clear the spider cave. I don't get how any of that could happen especially teaming with your known saboteur. Sunrunner urged his party forward. Let's not dwell on it for now. Focus on training, and sometime later we'll cross paths with them when we reach level 20. Outside the spider cave near a certain village, Snake Tongue remained immersed in the thrill of being the first to kill a dungeon. It was an accolade they never thought to hope for when they started on this server and to have it so soon almost didn't feel real. Bloodhawk maintained a deathly silence. He uttered only a few cool words. Pretty good experience for you all. Snake Tongue, Hooded Vulture, 
and Sharkhide surrounded Bloodhawk and cheered him on. It's thanks to you, Bloodhawk. Couldn't have done it without you. Here's to the man of the hour. Quinn couldn't help but crack a smile. After years of sweating with and against professional players who had the sharpest of game sense, the precious sight of seeing new players rejoice in an almost childlike joy reminded him of the first time he started playing glory. Snaketop quickly hugged Bloodhawk to Quinn's prize. Bloodhawk's leadership was more valuable than the help of any guide. Quinn shimmied out of the embrace. Simple thanks will do. Maybe, uh, you're the greatest there ever was? Well, that's it. The three enthusiastic players laughed and celebrated. In contrast to the trio, Wolfclaw's mood was sudden. His former nemesis had become his guild's hero. Moments ago in the dungeon, he presented himself as a selfish player, putting his own cares above the teeth, tarnishing his image. Grinding his teeth, Wolfclaw leaped in front of Bloodhawk. Fine, you're good. I admit that. You know, I swear there's gonna be a day it'll catch up to you. Quinn laughed. <laughs> no, little baby wolf cub, you're good. Wolfclaw was taken aback by the compliment. Then Quinn grinned. I'm great. Greater than great. I'm the one you call to get rid of the good players when they try to take advantage of noobs by leading them into a phantom cat battle just to let them die for a poor collection of loot. That's who I am. Wolfclaw spit at Bloodhawk's feet. Whatevs, you heard me. Karma has a way of making things right. Quinn tugged on his gloves to tighten the fit. You want to talk about karma after what I've seen you do? Or try to do is more like it. How about you be the one to give karma a nudge in the right direction? I'll give you a fighting chance. Bloodhawk turned his back to Wolfclaw. I'll give you three hits before I make a move. Wolfclaw shook with anger. He was on the brink of a breakdown and wanted to attack, but he feared the reprisal. Damn you, Hawk. No one wants you here. Wolfclaw looked at his teammates, who were all glancing in various directions, pretending not to hear and avoiding having to agree or disagree with their leader. Quinn looked over his shoulders. Now, next time. He casually walked away from the players. Wolfclaw was insulted by their inaction. Traitors, wasn't this cheat supposed to be looked down upon, hated or mocked? He cheated me in Green Forest Dungeon, but no one seems to remember that or care. I'll take this bull down if it's the last thing I do. Snake Tongue approached to ease the situation. Knock it off, little baby wolf cub. Wolfclaw gave Snake Tongue a rude gesture. Forget you, your little baby snake cub. Snake Tongue grinned. Does it make any sense? Wolfclaw grunted. Who knows what a baby snake is called? Shark Hyde held up a finger. Snakelet. Wolfclaw shoved him. Who asked you? Shark Hyde brushed off the soot from his tunic. You. You just did. Hooded Vulture stepped in front of Wolfclaw. Calm down, calm down. Let's hurry up and train. Get prepared if Bloodhog wants to dungeon again. I think I can impress him. Hooded Vulture and Sharkhide rushed to catch up to Bloodhawk. They aimed to make him the leader of the kill. Snake Tongue immediately followed. Hey, wait up. I'm coming too. While Wolfclaw ground his teeth, he unexpectedly received a friend request from Bloodhawk. He quickly declined it. If he asked again, I'm going to send him a few insults. Bloodhawk had entered the dungeon. He laughed to himself. Wolf Cub is really gonna hate that. Snake Tongue, Hooded Vulture, and Sharkhide followed Bloodhawk. Wolfclaw had been swept to the side. Only after a long time did he receive an invite from Snake Tongue. Depressed, he contemplated leaving the dungeon, but Snake Tongue invited him again. Despite feeling cast aside, he couldn't ignore Snake Tongue's concern just because of Bloodhawk. In the end, he caught up with them. And Snake Tongue, sensing Wolfclaw's move, sent another private message to cheer him up. 
Wolfclaw wouldn't admit it. But seeing his gamer friends reach out after all, that did make him feel better. This time, they breezed through the dungeon just like before. In an instant, they slaughtered their way through, entering for a third round without saying another word. After entering, they received a server prompt. You have mistakenly entered the Spider Emperor's cave. Snake Tongue cried out in alarm, looking at Bloodhawk. Fourth warning. If they didn't have this mysterious expert, they would have instantly hightailed it back the way they came. The server emphasized their warning again. Beware at risk of death. Bloodhawk lifted his lance for battle. They should warn the Spider Emperor about me. The hidden boss wouldn't stop players from clearing a dungeon. They could kill it or choose not to. Killing the final boss was still the end goal. The players unanimously looked toward Bloodhawk, waiting to see if he had a way to defeat the Spider Emperor. Bloodhawk sheathed his thousand chance umbrella. Nah, uh, maybe this time we let sleeping spiders lie. Snake Tongue was a little disappointed. We can't kill it. Gwyn cleared his throat. It's not that we can't kill it. I definitely can. I just have one condition for this relationship to work. The Spider Emperor should drop strong spider silk. That's mine. All the other junk you can have. You can divide it between the four of you or whatever. Snake Tongue almost didn't think about the proposal before agreeing. No problem. Hooded Vulture clapped her hands. The value of having a skilled expert like yourself, Bloodhawk, has already surpassed our expectations with those previous drops from the spider bosses. Shark Hyde let the others respond, feeling he should stay below the radar and only make notes when he did something good. Let them see the positives, and that's all they'll think about when changing up the team is ever discussed. They were more worried about finding a way to express their goodwill who would have thought that this player would come up with this demand? That was truly a relief. Even if he wanted all the drops, the others wouldn't hesitate to agree. Snake Tongue wanted to express his goodwill even farther. He truly wanted Bloodhawk in their guild. He turned around to Wolfclaw. Wolfclaw, give the party leader over to Bloodhawk. Wolfclaw ground his teeth. If you call me that again, I'm going to kill you. I mean it. Snake Tongue laughed. Isn't it cute? Why don't you like it? Hooded Vulture placed a hand on Wolfclaw's shoulder. If you don't want us to call you that, then we won't call you that. But we need you to give the leader position to Bloodhawk. Wolfclaw understood. By giving him the party leader position and then letting him set up the party, they would thoroughly dispel all of his doubts towards them. They would then have complete trust. Budhawk didn't need any negotiating. The experience the team could gain following Bloodhawk was worth just about any drop a boss could give. If he really wanted everything, then with just a word, Wolfclaw's friends would have no complaints. Wolfclaw had no choice, so he transferred the position. Wolfclaw was expecting to be kicked out of the guild immediately. But Bloodhawk didn't make any changes to the group. He continued slaughtering spiders and moving through the cave. Bloodhawk remained silent. It's been a while since I've been on a team like this. Players who are just here to have fun and not after some dumb trophy, prestige, or paycheck. It's a nice change of pace. Their strategy didn't alter from what was working. Everything proceeded without any problem. Ahead, a fork appeared on the main road of the spider cave. Everyone knew which one of the paths led to the spider emperor's den. Bloodhawk didn't hesitate and headed straight for the spider emperor. The four others followed closely behind. This side path wouldn't appear in the normal dungeon. On the way, there was a few spider eggs. When the players moved close to them, they began hatching. Extremely small spiders jumped out and attacked the war party. Their damage wasn't high, but they were small and nimble, not easy to hit. It would basically take three to five wild strikes to hit once. For Bloodhawk, with just a lift of his lance, he would hit one after another without fail, chopping them into pieces rapidly. Seeing that the four others were having trouble, he turned around to help his team. 
Snake Tongue held his breath. Without this guy's skill, we may not reach the Spider Emperor at all. And then if we did, we might not even beat the boss. Stark Hyde kept his voice low to avoid detection from larger spiders. Do you think we'll be the first ones to kill the Spider Emperor? Snake Tongue shrugged. Depends on our luck. We won't know until it comes out to attack. Could be sooner. Could be much later. Shark Hyde kept in step with Snake Tongue. Way I figure, we were the first ones to clear it. We were the earliest to go into the spider cave the second time. We didn't waste any time either. This is our third round, and there hasn't been an announcement for anyone else clearing it. I feel that our chances are good. Hooded Vulture moved along with her mates. Without leveling up, even if we met the Spider Emperor, we wouldn't dare to kill it. Snake Tongue looked ahead at their leader. Luckily, we have Boss Slayer Bloodhawk. Everyone nodded in agreement. Right. 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 Almost everyone. Wolfclaw frowned at their excitement. You guys make me sick. Snake Tongue, Hooded Vulture, and Sharkhide stared at Wolfclaw and glanced at Bloodhawk. They felt exhausted from the situation and wanted to move on. Hooded Vulture approached Wolfclaw. As for your earlier problems with Bloodhawk, you and me know you are in the wrong. Let's face it, we all know you were playing some dirty game. You tried to get one over on him with the Midnight Phantom Cat. That's fine, but it didn't work. Snake Tongue held up his hand. You also know this guy is the best chance we have at gaining any experience we can hope for. Why can't you just let it go and leave the past in the past? Wolfclaw opened his mouth to argue, but looked into the eyes of his guild members. Obviously, he couldn't reason with them. Snake Tongue tapped his foot. We've known each other for a long time, which is why we look the other way when you do that shady stuff. But we're getting a little impatient. Wolfclaw wiped the sweat from his forehead. You know, I'm not feeling too well. Snake Tongue snapped. Not feeling too well? Just leave the dungeon then. Get out and stop causing trouble for us. Wolfclaw turned red with anger. He felt betrayed. Is it time I finally leave for those punks to trade me for this cheat of a player? Gwyn continued to lead at the very front. We're here. Seeing this was the dingiest tavern in the spider cave by far. He knew the next one was the Spider Emperor's den. Snake Tongue rubbed the back of his neck. You think we can... How do we kill it? Gwyn tossed a loaf of bread to his team. You guys wait a bit. Eat this. I'm going to go look up a guide. The others immediately were dumbfounded. Sharkhide blinked repeatedly. Wait. To look up a guide when we've reached a crisis. What is this last-minute newbie preparation? Sounds like something I'd do. Wolfclaw grinned. At last, this Bloodhawk is finally revealing that he got this far with nothing but luck. Snake Tongue clicked his tongue. Bloodhawk, you'd say you're going to the guide for help? The war party looked around at each other. Bloodhawk didn't move. They realized Bloodhawk was unresponsive. While he was still logged into the server, he wasn't manning his avatar. It became evident to Snake Tongue that he had, in fact, taken a break from the game to consult a guide. The others were perplexed, having previously regarded him as an ultra-high-level expert. Hooded Vulture cleared her throat. Uh, um, how could someone of his caliber need to consult a guide? No way he used it for the first clear. He had no time. Sharkhide looked at his mates. Could it be he went to the bathroom or something and someone else got onto his account? Hooded Vulture shook her head in denial. Why would such a skilled player be alone in this new server instead of staying in the heavenly domain? Snake Tongue scratched his head. Damn, we had a real expert playing with us and now a fake took over? Does he need to run off and consult the guide? Wolfclaw chuckled. Serves you all right. You took to him as if he was a messiah here to save you from low experience. Now look what you got. 
Snake Tongue looked to the roof of the caves. Bloodhawk, why would you leave us like this? Help us clear the dungeon at least. Wolfclaw had a sudden realization. This calm and unreactive behavior was exactly like Bloodhawk's personality when they first met. Amid this confusing situation, as the team contemplated their next move, Gwyn returned, having completed the guide. I'm back. Is everyone ready to roll? Good. Snake Tongue twisted his face awkwardly. Bloodhawk, uh, did you switch players? Gwyn tilted his head. Switch players? Nah, I'm the same record setter you came to love and admire. Snake Tongue inched forward. Has this account been played by you the entire time? Quinn smiled and nodded. No way I'd let some hack taint my avatar with their underdeveloped skills. Only one way to prove it. Watch me kill this spider like stepping on a, a spider. Hooded Vulture looked among the group. Then I don't really understand. Why did you need a guide for anything? I wrote the guide for a reason. This is the reason. I haven't done this dungeon in so many years. Just a little refreshing of memory so we do it quickly and efficiently. Sharkhide raised his hand. Then, for when we were battling the... Gwyn nodded. Yeah, I looked up a guide. My guide. If I can't learn from myself, who else would I learn from? Little baby wolf cub? I play a lot of dungeons. I can't be expected to remember all the early game content like some dork. The players were dumbfounded. Snake Tongue scratched his head. When did you do that? Quinn ate an apple. While we worked our way through the dungeon, I glanced at a few chapters. All that was left was to read up to this hidden boss. Any other time-wasting questions? The war party remained silent and puzzled. Snake Tongue studied some spider cave guides before, but there was no guide that showed exactly how Bloodhawk led them through it. Sharkhide was thinking about how to get his hands on this incredible guidebook. It could give him an edge for staying on the team. Quinn placed the tip of his weapon on the ground and leaned on it. Let's get to business. To confront the Spider Emperor, we used the same strategy as we did against the web spitting one. After surrounding it, we chain stun it. But here's the thing. The Spider Emperor will keep spawning eggs, which can't be interrupted by any skill or effect. Spawn spiders will be similar to the ones in the passageway, but their bites will cause a three-second paralysis. And you know what the paralysis effect can do to you. Sharkhide nodded, pretending like he knew what Bloodhawk was talking about, secretly hoping he didn't get bit and have to admit to his ignorance. Snake Tongue shook his head. Not particularly. Hooded Vulture tapped Snake Tongue on the shoulder. You can't move or attack, but you can't be hurt either. Sharkhide kept nodding like this was information he already knew. Bloodhawk pointed at Hooded Vulture. There won't be any damage, but it'll break up our formation, so we definitely can't be bitten by those small spiders. Snake Tongue raised his hand. Then what should we do? Quinn laughed. This isn't a classroom. No need to raise your hands. You just let old Bloodhawk be in charge of clearing the small spiders. Don't give him the time of day. Focus on the big one. The hardest part will be whether the four of you can continuously chain stun the Spider Emperor until it's dead. With that, the war party crept into the black cavern of the Spider Emperor. Oofclaw and Snake Tongue had played for a while. They knew that the guide so far didn't include an unorthodox strategy such as this. Sharkhide shifted forward. Is this the strategy from the guide? I didn't want to spend the fifteen ninety nine for it, but now I'm thinking I should have splurged. Snake Tongue scoffed. If there was such a guide, it would definitely face severe criticism from players not keen on putting their hard-earned characters in a fight of certain death. Hooded Vulture weighed the idea. This attack strategy seems plausible in theory. Wolfclaw grunted. Having the four of us continuously chained on the Spider Emperor, but relying on a single person to eliminate the small spiders? Who would guarantee no mistakes? 
If even one small spider escapes and attacks any of us, let's just say any of us dying in the formation, would mean all of us dying in formation. The Spider Emperor had a range of abilities, from flying to burrowing into the ground to spitting webs and spraying poison mist. It was the strongest among hidden bosses in the spider caves. If the war party surrounded it and an opportunity for it to retaliate presented itself, they could all end up dead on the spot. Gwyn took a drink of water. I know I can do my part. Can you guys pull it off? Wolfclaw bowed up to Bloodhawk. Isn't this the question we should be asking you? Can you assure us that not a single spider is going to slip through and jump on our backs? If we're stunned, we might as well roll out a red carpet for the Emperor. Quinn gave his wry smile. I wouldn't be standing here talking to you if I thought some newborn spiders were a challenge. The crucial part is you four surrounding the mama bug. It's also the highest level spider emperor, so coordination needs to be fast. I can't assist you. You react only after hearing my voice. It might be too slow. Glory help me. I have to rely on the coordination of you four. Snake Tongue lacked a bit of confidence. Is there any other method? Quinn shook his head no. What I said is what I know. This isn't a team of hardened experts. It's a team of one badass, three tough cookies, and one little baby wolf cub. We work with what we got. Hooded Vulture sharpened her blade for the fight. You've assessed that by just observing our skills? Quinn smirked. How else would I? Watching you pick daisies? The others were astonished. Snake Tongue threw his hands up. This whole time, I've been wondering which guide you consulted. In my guides, I've never come across any strategy you were using. Now, I get it. Can't believe it took me this long. You didn't refer to a known guide for the strategy. You examined the boss's characteristics, and based on that, you devised a strategy that aligned with our specific skills. No testing, no trial runs. Just direct commands and we cleared those bosses like they were level ones. What astounded them wasn't Quinn's stunning character control, exceptional awareness, or even his outstanding leadership. It was his deep understanding of the game. Expert seemed too modest a label for the player behind Bloodhawk. Only a greater term could capture his skill. But they hesitated because this time they couldn't rely entirely on him. They had to execute their roles independently. They may be experienced, but that was only relative to the players in the newer servers. Across the entire history of Glory's existence, however, they'd be considered fairly new. When Quinn asked if they could do it or not, they didn't have much on the Iron Beasts considered their worth, but Quinn knew how to lead. The war party stood silently outside the Spider Emperor's den. Suddenly, a server announcement flashed on their screens. The first Spider Cave hidden boss had been defeated. Snake Tongue gritted his teeth. It's best not to dwell on the first kill now. Even on an ordinary day, if they encountered a hidden boss in a dungeon, they wouldn't give up without trying. If it proved too challenging, they could exit quickly before death. One advantage of beginner village dungeons was the ability to force quit without risking the loss of experience. Beginner villages took good care of new players. Snake Tongue looked at his three comrades. Shall we try it? In the server announcement, they showed fighting spirit and agreed in unison. Bring it on! Quinn readied his thousand chance umbrella. Call me crazy, but the last thing I want to do is die. Trust me when I say, four people are enough to use this strategy. Remember your rhythms from the last few times. Make it a bit faster for this emperor. Don't overthink it. He swayed his hips in a circular motion. Deal. Gwyn felt a tingle of enjoyment he felt in the early days of play when he led his original team through dungeons 
and they were played for glory. Understood. Gwyn guided Bloodhawk to the den entrance. I'll start the battle. He didn't enter, but raised his weapon once and swiftly retreated. The four were stunned. Sharkhide lowered his bow. What well, just happened? Gwyn looked at the war party. The fight's coming to you. The four scratched their heads in puzzlement. How did he start it? They didn't see anything. They all expected Bloodhawk to enter. Who knew he would just stand at the entrance for a bit? This type of initiation could only be done by long-ranged classes. Hooded Vulture looked at Snake Tongue. Did he bring a gun? Snake Tongue shrugged. He must have, right? Or as hell? While they speculated, a shriek echoed from the den. The Spider Emperor, previously in a peaceful nap, had been forcefully awakened. The entire cave shook, signaling the Emperor's imminent appearance. Quinn leaped back. Disperse to the left and right. If you die and I have to take this thing on alone, I'll find you where you spawn and kill you again. Snake Tongue and Wolfclaw split to the left, while Hooded Vulture and Sharkhide moved to the right. The Spider Emperor spat poison and lunged at Bloodhawk. Bloodhawk didn't retreat, but rushed to attack, meeting the oncoming arachnid. When it seemed he would be pounced on, he crouched out of the way. Bloodhawk moved across the Spider Emperor's thorax. Hooded Vulture gasped. I told you he brought a gun. The shot fire was the sound of a basic gunner attack. Bloodhawk slid in a sharp movement and then leaped into the air. With a flick of his wrist, the Thousand Chance Umbrella Land stabbed into the Spider Emperor's belly. Utilizing the Spider Emperor's pouncing power, he sent it flying into the four-man formation. Gwyn looked at his war party. This is where you surround it! The four shifted in confusion. They thought Quinn needed time to lure the monster into the trap. They hadn't expected the Spider Emperor to be brought to them so directly and efficiently. Too efficient. Snake Tongue moved up to attack. First hit is mine. Shark Hyde let an arrow fly. Then me. Hooded Vulture chopped at the spindly leg. Wolf Claw hesitated, but reluctantly rushed in the rear. After Wolf Claw caught up, Snake Tongue panicked. My skill's still on cooldown. I can't attack. Bloodhawk ran to use a dragon tool. He landed his attack, studying the Spider Emperor, but not before the Spider Boss was able to lay a sack of eggs. Small spiders broke from the sack and moved toward the war party like a wave of black tar. Gwyn sprung into action against the little spiders. Get familiar with the cadence. Snake, shark, vulture, wolf. I mean, baby wolf cub. Don't deviate. Snake Tongue observed Quinn's successive moves. It turned out the Emperor didn't reveal all its abilities when the fight began. It had a few tricks they were unaware of. It started out quite slow, allowing them some time to ease in. At this point, Bloodhawk could still manage a small number of spiders. He cut them off from the group before they had a chance to do any damage. After the round was over, Snake Tongue's skill was still on cooldown. I'm coming too fast. Too fast. My skill isn't working yet. Gwyn kept his attention on the small spiders. Don't freak yourself out. Keep moving on the Emperor. Everyone, move as one. Basic attacks until you're cooled down. Shark Hyde went in too close too early. Gwyn judged who was performing well out of the corner of his eye while actively taking down the small spiders. This time, Wolf Cup, use your blade swipe rapidly. Hooded Vulture, I like what I see. Gwyn realized how in control he was and his encouragement to the war party. These players weren't his friends, but he was enjoying helping them through the battle. So many times while leading a leap, my commands were questioned and strategies ignored. Those prima donnas cost me the glory title year after year, and then my job. These players, they know how to listen. The Spider Emperor's life continued to drop. The egg spawn rate increased by one, two, three. Bloodhawk rested while he had the chance. This round was decent. Move in closer and hit faster and stronger. Their coordination was falling into a smooth rotation. The war party was moving in sync. They found a great flow, moving as one. In front of each of them wasn't the Spider Emperor or an attack target, only the precise time to use their skill. 
another successful round, and another. The team felt confident the strategy would bring them glory. Although they couldn't say what the feeling exactly was, it seemed right, and they began instinctively releasing their skills at the right time. We no longer needed to guide them one by one. Fight for life. It depends on it. He circled around the spider emperor, sweeping the small spiders with the sharp edge of his lance. Hitting left and right without ever failing, only Quinn could perform this feat. While there were other players with this level of skill in the new server, their weapons were still only level 10, making it impossible to kill so many of the small spiders in one hit. Even Quinn couldn't completely clear them if each spider required two hits. Quinn rallied the Iron Beast to never let up, fully aware of the potential numbness from the repetitive robotic action. Any lapse in concentration could lead to the party collapse. Looks like Sharkhide is trying for the MVP ward. But wait, Hoodie Vulture just leaped him for damage done. It's a close race. Snake Tonk, Hooded Vulture, and Sharkhide didn't let their minds wander. They fixed their attention on each other's actions, unable to worry about Bloodhawk's fight even though clearing the small spiders was much more difficult. A single mistake could snowball into overall failure. The spider emperor's life had dropped to half. Snake Tongue repeated the same action rapidly, feeling his fingers turning a little rigid. Doubts arose about whether he could keep up the speed. Bloodhawk was leaping everywhere. The spider emperor had begun laying six eggs at a time. After breaking open their stack, the spiderlings randomly chose a target to pounce on. Bloodhawk's battle lance, jet black with only a small glint of light at the tip, stabbed through a small spider which died on the spot. Snake Tongue's heart dropped. It's not good. He saw from the corner of his eye a small spider quickly flying towards Hooded Vulture. Bloodhawk was too far away and it didn't look like he would make it in time. In the end, the party heard. Echo bounced off the walls, and that small spider burst into flames and exploded into small pieces. Sharkhide shook. What happened? He was surprised, but he hadn't forgotten his task, and his attacks were still on point. Snake Tongue swung his weapon in a flurry. At that time, he had only seen the small spider. He hadn't paid attention to Bloodhawk's movements, reflecting on that long-ranged attack. This guy has all kinds of tricks. He brought a different glasses weapon with him. Snake Tongue felt reassured. But when he concentrated on his friends, he saw that they concentrated solely on their tasks at hand. Their heads hadn't even turned once. Snake Tongue suddenly discovered that during this moment of distraction, his weariness and nervousness decreased quite a bit. Snake Tongue didn't dare tell anyone about this experience. If everyone became distracted for a bit, who knew what would happen? I hope there won't be any accidents. Wolfclaw felt as if his limit had almost been reached. Both hands were extremely stiff, and it seemed like they had lost flexibility. He couldn't even tell whether he had completed his action when each round passed. His gaze was fixed. He felt as if the distance between him and the Spider Emperor shrank. Everything blurred. Wolfclaw was under a lot of pressure and was afraid of making a mistake. He knew that his guild already had a somewhat negative opinion of him, even more. He didn't want Bloodhawk to have more fuel to use against him. Wolfclaw clenched his teeth and persevered. I hate spiders! Snake Tongue ground away in his attacks. The Spider Emperor's health seemed to drop so quickly at first. Why does it feel so slow now? Feels like we've been battling for days. Still one third left of its life. When Snake Tongue's mind wandered a bit, ironically enough, it let him relax a bit. But when Wolfclaw became distracted, it only added to his pressure. In the end, it didn't matter what happened. The two players hadn't made any mistakes yet. Their chain-stunning coordination still continued. Without warning, Sharkhide let out a cry. He made a mistake. Sharkhide was the slowest to move into formation, 
he was struggling to grasp the team's timing in attacks. After persevering for a while, he finally made a slip up, acting too quickly. Although the Spider Emperor was stunned in place after Wolfclaw's blade swipe, Sharkhide's swift action meant Snake Tongue would have to strike immediately. He couldn't. Snake Tongue's skill was still on cooldown, leaving him with no other means to stun the Spider Emperor. The four players' heart sank. They hoped for Bloodhark to perform a miracle and save them from poison or suffocation through webs. They witnessed the Spider Emperor raising its thorax, 8-8 eight, eight spawn, at that exact moment. Sharkhide blamed himself. It's over. I stunned the saw. Snake Tongue dug into the ground. Don't give up hope. We have a fighting chance if we maintain the plan. After Wolfclaw used his skill, he could only regretfully look at Snake Tongue. Snake Tongue, with no available skills, had no idea what to do next. Their strategy was falling apart. Bloodhawk sprinted toward the company. Snake Tongue, out of my way. In the midst of their despair, the voice ignited their hopes. Snake Tongue immediately moved to the side without hesitation. Silver streaked through the sky. The Thousand Chance Umbrella Battle Lance flew. Bloodhawk used Dragon Tooth to stab the Spider Emperor. The stun status had been mended, but with no one controlling the eight small spiders, they scattered, ready to bite every one of them. The group was at a loss, unsure whether to continue attacking the Spider Emperor or deal with the small spiders. In the end, Bloodhawk moved forward two steps, the battle lance in his hand split into two weapons, with each hand holding a different part. Both arms stretched forward and forced back the Spider Emperor. Bloodhawk lifted both his arms, taking advantage of the Spider Emperor raising its head. He flipped backward. With an iron bridge, he toppled the Spider Emperor onto its back. Quinn used his grappler skill, back throw. This skill not only damaged the Spider Emperor, but also created a small-scale wave. Bloodhawk's back throw had created a ripple at just the right spot, hitting all eight baby spiders. The small spiders flipped over and shriveled. With a whining sound, they turned into withered corpses. Wind took a moment to regroup. Snake Tongue, put some mustard on it. Snake Tongue had been prepared. He immediately launched, and the Spider Emperor continued to be stunned into action. Gwyn kicked aside a dead baby spider. I can't rescue you guys all the time. Honestly, I'll watch you die if you can't hold your own. Hooded Vulture, Sharkhide, and Wolfclaw each attacked it in succession. They were all terrified to the point that their hands were drenched with cold sweat. Every time they moved to attack, fear lingered, afraid that their hits might miss. There was no time to hesitate. They were wide-eyed, not daring to make the slightest mistake. The situation stabilized. The war party, not daring to be distracted, didn't reflect on their near deaths. Under their relentless attacks, the Spider Emperor's health declined from one-third to one-fourth to one-fifth. Quinn witnessed the Spider Emperor shake with anger. It's almost our red blood. If anyone feels like fainting... Sacrifice yourself to the beast for us. Snake Tongue gripped his weapon. What do we do when it hits red blood? Quinn swung his lights through the air. When a hidden boss hits red blood, there'll definitely be a special effect. When the boss's health drops below one-fifth, it will gain super armor, making it immune to stuns. I have a short time to attack. Sharkhide wiped the sweat from his forehead. No stunning? That's our whole MO. Gwyn dove to attack. I guess you'll have to kill it before it kills you. Hearing these three words, the four spiders no longer felt nervous. On the contrary, they felt excited, ready to take the spider emperor out. Snake Tongue lunged again. It's red. Bloodhawk pointed to the floor. Hooded Vulture, step on that small spider. Although Hooded Vulture didn't hear the command, she had already subconsciously faced a small spider that pounced at her. It looked like it had been prepared just to poison her. The small spider leaped on her and bit Hooded Vulture. She was immediately rendered incapable of performing any actions. Stunned. The Spider Emperor unexpectedly twisted its body and bit disgustingly with its big mandibles towards her. 
hooded vulture cried out in fear. Her avatar's light flashed before her eyes. After the small spider bit her, hooded vulture was forced into a stasis state and couldn't move. During this time, she was invincible. No damage. Even the spider emperor couldn't harm her. Quinn used this chance to provide everyone with three seconds of free attacks on the spider emperor. While the spider emperor acted violently, it continued to spawn eggs rapidly. Wynn took note and began clearing out all the small spiders again. This time, he observed that the small spiders avoided Hooded Vulture. Hooded Vulture got the idea and actively sought out small spiders to bite her. Though not experts, the Iron Beast Guild players were experienced enough to understand Quinn's tactic. Due to surrounding and attacking the Spider Emperor, they accumulated a lot of aggro. Hooded Vulture, dealing the most damage, attracted the greatest aggro. Quinn used this knowledge to execute his plan. The original small spiders, once disrupted, became their most dependable protection. Previously, this tactic wouldn't have worked until later when Hooded Vulture amassed enough aggro. It was at this point that the Spider Emperor's spawning rate pushed her to her limits. Hooded Vulture lined up to be bitten, maintaining her invincibility. Although the small spiders inflicted some damage, it wasn't substantial. When there was an opportunity, Bloodhawk conveniently provided Hooded Vulture with healing. The Spider Emperor spat out webs and poison using every available means to no avail. Only with their continuous attacks did someone finally surpass Hooded Vulture in total aggro. The Spider Emperor switched targets, but Wolfclaw, the first to be targeted, had long learned of Hooded Vulture's tactic. Bloodhawk, assigned to clearing small spiders, had predicted this move too, preparing a spider in advance to pounce towards Wolfclaw. The most dangerous part of the battle, the red blood fates, had turned into a game. The players laughed. They collectively teased and bullied the Spider Emperor. Finally, they led the strongest monster in the Spider Cave to its demise. First, the system announcement rang out in all its glory. Bloodhawk, Snake Tongue, Hooded Vulture, Sharkhide, and Wolfclaw are the first to kill the Spider Emperor. Snake Tongue cheered. Sweet, we got on the server board as champions. Shark Hyde threw his helmet in the air. Without you, Blunhawk, completing this task would have been impossible. I would have never stepped a foot in this dam. If they could, they would have lifted Bloodhawk high toward the sky and tossed him. The continuous chain stuns on the Spider Emperor had pressured them, but clearing out the small spiders was the bigger challenge. The more exciting part was that Bloodhawk had rescued them midway when death looked imminent. He accurately controlled the small spider's aggro to complete the entire plan. They had nothing more to say. They would have never thought that such a meta would exist to take down this boss. Despite being well-versed in the game's meta, they had never imagined encountering such an amazing player. Snake Tongue ran up to see what the Spider Emperor had dropped. Bloodhawk, bro, four strong silk threads dropped. He happily chose to give them up. The others, without objections, agreed not to touch them. Quinn picked up the four strong silk threads. These'll do me nicely. Quinn also kept his word. The rest of this junk is yours. After the items appeared, the war party humbly declined. Sharkhide stepped away from the items. I wouldn't dare. You take them, Bloodhawk. You earned them more than we did. They knew that Quinn was the reason disasters never occurred. Besides the strong spider silk, the spider emperor also dropped two spider venoms, a pair of level 15 chestnut boots, and an armor that added three points to strength. Additionally, a powerful weapon appeared, the mahogany tachi. Level 15, attack speed, 8, physical attack. 165. Magic attack, 178. Strength plus 10. Intelligence, plus 14. All in all, a good find. Tachis were considered sword class weapons used by the swordsman type class, but their magic attack was high. In glory, 
Weapons either emphasized physical attack or magic attack. The Thousand Chance Umbrella was the same in both, and a player could recognize it as self-made just by looking at its stats. In comparison, the Mahogany Tachi was on the same level as the Thousand Chance Umbrella. A level 15 sword class weapon equaled a level 5 silver weapon. But this Mahogany Tachi had additional properties. Its attack speed surpassed the Thousand Chance Umbrella by three levels, and with its attribute increases, it already outperformed the Thousand Chance Umbrella. Quinn looked at the Tachi and sighed in admiration at today's luck. The equipment and hidden boss materials were guaranteed drops, but the previous skillbook and the current Tachi weapon were products of luck. Although low-level equipment would quickly become outdated, with this level 15 weapon, a player would still be stronger than most others in the first stage. Moreover, Tachi weapons could be used up until level 25. Thanks to this sword, even an unspecialized character that hadn't planned on playing the swordsman type class would find the switch worthwhile. The four players gulp, especially Wolfclaw and Hooded Vulture. Those two had planned on playing a swordsman-type class, and this weapon perfectly suited them. After Quinn examined it for a bit, he decided to renounce it. This sword is trash. You guys fight over it. He also relinquished the spider venom and chestnut boots, keeping his word on their previous agreement. Snake Tongue sheathed his weapon. Bloodhawk, you should still take them. If you didn't carry us, we wouldn't have been alive to use these things. Quinn shook his head no. If it weren't for your formation, maybe I would have broken a sweat in killing the Spider Emperor by myself. Everyone stared blankly, taken aback by Quinn's confidence. But they knew better than to doubt his confidence, which made his skills all the more intimidating. Quinn decisively turned his back on the weapons. Snake tongue. Hooded Vulture and Sharkhide accepted it. Being old friends, they harmoniously split up the drop. The Spider Venom would be sold for money, and it didn't matter who chose it. After selling it, they would divide the money equally. The chestnut boots were ordinary equipment, so everyone casually rolled for it. In the end, Hooded Vulture skillfully rolled a perfect 100 points. As for the Mahogany Touch, it would go to either Hooded Vulture or Wolfclaw based on their future classes. Hooded Vulture, despite just grabbing the chestnut boots, happily chose to give it to Wolfclaw. Wolfclaw held the mahogany tachi, both excited and somewhat puzzled. The first spider cave cleared, and now the first spider emperor kill granted them significant experience rewards. Bloodhawk had already risen to level 12 while Snake Tongue and the others were sure to level up after this dungeon. Killing the normal boss was too easy for them, and they quickly defeated it. After clearing the dungeon, Wolfclaw felt conflicted. He had originally planned on leaving the party after this run, but he had just obtained the Mahogany Tachi. Taking equipment and then leaving didn't seem like good manners. If I leave, it's no good. Snake Tongue already told me to get out. And if I don't leave, they might lose face too. Fortunately, Snake Tongue was a good friend and took the initiative to call out to him. It seemed like what he had said in the dungeon was just a joke. With Bloodhawk as the leader, everyone entered the spider cave once again. Similar to Wolfclaw, Sunrunner and his Righteous Warriors Guild companions were also struggling with their own failures. They weren't the first ones to clear the spider cave. And out of the three concealed bosses, two had already been looted. This marked their fourth venture into the dungeon, yet they still hadn't encountered a single one. Sunrunner turned red with anger. Who the hell is this bloodhawk who keeps taking my glory? Leave it to quit to stir up resentment with another player so fast, one that he didn't know existed yet. Just as Sunrunner was preserving through his bitterness of not being the first to kill the hidden bosses, a server announcement informed him that the final hidden boss, the Spider Warrior, had met its demise. 
The first to clear the Spider Warrior were members of the Shallow Grave Guild, one of the best guilds of the recent few servers that had migrated into the current one. Shallow Grave Guild was joined by two other well-known guilds that had migrated since the opening. One of them, Threatening Death Guild, had defeated the previous hidden boss. Despite the apparent even match between the three great guilds, this time Bloodhawk managed to steal the spotlight, holding the record for the most first clears three times. His party also secured two spots on the first clear leaderboards in the level 10 stage, making the Righteous Warriors Guild lose face. Hidden bosses were out of their grasp, blaming bad luck for not encountering them. The ten seconds they were off for the first dungeon clear still irritated them. Sunrunner and the others fell into despair. Sunrunner hung his head. Where did this blood heart come from? Have the people in that village be on the lookout for him. Get me answers. Quinn, despite leaving the entire server with a bad impression, was in high spirits. He repeatedly entered and left the dungeon, staying busy. Jenny woke up late, around 11 o'clock. Usually disciplined, she had slept in due to the excitement of the 10th server's opening. She found she had slept for over eight hours. She stretched and got out of bed. Living in the Area 51 cafe, Jenny slept in a small room on the second floor, close to Quinn's living area. She had grown up in the Area 51 cafe, considering it her home. Unlike others who returned home, she stayed at the cafe during her student days. As Area 51 grew, Jenny remained out of her entire family. Managing it, she cherished the place where she had spent her entire life. During her freshman year in college, Jenny's life took a tragic turn when her father succumbed to a long battle with heart disease. With no mother in her life, Jenny found herself facing not only her father's funeral arrangements, but also discussions among relatives about the fate of the cafe. Without a second thought, Jenny cast aside college and assumed control of the Area 51 cafe. The decision left her friends and family astounded. Trying to make her father proud, she continued to manage the cafe and tended to the household. In the blink of an eye, Nine years had passed. Although Jenny now possessed the means to secure a more comfortable living space, such thoughts never crossed her mind. She found personal satisfaction in living in the cafe, where she felt a sense of security and peace. Perhaps, she mused, this was the essence of family, a legacy to be maintained. This thought helped fend off loneliness as she managed the cafe by herself. Jenny stood next to the window, gazing at the silver-white world that intensified the brilliance of the sunlight. The weather is looking good outside. She picked up a picture of herself and her dad and placed it on the windowsill. Enjoy the warmth, Dad. After dressing and freshening up, Jenny, filled with joy, quietly slipped out of the living room. Noticing the open storage room door, she peeked inside, hoping to catch a glimpse of Quinn. Where'd he go? She stepped into her cafe. The place was at full capacity due to the 10th server launch of glory. The all-night party had just left, making way for the early morning enthusiasts. Every screen displayed scenes from glory, and every person wore VR headsets and expressed laughter or frustration in their conversations. Descending the stairs to the front, Jenny knocked on the desk of the on-duty receptionist. You know where the new night manager got off to after his shift? Marsha, the receptionist, pointed across the cafe. He's in the smoking area. Jenny gasped and ran to the designated area. The plane? The smoking area was clouded with thick smoke. Quinn sat in the center of this polluted air. Jenny furrowed her brows, attempting to wave away the smoke as she approached. Lifting Quinn's VR helmet, she said, Still playing? Are you crazy? Quinn turned around with lightning speed, nodding. Morning, snoozy Susie. 
he greeted before promptly returning his attention to the game. Jenny scanned the screen. Spider Kate? The one and only. That there is the shriveled corpse of the Spider Emperor. She couldn't believe it. What level? Quinn smiled. Seventeen. Jenny was taken aback. She scrutinized the screen, focusing on Bloodhawk's experience bar, which was nearly full. After this dungeon, he would level up to 18. Jenny rubbed her eyes. There's still 20 minutes left before 12 o'clock. If you achieve level 18 in, what is it, 12 hours? That has to set a new record. While the system announcements didn't provide such statistics, players on the forum often use these numbers to showcase their skills. Glancing again, Jenny noticed Quinn's teammate. Jenny pointed to Wolfclaw on the party list. Wolfclaw? Wasn't this person calling you a cheat last night? Apparently he couldn't get enough of my brutish avatar. Jenny couldn't comprehend. Why are you in a party with him? Quinn shrugged. Because of his lies, I couldn't form a party with anyone. He knew the truth and took me into his war party. Now, as the de facto leader, his guild is my guild. Jenny grew frustrated. So he lied about you and you helped him? Gwyn laughed. <laughs> it's whatever. Using him has been useful. Jenny remained perplexed. Even if Quinn didn't mind, why would the other person accept him into the party? Jenny held up her hands. What exactly happened? When they first accepted me into their little group, they probably had a plot to set me up somehow or get me killed. But after seeing how good I am and knowing they'd be hard-pressed to do some damage, they felt that I would put them on the boards, which I did. So they made me their leader. Jenny squinted at Quinn. So you just happily worked for them without any benefits? On Quinn's screen, his lance flashed across the cave. I wouldn't call Tachi's and Silk without benefits. Jenny observed a series of neatly typed system messages in the chat box. Party members Snake Tongue, Wolf Claw, Hooded Vulture, and Shark Hide chose to renounce the equipment dropped from the Spider Emperor. Jenny was astonished. What's this? They're trying to give me the loot so I'll dungeon with them and join the guild for good. Despite having already collected a set of equipment through priority picks, these guys still wanted his opinion. Jenny was dumbstruck. How was this working for them? Wasn't he the boss? Typically, only the core of the party. Actual friends were qualified for priority picks after defeating a boss. These members seemed like enemies before she slept, but now they had all become his buddies. Am I still dreaming? Is this a dream? Jenny was determined to get to the bottom of the matter. Tell me how exactly this happened, in simple terms. I'm good. Damn good. And they needed someone as good as me to give them something they never had before. True glory. How'd you do that? Quinn pointed to the server records. I carried them through the first clear of Spider Cave and Spider Emperor Kill. Jenny was shocked. You completed three first clears in one night? Despite playing smoke shy for five years, she hadn't achieved a single first clear. Yet, in less than 12 hours, Quinn managed three and reached level 18. He was undeniably talented. The party members on the screen had already logged out, and a faint farewell could be heard from his headphones. He logged out of the game. Quinn yawned. I'm so tired, I'm going to sleep. Jenny sized up Quinn. Do you want to eat something before you go to bed? Truthfully, when she looked at Quinn's face, she couldn't discern any major signs of sleepiness. Despite pulling an all-nighter, Plus a morning, he did look a little out of it. However, the problem was that when they first met yesterday, he seemed out of it, as if he were half dead. She couldn't tell that he had been running on a few nights of no sleep. Quinn shut the computer down. Nah.
He made his way to the second floor storage room using the keys Jenny had given him last night. After opening the door to that pitifully tiny storage room, he covered his head with a pillow and quickly fell asleep. This room was ideal for sleeping in the daytime. When the door was closed, a small amount of light slipping through the window wouldn't disturb him at all. Quinn fell into a deep, deep sleep. When he awoke, the day had turned dark again. It was hard to imagine that someone who had recently experienced such hectic gameplay in the last twelve hours could sleep so well. He slept through the day, sitting up from his bed. Quinn didn't turn on the lights. He lit up a cigarette and, after quietly smoking it, got up and left the room. The doors to the two small bedrooms were locked. Quinn knew one was occupied by Jenny and the other by a young lady named Tarp, a longtime employee at Area 51 Cafe. She had worked there for almost two years but had taken a break in the past few days. Other employees needing accommodation lived in the neighborhood. During a bathroom break, Quinn noticed a sticky note on the mirror. Bored, he glanced at it and discovered it was written to him. Jenny had prepared a towel and toothbrush for him. Tearing down the sticky note, Quinn felt somewhat at a loss. He didn't expect the boss to be so attentive. After tidying up, Quinn left and looked around. It was already nine o'clock, and he hadn't eaten all day. Leaving the small inner rooms, he entered the cafe and felt something weird. The second floor was a more costly, higher quality area, and it seemed a little too empty. Baffled, Quinn headed downstairs, and unexpectedly, the farther he went, the darker it became. The cafe's first floor had no lights turned on. Quinn glanced around in confusion. Am I missing something? It's as empty as Badger City after a zombie outbreak. He observed that although the first floor lights weren't turned on, there were numerous people, with some even attempting to squeeze in. Against the south wall, a 200-inch diagonal projection hung high, streaming seams with echoing sound throughout the entire cafe. Whether sitting at a computer or standing in the passageway, everyone seemed captivated by the projection. It appeared as if they had forgotten the cafe's purpose and treated it like a movie theater, silently staring at the projection. Wynne soon heard a commenter's voice narrating the scene, and four words he couldn't be more familiar with appeared. Quinn Reeves, Cutter Zion! To his shock, the streamed projection was a movie segment detailing the history of his professional career in glory. The commentator movingly described the series of accomplishments he had gained in his glory career. Three-time league champion, three-time MVP, two-time rising star, and one-time one-hit, one-kill. Whether his team or other players, Quinn stood at the peak of the Glory Professional Alliance, serving as the goal for every professional Glory player. The commentator had a downcast and sorrowful tone. Next, let's commemorate the battle god Cutter Zion that Quinn Reeves controlled through these series of marvelous images. On the projection, invincible images of the battle god Cutter Zion began showing on the screen. In the past, such pictures would have incited excitement and cheers from the crowd. However, the cafe was now silent, devoid of yelling or cheering. Everyone silently observed as pictures flashed by one after another, knowing that everything shown would soon be a thing of the past. At noon, Club Elite called for a news conference and announced the retirement of their team captain, Quinn Reeves. The ever-mysterious expert didn't even participate in his own retirement news conference. Everyone witnessed the elite manager taking out Quinn's signed retirement agreement. Shortly after, the manager proclaimed that the retired Quinn had gracefully declined other positions within the club and left elite on his own terms. 
No one in the cafe could understand why anyone would retire with Cutter Zion still at the top of his game and in play for the upcoming championship. The esports commentator threw his arms wide open. Globe Elite managed to secure Sonny Layton, a rising star among the new generation of experts. The news boosted everyone's spirits on the team. Quinn listened to the broadcast quietly. For the king of the first generation, this announcement solidified his somber departure. Though he strolled with apparent ease through the cafe, Inside, he was far from content. He persisted through the struggle. Though wanting to get a regular day job lingered in the back of his mind. He hadn't come to terms with the end of his professional career, but his options were dwindling. Accepting the club's offer to become a training partner would be a humiliating concession. Quinn saw through their ploy, understanding that they expected him to reject such a demeaning choice and leave. In the harsh landscape of the commercialized In the Name of Glory alliance, where camaraderie was a rare commodity, the club's decision was ruthless but financially understandable. Quinn, not yet at retirement age, recognized this and the club's retirement proposal was their way of acknowledging it. They aimed not only to rid themselves of the burden, but also to prevent a rival from capitalizing on his departure. Forcing Quinn into retirement was a calculated move, and it worked. Despite seeing through the ploy, he played along, following their script and exiting the stage. A life-and-death struggle in big-money team politics was not why he got into gaming in the first place. He wanted to believe that this wasn't all there was in the professional competitive scene of gaming. Taking a step back for a year might not be such a bad situation. It opened up a freedom Quinn hadn't enjoyed since his early days of playing glory, even if the steps seemed daunting. Esports had ruined gaming but in our current world, it's here to stay. When the screen displayed the words, Let's call it a day! Quinn couldn't bear to watch any longer. Quinn maneuvered out of the crowd and stood at the entrance. I, I hate media propaganda. That announcement was made to cause a stir and get people talking about the Alliance. Nothing else. It has nothing to do with me. Some of these people look like this news really affects them. Get a life. I'm not even crying about it, and I'm the one who lost my livelihood. To his surprise, a sound of sobbing reached his ears. He turned around and saw Jenny, comforting a cafe customer with a t-shirt of Cutter's eye on. The customer was a die-hard fan. Jenny rolled her eyes before noticing Quinn. Jenny grabbed a tissue from her pocket and handed it to the fan, Clayton. Cutter Zion is still being played. What is there to cry about? Clayton was inconsolable. But it's not him. What if Cutter Zion is going to be played wrong? I can't stand that thought. I'd rather they delete the avatar. His waterworks turned up again instantly, scaring Jenny. She shrugged towards Quinn. Do you have any paper? Quinn searched himself. Will a cigarette case work? Jenny was silent. Someone should have slapped that handsome face a long time ago. That average face a long time ago. Gwyn hurried back to the cafe. I'll go get some for these jokers. The sound of weeping grew louder. It seemed like the tears being shed by the megafan was contagious. Quinn noticed many club elite shirts in the cafe today, no doubt congregating to watch the press conference. It dawned on him that these people knew exactly who they were crying for. They were going to miss him. They may not know it was him, but they felt for him nonetheless. He went to the front desk, grabbed a bag of paper napkins, and rushed back. He handed them to Janet, and, leaning against the wall, he pulled out a cigarette and lit it. Jenny sensed something behind her. What are you doing? Are you going to cry too? Do you need some paper? Gwyn turned buffing out a mouthful of smoke towards Jenny. To his surprise, tears forced their way to his eyes. He didn't like it. 
he didn't like it at all. This feeling in his gut radiated through his body. He shirked the feeling and wiped his face. His eyes had turned red, but he purposely coughed a few times. What? It's just the smoke. You're crying. Jenny waved her hands to disperse the smoke. Forget it. She stuffed the paper napkin back into Quinn's hands, turned around, and went back into the cafe. Leaning against the wall, Quinn smoked his cigarette in silence. He pulled out a napkin, wiped away some snot dripping out of his nose, and then decided he needed to leave the cafe for a while. Get some air, maybe something to eat. Quinn jogged across the street to the burger joint on the corner. Husky Burgers. He stood in line behind a couple of kids talking about his retirement. I can't get away from that. After enjoying a full meal with a toothpick in his mouth, he sat there with a semblance of peace. The last run through the spider caves and leading the team felt like the early days to him. Somewhere along the way, I forgot why I was playing. It was never for the money, but for the glory. Funny. That wolf claw did a favor trying to slander me. He figured it was time to get back to the cafe. He crossed the street and before he entered, he saw through the glass door. Marv. And he was talking to Marsha. Good thing Marsha is always in her own world. Marlin won't be able to get two words out of her. As Marlin exited the cafe, Quinn hid behind the dumpster till he saw the collector leave and enter the next door convenience store. Hey. He's getting close, but he probably won't come back here for a while. Quinn entered the cafe like everything was normal. Hey, Marsha, how's the business today? Anything new? Anything? He fished for any word on Marlin's appearance and what she could have told him. Marsha shook her head. Just a bunch of gamers crying over some guy they never met and probably never will. Quinn smiled. I heard that. He wrapped his hands on the desk and continued into the cafe gaming floor. The special commemoration video for Quinn had ended. The atmosphere inside the cafe remained heavy. Many people's eyes were red and watery. Those like Quinn, maintaining a calm expression, were perceived as heartless by others. Uncertain of Jenny's whereabouts, Quinn went back to Marsha to inquire. He also wanted to learn more about how the special broadcast came to be. Marsha rolled her eyes. Whenever a glory competition occurs, the cafe hosts a special live stream. Today, without an ongoing competition, the esports stream organized a special program for Quinn's retirement. Area 51 Cafe showcases all broadcasts we can related to the games. Quinn nodded. Broadcasts will do that to the gamer world. Marsha shook her head no. When the competitions end, everyone will be fueled with an eagerness to play, rushing to the game. The cafe would be packed for hours. Jenny loved seeing the revenue soar. Today, though, after this stream, the glory players are in an uncommonly somber mood. Some left immediately, heading home to cry into their pillows or whatever. There were those who continued playing the game. Not everyone was a fan of Quinn. Hell, Jenny is barely even aware of him. Quinn scratched his head. Jenny doesn't know him? Marsha giggled. <laughs> no, she's a big fan of a different team. She keeps up with the scene but is only tangentially aware of other teams if they've played against them. This Huddy Zeppelin, or whoever hasn't ever matched with her favorite team. Quinn smirked. Cutter's eye on. This explains a lot. The entire cafe fell into an unusual quietness. On a typical day, glory players would be donning their headsets, full of energy, and the cafe would buzz with noise and excitement. Contemplating what to do, Quinn noticed Jenny descending from the second floor. He hurried over. Jenny, tell me it's my official day to take the reins. Jenny shrugged. Okay, fine. But when you're working, you can't just casually sit down anywhere. You have to keep watch at the counter. Quinn grinned. I can play games, though? Jenny pointed to the VR set currently being used by Marsha to watch soap operas. You can. 
Just use that station. Gwyn lifted his eyebrows. One last question. Can I smoke? It's kind of a law to give 15-minute breaks every hour. Jenny met his gaze and reluctantly nodded. That's not a law, but you can smoke. When I come over in the morning, there better not be any smoke smell or cigarette ash. Anywhere. Quinn clicked his heels together and saluted Jenny. Understood. Jenny instructed Quinn on how to operate and shut down the computers for guests. Truthfully, at this time, most of the guests pull all-nighters. By 11 o'clock, all the guests should have arrived, and their computers will automatically shut down at 7 in the morning. There's really not much for you to do. Just your presence is enough. If the guests have any issues, they'll ring a bell. Despite not being computer illiterate, Quinn definitely lacked the expertise to fix a broken computer. I'll kick anyone out if a computer malfunctions. What? No. Restart it. She replied. Quinn wiped away his sweat. And if restarting doesn't work, take their credit card. You break it, you bought it. Jenny stopped him. Switch computer stations. You're on the night shift. There'll be plenty of open computers, so you can just choose a random one. But write down what the computer's problem was, and I'll get a technician to look at it the next day. Listen, I don't plan on you being an engineer or anything. Just keep people happy, and keep the place clean, and don't let any fights break out. Quinn did his little salute again. You can sleep safe knowing that I'm at the hell. Jenny carefully explained once again the things Quinn needed to know, then randomly found a station to play glory. Quinn stood nearby and glanced a few times at her screen. Jenny had entered the arena. It was clear that something else was on her mind. While playing, she repeatedly made several significant mistakes typical of low-skilled players. After losing three rounds, Jenny tapped her gaming gauntlet and logged out of the game. Turning her head, she spotted Quinn standing around, seemingly with nothing to do. After shooting him a glare, she walked back to the second floor. Quinn checked the time, realizing there wasn't much time left until he had to start working at 11 o'clock. Marsha at the counter also timed it well. The soap opera had finished just as the clock struck 11, and she stood up, smiling at Quinn. Hey, Quinn, I'm going home. Quinn had been waiting for the computer for a long time. I don't know what you're working so hard for, overachiever. Get out of here. Marsha wasn't the only employee finishing work. The daytime and evening hours weren't as empty as the all-night shift. One person definitely wasn't enough to take care of everyone. The cafe employees weren't yet familiar with Quinn, but they recognized him. They politely waved goodbye and left one by one. The cafe was empty, with the sound of games and mice echoing. Compared to the excitement of last night's new server opening, the atmosphere had completely transformed. Thinking that all this change was because of his retirement announcement, Quinn softly sighed and sat at the counter. Inserting his account card, he logged into the game. Upon entering, he received several messages. Quinn opened them and found Snake Tongue and his war party lining up to greet him. Snake Tongue waved. Bloodhawk, you've done! Quinn gave a subtle wave as if he were in a parade. Is everyone ready to bum-rush some bosses and break some records? Snake Tongue shook his head. Most of us. Wolf Claw's gone. Quinn thought of that little guy. He loves being a drama queen. Snake Tongue swayed his head. No, he's not feeling too well. Today, Quinn's retirement was announced. He really liked Quinn, so he's a bit depressed. He's not coming to play tonight. Wynn couldn't decide whether to laugh or stay silent upon learning that Wolfclaw was actually one of his fans. If he revealed his identity as Quinn to the one who shamelessly attacked his idol, he didn't know how Wolfclaw would react. Wynn pointed out, If we're missing a person, then Spider Cave's hidden bosses won't be too easy to kill. Hooded Vulture stepped forward. Why don't we randomly add someone? Quinn scratched his head. 
I say we go to the skeleton graveyard and pick out teeth with some rib bones. The skeleton graveyard was a level 15 to 20 dungeon. It was an idea Snake Tongue and the others had entertained for a while. They hoped Quinn would lead them to achieve a few more first clears. Quinn had different thoughts regarding the glory of being the first to clear a dungeon. He didn't care. To achieve this, they needed to keep their levels at the top standings consistently. Quinn couldn't manage that due to time constraints. When he went offline in the morning, Bloodhawk was fit in the 10th server level standings. Now, checking again, his name wasn't even there. Those at the forefront were already level 22. Players from big guilds organized massive leveling efforts using wheel tactics with accounts shared by two or three people, playing 24 hours a day. Despite Quinn's skill, he couldn't compete with this strategy. He was only one player. He had to put himself at more risk to reap better rewards. The skeleton graveyard could be just that risk. Their war party moved to their next challenge. Quinn saw that the first level 20 frost forest clear had already been completed. The original system record had been broken as well, with the number of times it had been broken displayed. The record had been surpassed three times. The present record was set by the Shallow Grave Guild, with a time of 26 minutes, 12 seconds, and 48 milliseconds. By comparison, the dungeon clearing record showed a more accurate representation of skill and strength than the leveling up. The speed at which it took to clear and set the new record showed off how well you understood the equipment you gained from leveling up as well as the game's current combat meta strategies. Players who were able to prove a deeper understanding of the game's meta would turn heads. Gwyn scratched his head, feeling a bit annoyed with himself. He was a little fuzzy on the dungeon details, but he knew this record was ultimately weak. He pushed off his annoyance with indifference and considered his options to level fast and catch up as much as he could with the professional players. Snake Tongue messaged Bloodhawk through the server. Bloodhawk, we've arrived at Skeleton Graveyard. Quinn noticed his team members were at the same level as when they went offline, seeming to share Quinn's habit of sleeping during the day. He controlled Bloodhawk to hurry over to Skeleton Graveyard. Heard and acknowledged. Be prepared for the dungeon run of your life. Normally, they could have gone to the dungeon as soon as they hit level 15, but upgrading Quinn's Thousand Chance Umbrella required a substantial amount of strong spider silk. Yesterday, he had made his demands clear. He stated that after hitting level 15, they could switch dungeons, but he wouldn't go. In the end, the four guys stayed behind too, and followed Gwyn to Spider Cave. After the boss battle, he didn't have enough strong spider silk. Quinn and his team bitterly cleared the dungeon 11 times, encountering the hidden bosses three times. One of them was the Spider Emperor. The other two hidden bosses were Spider Warriors, which did not drop great materials. Along with the foyer spider bosses he got from the first kill, he had a total of 16 strong spider silk. He needed 40 to level the Thousand Chance Umbrella. If they maintained yesterday's pace, they would still need two more days to gather the required materials. Quinn calculated that if the Iron Beast Guild had stayed with him in the Spider Cave the entire time, they would soon reach level 18. Reaching level 20, they would be five levels above the Spider Cave. In glory... Five levels were crucial thresholds for equipment, skills, and experience. If they exceeded the dungeon by five, they would receive less experience, making leveling less efficient. Quinn felt a little cheap bringing the others to Spider Cave again so he could get the strong silk he needed. Relying on these mediocre players to get me back to my heights isn't a good plan. I have to find another way. Well, Quinn thought this. Bloodhawk had arrived at Skeleton Graveyard. 
he located Snake Tongue in the crowd and asked to join their party. After entering the party, Snake Tongue placed his hand on Bloodhawk's back. Do we still need another person? Quinn entered the skeleton graveyard. It's not necessary. Skeleton Graveyard also had materials he needed, even though he didn't need them yet. It wouldn't be the worst to stock up on supplies for a quick level jump when the time came, but it wasn't ideal either. Quinn led the war party. They haven't used the Thousand Chance Umbrella for very long, but it's becoming a burden. It isn't easy starting up again. Maybe I should have thought of this before I retired so easily. Quinn laughed to himself. Nah, they didn't deserve me at Elite. Bloodhawk, did you have any ideas about the loot we'll get? Anything you need? Quinn cracked his knuckles. I want the Skeleton Warrior Sabres. Nothing else. Snake Tongue was surprised. The Ornamental Sabres. That's all you want? Right. Hooded Vulture greeted Bloodhawk. Oh, Let's not add anyone new just yet, in case they argue for those sabers or want to make a fuss about our tactics. Explaining everything to a newly added person would take time, and there might be trust issues. Giving the party leader priority picks might scare away the stranger, as they wouldn't be sure if they would get a share of the loot. It was better to stick with four friends. Quinn agreed. Sounds good. He wanted to avoid unnecessary trouble. The war party entered the dungeon. Shark Hyde grinned. Come on, hidden bosses! Hooded Vulture jogged ahead. Give us some loot. Snake Tongue pulled his sword and followed. Let's set some boss lane records, Iron Beasts. Quint laughed. <laughs> you guys are becoming addicted to killing hidden bosses. Don't get too used to it. The worst thing you can be is overconfident. Hooded Vulture smirked. This coming from the guy who says he's the best? Gwyn casually propped his lance on his shoulder. I said overconfident. Not the right amount of confidence for being me. He weeped. The three responded with heavy laughter. Ever since they followed Quinn, they all harbored a fascination for hidden bosses. If there wasn't a hidden boss, then they would just roll through the dungeon with no pressure. Bloodhawk swung out his battle lance to point forward and led the way. Let's go get some bone dust on our shoes. Snake Tongue, Hooded Vulture, Shark Hide, skillfully tailed behind him. Fine rain drizzled down on Skeleton Graveyard. Dark green willow wisps could be seen far and near, accompanied by faint ghost cries. Occasionally, two mournful groans would suddenly push forward, causing their scalps to tingle. Snake Tongue shivered. It feels like the wind is blowing right into my ears. Shark Hyde slowed his steps. Feels like there's something hiding in every shadow here. Hooded Vulture took a defensive stance. Watch your steps, fellas. I'll keep an eye on the rear. Quinn knew this wasn't a psychological effect, but something else. Although his hands didn't stop moving, his head subconsciously turned left and right. He saw a shining white face and a pair of black eyes stealthily staring at him without ever blinking. The cherry red lips looked as if they dripped with blood. Gwyn flapped the game gauntlet controls. Bloodhawk stopped. This time, he had fully pressed seven or eight keys. In the game, Bloodhawk looked as if he had spasmed and made several mistakes. Rabbit wolves leaped from the shadows. Savage crows swooped in from the air. The attack came suddenly, and from multiple angles, the war party took formation and fended off the beasts. It was fortunate that they were only fighting small beasts. Snake Tongue and Hooded Vulture quickly rescued him. Hooded Vulture leaned towards Snake Tongue. Red Hawk never made any mistakes yesterday. He just started playing. How could he suddenly freeze up? Snake Tongue guarded Blood Hawk. Could something have happened to him last night? Gwyn turned around and quickly moved to stabilize the situation. The others relaxed until Bloodhawk said, Jenny, you're staying up so late. I can handle it here. You're running around like you're trying to be a superhero or something. Bloodhawk stopped again. Gwyn pulled the headphones off his left ear 
and tried to split his attention between the game and Jen. Snake Tongue was startled. What? Shark Hyde privately messaged, A love affair. The three immediately kept silent, holding their headphones tight to their ears. Jenny took off her facial mask. I can't sleep, so I came down to sit for a bit. Bloodhawk leaped into action. Snake Tongue, move back. Shark Hyde, take the lead. Hooded Vulture, pay attention to the four o'clock direction. Jenny quietly looked at Quit as he was killing monsters. A lot of my customers are still talking about Cutter Zion's player retiring. Quinn cracked his neck. Yeah, the arena loves Cutter. Jenny sat in the chair near Quinn. So I gathered. Quinn tried to hide his smile. Not a fan? Jenny pondered for a bit before responding. I don't have much of an opinion about him. Quinn leaned back towards Jenny. One of the greatest avatars to grace the competitive scene, and you don't have an opinion? Jenny smiled. I have a team I follow, and some players I like. That's what I liked about the scene. There's too many games to follow, and Cutter never played against them. Quinn brought his attention back to killing monsters. You'd be a fan if Cutter did. Jenny scoffed. I've watched some highlights of Elite's battles. I feel like Cutter Zion isn't as strong as his fans make him out to be. Quinn smirked at the comment, but remained silent. The current professional alliance has become more and more commercial. Experts are everywhere. Grained Maniac, Blade Lord, Royal Basher, Madam Magic. These players aren't any worse than Cutter Zion, and their accounts are just as strong. Each team has more than one expert, but not elite. They just had Cutter Zion. Bad management, if you ask me. Quinn nodded. Definitely the management. I wouldn't say those others are just as strong as Cutter Zion, but they're decent. Jenny smiled. With the recent level of competition, one person can't carry the team alone. But I did see some early Cutter Zion plays where he hard carried. I guess I can see the appeal in that. But I think that kind of expectation in the modern era of esports is unrealistic. Still listening, Quinn tapped away on the gauntlet. Snake Tongue! Pull back a bit. You're too far ahead. Hooded Vulture, stand with Shark Eye. I can handle this side on my own. Jenny tapped her foot. You are awfully quiet, but you always have something to say about competitive glory. Quinn frowned. I heard, I heard. You came at a bad time. Jenny's word did distract Quinn slightly, and he struggled to get back to his current play cadence of the game. Bloodheart continued to perform flawlessly. But Quinn, the master, couldn't get Jenny's words out of his head, making him a bit sloppy in his gaming execution. Quinn thought about some retort to Jenny while playing, but his gaze remained fixed on the screen. What did you say again? Quickly grabbing his headphones, he shouted into them. Snake Dunk, back! Move back! Jenny noticed that Quinn was a little more stressed than usual. Are you okay? Quinn's hands briefly adjusted his headset, then swiftly returned to the gauntlet. In game, the four of them were currently in the midst of a boss battle. They were short one member, and they needed Quinn's bloodhawk and his full attention. The difficulty was that Quinn was a bit too narcissistic to avoid a conversation about himself. Well, if following your favorite team is what makes you play this badly now... I can see why you think a godly player wouldn't make a difference. Jenny frowned. They kick your butt in a second. Now Jenny was getting annoyed. Quinn continued to tease her. But I'm sure a cutter would cut them down. If he never matched with them, then they're not worth his time. Jenny was flushing red with anger. She thought she made an innocuous comment, and now this punk was talking trash about her favorite team. She hadn't even told him who they were yet and he felt he could still trash talk them? Well, I can't just strangle him to death, can I? Jenny sat back down, turning on the computer in front of his station. I'm not the best at execution, but even so, I bet I can kick ass on a new server. I'm logging in. Quinn slowly blinked like he didn't have a care in the world. Do your best not to get killed by the same noob 40 times in a row. Hope you didn't learn that from the professionals you claim to watch. Gwyn paused playing for a split second to use finger quotes for emphasis. Jenny made a raspy grunt. Mind your business. 
do some work, will ya? Gwyn was fully engaged in an intense battle with the boss. How do I get you into this war party? Jenny waved her account card at Quinn. I have an account on the 10th server. Without turning around, Quinn nodded. That's a start. Jenny huffed. Quinn, do me a favor. Don't be so... you all the time. I should definitely strangle him and bury him in a hole behind the cafe. Quinn didn't look at her while he played. I'm only teasing. Warm up a bit by doing the intro missions. Jenny decided to do the opposite of whatever Quinn suggested. I won't do the intro missions. I'm good enough to battle a boss with you. Take me to a dungeon. Gwyn pointed to her avatar. For still level one, Green Forest was the lowest level dungeon for level five to ten. If you aren't level five, you can't enter. Jenny nudged him. Figure something out. Gwyn grumbled. Fine, let me think for a second. Then his hands went into that slow rhythmical motion on the gauntlet again. Suddenly, he swiftly grabbed his headset microphone. Sharkhide, get back to your position. You're about to be surrounded. What's going on? You guys are making so many mistakes. If I didn't know better, I'd say Wolf Cub paid you to set me up. After dealing some damage to the boss, he heard a few knuckle-cracking sounds behind him. Jenny ground her teeth. Did you think of something? Quinn cleared his throat and paused. He was immersed in the game without consideration for the real world. He had to give himself time. I thought of something. Jenny was astonished. I wasn't sure there was anything possible for me under the system setup. I just wanted him to come find me in the 10th server. Maybe do an NPC mission together. Oh, he probably wants to run a beginner course with me. Gwyn motioned to the VR set in front of her. Forget about missions. Just kill monsters somewhere until you're level 5. Jenny fumed. I'll kill you first. Even though she considered it thoroughly, Jenny didn't kill Quinn. She couldn't enter level 5 Green Forest as a level 1, so she had to complete the missions alone until she was leveled up. Jenny looked at Quinn before going back to her mission. Fighting and playing by herself was a bit lonely for her, but it was still faster than just killing monsters. In the midst of working the night shift, Quinn found a moment to turn around and quickly glance at the character on her screen. Smokeshy? Where have I seen that ID before? Jenny nearly threw her VR headset at Quinn. She bared her teeth. This is my main account, my avatar you shamelessly took over and fought with. Quinn turned back to focus on his game. Oh, I thought it sounded familiar. Jenny suddenly realized. Besides that time when we first met, I haven't seen this guy's face when he wasn't distracted by the game. It's only the skeleton graveyard, not like it's Fort Knox. Does he really need to concentrate so hard? But as she thought about it, her temper cooled. He didn't need to concentrate. In the skeleton graveyard, monsters would often randomly pop up from out of nowhere. A scattered skeleton under the dead leaves could suddenly converge into an enemy or emerge from their grave. This dungeon didn't have a set route or a fixed number of monsters. The layout changed every time, testing players' concentration and reaction time. With only four members in Quinn's party, they needed to concentrate even more. Quinn's actions seemed reasonable when viewed objectively. Jenny's annoyance wasn't allowing her to view him objectively, though. She could only disgruntedly continue completing her missions. Only a day had passed since the opening of the 10th server. Beginners were still everywhere, causing Jenny to progress slowly through her missions. Even Quinn, a peak expert, had taken two hours to complete them. Although the situation was better than yesterday, insults toward him about kill-stealing still persisted. During the process, Jenny heard Quinn's cold laugh. <laughs> People need to get over themselves. Jenny wondered if he was making fun of her. When she turned her head, Quinn had his headset on and continued dungeon crawling with his party. He's talking to himself? Jenny decided it was best not to instigate and continued killing monsters. To Quinn and the others, clearing the skeleton graveyard this time was more tedious than dangerous. The road was bumpy because Sharkhide couldn't react in time to the dungeon's difficulties, getting scared by skeletons suddenly popping out of the ground. 
When the final boss collapsed, Snake Tongue and Hooded Vulture were covered in sweat, but Shark Eye was drenched. Shark Eye cheered after the boss fell. If it weren't for you, Bloodhawk, and we had Wolf Claw as our leader, he wouldn't have cleared it for sure. Gwyn rolled his eyes. This dungeon doesn't really require a peak level expert to lead you. Glares always take a lot of damage here. You just require a priest. Hooded Vulture scoffed. Evidently, this was the beginner village's lesson on dungeons. Know the importance of class combinations or die in ignorance. Thankfully, Quinn's Bloodhawk was able to heal and kill monsters at the same time. The war party rolled through the skeleton graveyard with haste. After coming out, Quinn looked back. Jenny was still in the beginner area and wasn't paying attention to him, so he entered again. She won't know. She'll think it's the same run. Shark Hyde wiped his brow and turned to Snake Tongue and Hooded Vulture. I'm a little nervous. Feel like I'm holding Bloodhawk back a bit. Hooded Vulture took a moment to rest. Oh, yeah. Don't worry about what you're doing to us. She smiled mischievously. Snake Tongue laughed it off. Don't give it a second thought, Sharky. With his skill, he could easily find three other more skilled partners. If we don't hold our weight in these battles, I wouldn't be surprised if Bloodhawk leaves us for good. In the next round through the skeleton graveyard, Snake Tongue and the others concentrated 120%. Carefully and cautiously, they improved their reaction to skeletons suddenly popping out, and their clearing speed increased significantly. The skeleton graveyard also housed three hidden bosses, the Skeleton Warrior, Skeleton Mage, and Skeleton King. The dungeon wouldn't provide any hints if a hidden boss appeared. These three could emerge at any time from the shadows. Only then would they get any kind of a prompt to battle. In parties with bad luck, a member might have already been killed by the time they noticed any sign of a warning. With Quinn leading, such careless errors would never occur. After easily clearing the second dungeon, the hidden boss still hadn't shown himself. Snake Tongue huffed for breath. We've completed the dungeon twice, and still haven't seen all the bosses. Quinn lifted his VR headset to check on Jenny's progress. She was engaged in killing with random avatars outside the beginner village. Quinn searched a bit more and noted her character's level, which had reached level 4 and was about to hit level 5. Quinn entered the skeleton graveyard with speed. Ooh, I better hurry up and start again before she gets to 5. The others didn't hesitate. Kill, move, kill, move. Suddenly, in front of them, a crooked gravestone gently shook. Snake Tongue hadn't noticed and continued forward. Gwyn hastily grabbed his shoulder. Move back behind me! Softly. I live for first blood. Snake Tongue immediately followed his command. He neatly retreated. Bloodhawk's avatar had already moved past them in a flash. After the gravestone gently shook, it shot out of the dirt like a cannonball toward the four of them. Quinn shifted to the left. Heads up! Snake Duck, Shark Hide, and Hooded Vulture quickly dodged the headstone and prepared themselves for battle. A saber-wielding spiky bone skeleton emerged from the hole where the gravestone had flung out. Seeing the menacing skeleton, they knew it wasn't an ordinary monster. A grave, ominous voice spoke through the chilled air of the graveyard. You have entered the skeleton warrior's place of eternal rest. Quinn gripped his thousand chance umbrella. Our prayers are answered. We've finally run into a skeleton warrior. Shark Hyde tried to keep his teeth from chattering. I've prayed for a professional grade VR set for my birthday. Not this. How do we fight it? The skeleton warrior leaped out of the grave like a catapult shuff. It showcased his powerful jumping ability. In midair, polluted dirt rolled out from his body, crashing down onto the ground like poisonous fog. In his hand, he carried an enormous but extremely damaged sword around the size of Bloodhawk. Gwyn frowned. Too bad. Snake Tongue eyed Bloodhawk. What's wrong? Gwyn smirked. Oh, nothing. I, uh, just forgot to look at a guide. His three teammates felt like throwing up their hands in defeat. Shark Hyde gulped. Bloodhog, you're too cavalier. Hooded Vulture took a wide stance. I can help you look. Quinn shook his head no. No good. 
If he attacks you, then you're dead and we're down two instead of one. The skeleton warrior had dropped to the ground, causing the earth to quake and the mausoleums to shake. The attack range was extremely large. Sharkhide was too slow and didn't dodge in time. He was hit by the shockwave and fell flat on his face. The skeleton warrior's two black eyes swept over them as if searching for a target to attack. Hooded Vulture inched away. Someone draw it out. I'll focus its attention. Quinn took off his headset and turned around. Boss! Boss! Jenny! Jenny tapped her gauntlet and concentrated on her avatar. What do you want? Look up a guide for me. Jenny kept playing. Are you asking or telling? Quinn shook his head. Jenny! Will you please help me with the guide? Jenny was astonished and lifted her VR set. What guide? Gwyn controlled Bloodhawk while pointing to his screen. Skeleton warrior guide. That's your plan? Do you start looking up a guide after you've met the boss? What have you been doing? Skipping hopscotch? I forgot. Jenny was wandering the lands for a monster to kill. With no imminent danger, she quickly switched out of the game and searched for a skeleton graveyard guide. Which boss? Quinn tapped his gauntlet. Skeleton warrior, look for how to make it so that he drops the saber. Jenny hadn't engaged in this type of low-level dungeon in five years. Saber drop? I know about the saber, but I'm not aware of any guides containing information about that. All I remember is running through the dungeon with Smokeshy, killing what came by. I never consulted a guide about it. Quinn didn't listen and pointed to his guide on the reception desk computer. Yeah. Use that to figure out how I get that saber. Although he forgot the details, he knew that the information was definitely in the guy. He had written about it. Jenny promptly searched. Skeleton warrior. Saber. The in the forum post. Jenny clicked on it and was immediately surprised. The last post is from Cutter Zion, ten years ago. This wasn't a secret in the glory community. Everyone knew that before the Glory Professional Alliance came into existence, Quinn's ID had become a famous expert, leading to his invitation as a pro gamer by elite. Quinn focused on dodging and striking. Right, that one. See how many times I need to hit the buckle fastening the saber. Jenny had never seen this post, and for a moment, she had no idea what Quinn was talking about. Jenny quickly skimmed over the post and finally found the exact part. 24 times. There are also pictures of where to hit it. Do you need to see it? Gwyn nodded. Yeah, enlarge it for me. Jenny opened the diagrams and enlarged them. Check it out. Gwyn turned his head like light, less than a second, before turning back. Jenny was flabbergasted. That's all you need? Gwyn grinned. You know it. Do you need anything else? She asked. Nah, go back to leveling. Guinea grimaced sarcastically. Oh. Well, thank you, Jenny, for taking time out of your game. You're welcome, dummy. Next time, figure it out on your own and hopefully you get that saber right in your gut. Quinn smiled at Jenny's grumbling. He enjoyed sarcastic mockery. But he couldn't forget about the game for too long. He remembered that he needed to do enough damage to the skeleton warrior before hitting the buckle. Although he didn't remember exactly how much. With the Thousand Chance Umbrella's 180 physical attack plus his avatar's strength, he believed that Bloodhawk would be able to pull it off. Quinn crowd. Snipe John, go to the left. Hooded Vulture, go around to the back. Sharkhide, move back a bit, or the next shockwave is gonna do you damage. Quinn directed the three into position while he continued to look for an opportunity to attack. Before, the players were only dodging. Without Quinn's orders, no one went in to attack. The war party followed his direction to the T. After all, they didn't know that he wasn't looking for a guide on how to beat the skeleton warrior. He was looking at how to make the saber drop so he could loot it. Jenny had tossed aside her game and stood behind Quinn, eager to see how he would hit the saber buckle 24 times. She had looked at the guide. The buckle is on the skeleton warrior's waist. You wouldn't have to hit that small buckle from every direction. To do that, you have to get within at least two meters. There's no way you can hit it enough times without being killed. Quinn loved a challenge. Say no. Quinn moved Bloodhawk to meet the boss face to face. When he healed the party, the skeleton warrior locked onto his avatar as the number one target. 
Bloodhawk dodged left and right the entire time, while Snake Tongue, Hook Damage, and Hooded Vulture almost died. Sharkhide wandered around, waiting for Quinn to tell him when to attack. The three Iron Beasts didn't know Quinn's intention to grab the saber. Sharkhide moved into position. What is he doing? Why are we moving so far back? Snake Tongue shifted in the dirt. I figure his strategy is to get the skeleton warrior to forget about us. If the boss forgets that we're in the battle, we'll have the element of surprise. When Bloodhawk does enough damage, it'll tell us how to attack the boss. Hooded Vulture lifted her eyebrows. Genius. Seeing that Bloodhawk met the skeleton warrior one on one, their hearts tightened. The battle was finally going to begin. The skeleton warrior rushed at Bloodhawk in large strides, swinging his large blade like a meat cleaver. It let out an ear-piercing shriek, shaking the avatars from head to toe. Quinn directed Bloodhawk to charge at his foe, but his concentration zeroed in on the skeleton warrior's buckle. Jenny, standing behind him, discovered that it was much more difficult than it seemed. That guide made those targets on the buckle easy to see. But the skeleton warrior's swaying too much. Back and forth. He won't stop moving. He keeps covering the hit points on the buckle. Quinn didn't need the commentary. I got eyes. I see that. Keep watching, though. The skeleton warrior raised its huge broadsword two feet away from Bloodhawk. Calm and unhurried, Quinn quickly attacked. His thousand chant umbrella's attack speed of five was definitely higher than that slow, gigantic sword. Usually. Gigantic swords like that had an attack speed of one. In this distance, although the skeleton warrior's gigantic sword was huge, its length couldn't compare to a battle lance's. Quinn calmly maneuvered his avatar. Bloodhawk's thousand chance umbrella battle lance, though delayed, thrust forward, colliding head on with the skeleton warrior's attack. Being quicker on his feet, Quinn took advantage of the brief stun it caused the skeleton. Bloodhawk swiftly closed in and executed a sky strike. The skeleton warrior was heavier than the midnight phantom cat, but this villain moved as swiftly as the eight-legged spider boss. Following the sky strike, the skeleton warrior was knocked into the air. Seizing the opportunity, Bloodhawk slashed, the distinct sound echoing, unlike the usual bone-to-bone -bone contact. Jenny's excitement grew. You got it! You hit the buckle! Gwyn didn't hesitate. 23 to go. With a flick of his fingers, Bloodhawk turned, striking again. The lance swept the floor, hitting the skeleton warrior that had been flipped by the sky strike with a resonating as it connected with the buckle. Quinn withdrew Bloodhawk after two hits, anticipating a furious counterattack. As the skeleton warrior rose, it hit the ground, generating a 360 degree shockwave. Most bosses employed such shockwave tactics to prevent relentless combo attacks. Observing the two precise hits on the buckle, Jen, initially thrilled by Quinn's promising start, now found the accuracy unsettled. How is he doing this? Lost in thought, she was interrupted by a Bloodhawk leap, evading the shockwave's edge. As it subsided, Quinn directed Bloodhawk to charge immediately with a thrust. The lance struck the buckle a third time. Jenny grabbed him in excitement. She dug her fingers into his shoulders absentmindedly. Oh my, watch out! Quinn tensed under the pressure. While I appreciate the encouragement, a little easy on the grip. Jenny released him. Oops, sorry. The skeleton warrior's hands crashed down, but Bloodhawk skillfully rolled back, evading the colossal sword by inches. It was such a close swing that Snake Tongue couldn't tell if Bloodhawk had taken damage. Consulting the party list for his HP and MP, he confirmed that he dodged the sword without damage. The members of the war party held their breath, fearful of disrupting Bloodhawk's battle. Snake Tongue gripped the hilt of his weapon. Remain on guard, everyone. Hooded Vulture was poised to follow any order and engage in combat. Ready at will. Any minute now, he'll call us in. Surprisingly, they stood on the sideline, observing Bloodhawk and the skeleton warrior locked in a perilous fight. No call for assistance came. Positioned strategically, one on the left, one on the right, and one directly behind the skeleton warrior. They leaped away from the shockwave attack, but stayed prepared for a call to action. 
Hooded vulture, private message, snake tongue, and shark hide. Do you think he's planning to solo it? Shark hide stops shifting from side to side. Honestly, I have my doubts if he needs us. Hooded vulture's next message sent a shiver through them. Soloing a hidden skeleton warrior? Shark hide straightened his posture. It's not impossible. Hooded vulture held her blade in the air. Bloodhawk, you're incredible. We're still here when you need us. She lowered her voice so that only she and the fellas could hear. If you need us. Sharkhide took his eyes off the battle and faced the others. With this skill, I doubt even our guild leader could match him. Snake Tongue still had hopes of being called to fight. He followed the skeleton vigilantly. Definitely not a match for a skeleton warrior slayer. The Iron Beast guild leader had ascended to his position because of his revered 200 actions per minute and speed. Unfortunately, within a day since the launch of the 10th server, he had already lost three members. In the eyes of the guild leader, this was not just irritating, but downright betrayal. Sharkhide went so far as to place his arrow back in his quiff. I think he's gonna solo it. We're spectators for this one. I'm gonna need to use the bathroom if we aren't gonna fight. Snake Tongue watched the graveyard for any opponent. It's possible. Maybe if a wolf or a small skeleton is in the shadows, we can... Hooded Vulture laughed. But now could be a good time to use the bathroom, Shark. Sharkhide sighed. No, this is too amazing. I don't want to miss it, to be honest. Should we record it? Snake Tongue molded over. Bloodhawk didn't mention. I say we should. The Iron Beasts continued to witness Bloodhawk's remarkable battle. Snake Tongue was in awe. His mastery of the Battlelands is unparalleled. The way he's dodging the state's it reminds me of a kung fu move. Sharkhide laughed. <laughs> Crouching Bloodhawk hidden skeleton. Hooded Vulture grinned. Yeah, thousand chance umbrella of death. Snake Tongue felt like they were glimpsing a new world. Compared to this, players battling monsters are just new blades, no finesse, and no excitement. Jenny stood behind Quid, counting his every move. She wasn't watching the same display of skill as the Iron Beasts. She was experiencing his gameplay in Bloodhawk's first-person view, but her viewpoint limited her ability to witness many of Bloodhawk's actions. As Bloodhawk continuously spun and dodged and rolled, Jenny struggled to maintain her balance, nearly becoming dizzy. The rapid whirl made it challenging for her to keep up, often leaving her disoriented about Bloodhawk's direction and the skeleton warrior's whereabouts. As for the buckle, it was a rare occurrence for her to gauge its location amidst the chaos. Despite the chaotic display on his screen, Quinn's hand movements remained crystal clear. Amidst the whirlwind, Jenny observed Quinn's rhythmic hands. She noticed that Quinn's left hand exhibited a swifter agility than the day before. His right hand, responsible for weapon control, moved at an even faster pace, but with minimal displacement. Following each movement, an immediate landslide bore an agile escape from damage. Jenny was impressed. Quinn's actions were precise and efficient, devoid of any hint of clumsiness or mistakes. Even as the screen spun at a dizzying speed, Bloodhawk's maneuvers consistently found their way to the correct position, executing attacks without the slightest tremor. She stared unblinked. Quinn's gameplay wasn't just quick, but remarkably steady, exceptionally so. Jenny couldn't believe what she was watching. The professional level really is different in person. I've seen some good players, great players. His gestures are on another level. Quinn's headset made another sound. Jenny paid attention to this faint sound and continued her count. She shook him. That marks the 20th hit on this buckle. Only four more and you got it. Throughout the entire battle with the hidden boss, Bloodhawk hadn't suffered one bit of death, not physical or magical. Not only was Quinn striking with unmatched skill, but his defenses never allowed the skeleton warrior to land a single hit. But when Jenny shook him, he was gently scratched across his armor by the tip of the saber blade. Quinn scooted forward, away from Jenny. Jenny, how about you cheer me on from a safe distance, like the other side of the room? Jenny strunched her face, knowing her mistake. Yeah, I'll be over here if you need me. Quinn's heart raced, 
but he controlled his breathing. Hooded Vulture, the life's in Mountain! Hooded Vulture assumed her assistance wasn't required. Huh? What? Is it finally our turn? Hearing Quinn's call, she raised her sword and charged forward. Just as she began her assault, Bloodhawk executed a sky strike. The skeleton warrior was propelled towards Hooded Vulture. She seized the opportunity. Hooded Vulture raised her sword. A red blaze enveloped her blade as she delivered Collapse in Mountain. The strike slashed the skeleton warrior eight times, the maximum limit for that skill. Quinn leaped to Hooded Vulture. Keep your guard! Guard! Hooded Vulture was one step ahead. Even before Quinn could finish, Hooded Vulture assumed a defensive stat. As the skeleton warrior rose to its feet, the shockwave hit her sword. Hooded Vulture was pushed back. Her guard skill at level 4 reduced the incoming damage by 70%. The shockwave attack wasn't a major maneuver. The reduced damage made very little impact. Bloodhawk leaped to evade the attack, swiftly countering. He fired his lance with his powerful dragon troop. The skeleton warrior stumbled and became stunned. Hooded Vulture, understanding without the need for a command, was poised to employ her stun skill, double the skeleton warrior's temporary paralysis. Quinn twirled his thousand-chance umbrella. Nighttime! Shark hide! The two fighters had surged forward, comprehending his strategy and ready to utilize their stun skills as needed. Jenny was perplexed by why Quinn suddenly required their assistance. What happened? Quinn promptly had Bloodhawk tilt his head to show her. Did you not see? Jenny instantly noticed that Bloodhawk's saber lay quietly next to the skeleton warrior's feet. The buckle unexpectedly broke off and dropped the loot. Jenny was astounded. How could that be? Wasn't it supposed to be 24 hits? She was making a point to listen for the ping sound during Bloodhawk's battle. You need to get more sleep. It was 24 times. Jenny frowned. How come I only heard 20 hits? Gwyn grinned. I used double stab four times. It hits twice in rapid succession, so you probably didn't hear it. Or you were so much in awe of my skills that you weren't listening. Jenny was taken aback. Double stab hits the same spot twice? Wait, did you make the hidden boss bleed? Why didn't I see it? Bleed? Four times and it still didn't bleed. Does it not count if it hits the buckle? She asked. Quinn scrunched his face. Skeletons don't have blood, no flesh to cut. How can it bleed? Jenny blushed. In glory, many monsters were immune to bleed. In the lore and subsequent matching game design, they lacked organs that made bleeding possible. Jenny gritted her teeth as she sat back at her computer. I know skeletons can't bleed. I was testing your game knowledge. You passed. Plus, it's all your fault if I couldn't see straight. With the camera angle spinning around like a lunatic, who could have known you were even fighting a skeleton? Gwyn had what he came for, but the monster still needed to be taken down. Gwyn popped a cigarette in his mouth. Jenny, are you preparing to pull an all-nighter? Jenny blushed, thinking he was going to ask her to hang or run dungeons. Why? You have something in mind? Gwyn motioned for her to take his VR station. If you're going to play all night, then stay here. I'll go to the smoking area. Jenny scoffed. Smoking area? If you go to the smoking area, then are you working or am I? I'm not paying you so I can watch you play. What, do you think you're some kind of esports star? Quinn shrugged. Oh, uh, didn't you say you don't like the smell of smoke? Jenny's cheeks flamed red. You were on the clock, Quinn. Even if you are getting the smoke break every hour is a real thing, which it certainly is not. I don't think you earned a smoke break yet. Gwyn bobbed the unlit cigarette in his mouth, hinting that it was time for Jenny to decide whether to take over his shift or find another spot. Jenny logged out of the game and stood to leave. I'm going to sleep. Gwyn turned around, his eyes following Jenny. He noticed she left her glory account card on the table. Was she forgetting it? A sudden idea struck Quinn. Hey, Jenny, you forgot to take your card. Do you want me to level you up while I work? Jenny waved him off like a buzzing fly in her ear. Do whatever you want, Quinn. We both know you will anyway. Quinn nodded, his hands moving faster than they did when he played, to quickly light his cigarette and take a drag. The skeleton warrior's demise continued, but Quinn got what he wanted, and now that the hidden boss had lost his weapon, there was no fear of retaliation. 
he took this moment to enjoy the smoke. Quinn focused on the game until the skeleton warrior met its end. The saber he coveted lay on the ground. He grabbed the weapon. The rest of the loot didn't interest him. The others in his party didn't press him. They divided the equipment among themselves. Snake Tongue stuffed his loot in his satchel. Blood Hawk, we're holding on to those high-grade materials you didn't want from the other few hidden bosses yesterday. We'll sell them when the price is sore. The server just opened, and swindlers are taking advantage of newbies buying at low rates. Once the price is stabilized, we'll sell and split the earnings with you. Quinn waved his hand. I've taken my share. That stuff is yours. Snake Tongue shook his head. You deserve more, Bloodhawk. You're too modest. Quinn chuckled. Not something I've been accused of before. They continued their dungeon-clearing venture. Snake Tongue hesitated. We need another person. Quinn snapped his fingers and pointed at Snake Tongue. It's up to you. Another person would boost the efficiency. But today, I'm only training to 20. After that, I need to help my friend level. Snake Tongue smiled. That's fine. Do you need our help? We caught bits of your conversation during the battle. Quinn grinned. No need. You guys do your own things. Exiting the dungeon, Snake Tongue began recruiting a player, easily forming parties in the new server. Amidst numerous requests, he selected a level 17 warrior named Diamond Ruff. Joining the team, she couldn't hide her excitement as she glanced at the party list. Diamond Ruff marveled at the unexpected opportunity. Wait, Snake Tongue, Hood of Vulture, Shark Hide, Bloodhawk? Were you the party that first cleared Spider Cave and the Spider Emperor? Diamond Ruff couldn't help smiling. I'll tell you, I'm honored to join the renowned First Clear team and hope to add to your expert achievements. What do you think about the possibility of becoming a permanent member of this First Clear team? Snake Tongue and Hooded Vulture glanced at each other. Snake Tongue laughed. Hold your horses, Diamond Ruff. Let's see how you play first. Hooded Vulture patted Diamond Ruff's back. Plus, we still have another member who couldn't join today. Diamond Ruff scrunched her face. If I can't secure a spot in the party, maybe I can be your go-to substitute member? Also, what guild and org do you belong to? This question posed a dilemma for Snake Tongue, Shark Hide, and Hooded Vulture. It was evident that this stranger held them in high regard as experts. Although they hadn't entered the dungeon yet, experienced players would recognize that Bloodhawk was the only true expert in the party. Sharkhide smacked his mouth and looked at Snake Tongue and Hooded Vulture. Under Bloodhawk's influence, they weren't sure if they would continue to be the Iron Beasts. Snake Tongue changed the subject and took the lead, confidently walking in with his chin high, trying to imitate Bloodhawk. Let's get inside. Follow me if you want glory. Bloodhawk casually strolled behind. Hooded Vulture followed closely, Diamond Roughnecks and Sharkhide to the tail end, keeping an eye on rear assaults. Once inside the dungeon, Quinn naturally assumed command. Nice, Snake Tongue. I'll take it from here. Snake Tongue gave a reassuring, understanding nod. Diamond Ruff looked around. Hmm? Who's talking? When she joined the party, she chatted incessantly with the others. It was Quinn's first time speaking. Snake Tongue seized the moment to reveal the truth. Bloodhawk, our party's battle god. All our first kills are thanks to him. Without him, our party wouldn't be noteworthy. Diamond Ruff bowed. I pay respects to the great god. Wynn laughed and began leading the group forward. Enough of this aristocratic hoodoo. Let's get on with slaying monsters, shall we? Wynn's expert demeanor quickly became apparent as he commanded and executed kills. Diamond Ruff didn't exhibit much excitement in the presence of his expertise. Snake Tongue observed that this girl was a genuine newbie. Hooded Vulture whispered to Sharkhide. This girl is doomed in the dungeon. Snake Tongue leaned in. Playing with Bloodhawk, her starting point is too high now. 
she's still a newbie and is already encountering a player with skill better than she may ever come across again. How is she going to fit in with regular players? Shark Hyde feigned a sarcastic sigh. A tragedy, the three players lacked. Diamond Ruff was an undeniable newbie. From the moment she entered the dungeon, she was silent, carefully listening in every direction for a monster to fight. Despite making beginner's mistakes, she always apologized for them. Nobody felt inclined to call her out on her faults. When Diamond Ruff made mistakes, Sharkhide felt more nervous than she did. I make mistakes just as big as she does. I have to get it together. With two bad players, Bloodhawk might become impatient. People of his skill can lose patience when dealing with inexperienced players. Slime glopped onto Hooded Vulture's shoulder, a warp. Take cover. In an instant, they were ambushed by tree slugs, dropping from the top of the forest with thick, mucousy skin. They weren't strong monsters by any means, but their mucus could slow your movements. And if enough of the creatures got a hold on you, the force of so many could drain your health. Quinn knew how to handle this attack. Slugs were immune to steel and stabbing. They had unusually rubbery skin. But they could easily succumb to fire and heat. Gwyn tossed a torch to the ground. Throw your torches around us. They won't go near it. That'll give us room to maneuver. The war party obeyed the command and used the fire attacks in their arsenal. Diamond Ruff didn't have much fire skills, but she fended off the monsters by squeezing a goat skin full of bourbon on slugs, letting the others light them ablaze. After clearing more than half of the dungeon, the others finally relaxed. Bloodhawk showed even more patience with the newbies than Snake Tongue did. For commands that Diamond Ruff didn't understand, Bloodhawk went as far as explaining everything to her. Although the addition of a new player slowed down their pace, Snake Tongue didn't bring it to Bloodhawk's attention. While they engaged in monster battles, they helped teach Diamond Ruff. Diamond Ruff slowed her pace. Just a heads up, everyone. This is my first time in a dungeon. I've only completed quests to level up before now. It was when I reached quests that required entering a dungeon that I was convinced to mingle with the crowd outside. Uh, who would have thought my first venture would be with such a renowned party? I've got to say, was excited for the adventure, but now I'm excited for the entire experience. She held her own in the dungeon against the small monsters, but they failed to come face to face with a boss by the end of their first trip. Gwyn turned to the group after completing the dungeon. Uneventful run. What do you say? Go for another round? He bounced his eyebrows twice. Diamond Ruff jumped up and down. Yes, please. I'm learning so much watching you all work together. Snake Tongue smirked. Okay, relax. You have a long way to go, and we haven't met a hard fight yet. After numerous dungeon clears, Bloodhawk and the Iron Beast reached level 20. Diamond Ruff was still a bit behind at level 19. Quinn observed the situation and decided they might as well run through the dungeon a few more times to bring Diamond Ruff to their level status. During these runs, they encountered two hidden bosses. Quinn, leading the party, effortlessly defeated them. They hadn't come across any great equipment that day, only a few uncommon materials. Snake Tongue and Hooded Vulture were impressed with this newbie's growing skill. They assured her that they would remember this favor. After selling the materials, they planned to share the proceeds with her. Exiting the dungeon, Quinn bid farewell to the party. Okay, that was as good a run as we're gonna get for today. I'll be going. Hooded Vulture cleaned her blade. Bloodhawk? Aren't you going to pick a class? At level 20, everyone has to choose a class and leave the beginner village. Gwyn waved his hand across the air to push off the idea. That's what they want you to think. But I have another way. A better way. You guys decide what you're doing and I'll come find you when I'm looking. He motioned to a smudge of blood on Hooded Vulture's hill. You missed a spot. Snake Tongue kicked at the dirt. Bloodhawk, uh... Let's keep in touch, huh? Gwyn nodded without saying a word. The others hoped that was a yes. Diamond Ruff rushed forward. Goodbye, great god. Gwyn chuckled and waved goodbye without turning around. 
the four returned to the beginner village to obtain their class quests. Quinn brought Bloodhawk to Green Forest's dungeon, and then he turned around to put Jenny's account card in the terminal. He logged into the 10th server with her level 5 smoke shy. Glory couldn't open two games on one VR headset at the same time, but it also couldn't prevent a player from managing two accounts on separate computers. This was Quinn's strategy. As long as there were two or more players in a party, they could encounter a hidden boss. Quinn still needed a few materials from that midnight phantom cat. He casually moved Bloodhawk and Smokeshy in the same direction. The hidden boss didn't appear on his first attempt. He exited the dungeon, putting both characters into a critically ill status. In this state, their HP and MP would be nearly depleted, and all their attributes would decrease. It was still a faster method than going through the entire dungeon. Bloodhawk no longer gained experience from within the green forest. He rose, lit a cigarette, took a sip of water, strolled around, and when he returned, Bloodhawk and Smokeshy had fully recovered. Entering the dungeon again, the hidden boss remained elusive, prompting Quinn to choose to exit once more. Clearing the dungeon took 15 to 20 minutes each time. This method was exclusive to the beginner village. Beyond this stage, actual dungeons had limitations. Five times a day, three times a day, or even once a day, once a week. Each dungeon had its unique restrictions. During one of these ten-minute intervals, Quinn consulted a guide. He realized he had forgotten some basic beginner information. Running through the dungeon blindly and then consulting a guide wasn't a productive habit. After the brief break, he entered Green Forest again, but the hidden boss continued to elude him. Unfazed, Quinn exited once more to consult a guide. Four times, five times, Quinn seemed determined to spend the entire day on this endeavor. The fifth time, the hidden boss remained elusive. Finally, on the sixth attempt, the system announced the appearance of the Midnight Phantom Cat, Quinn sighed in relief, and commenced the fight. Theoretically, Smoke Shy once entered was rendered useless and left at the entrance. Quinn decided to bring her along to leech some experience. He maneuvered both characters, positioning Smokeshy strategically and having Bloodhawk eliminate monsters near her to allow for experience leeching. Switching between characters, he was incredibly busy. All the passers-by emerging from the restroom witnessed this spectacle and were dumbfounded. Clayton cleared his throat. Hey Quinn, why not just play on your own? Playing on two computers, isn't that a bit too crazy? Quinn lifted the VR headset, smiled, and gave a friendly but unenthused nod. Without another word or fake nicety, he returned to the game and continued playing. Once the Midnight Phantom Cat emerged, he paid little attention to anything else. The material Quinn needed would drop, but the amount was determined by luck. Quinn was fortunate and obtained four Midnight Cat fingernails, coupled with the two from the first clear, he now had six. Since he needed a total of eight, one more run would suffice. After defeating the Midnight Phantom Cat, Quinn gracefully exited the dungeon once again. He continued using the ten minute per round method. The first round yielded none, and the second was no difference. On the third round, luck eluded him again, but this time, a system message suddenly appeared. He opened it to find that the player Sunrunner wanted to be his friend. Uncertain, Quinn debated whether to accept it or not. Quinn scanned Bloodhawk's vicinity, but found no player with that name. Sunrunner? Who is that? Why is he trying to friend me? Considering he was a level 20 character standing outside Green Forest, he assumed the player might want a high-level friend to carry them. Deciding against it, Quinn clicked ignore. To his surprise, another friend request appeared. Ignoring it again, he received yet another. And the cycle repeated itself again and again. In these ten minutes, the player named Sunrunner was annoyingly persistent. He sent a total of eighteen friend requests to Bloodhawk. Quinn found himself moved by this player's determination 
As a result, he opened the message and clicked accept. Right after accepting the friend request, the other party messaged Quinn. Sunrunner skipped the trivial formalities. Hey, the name's Sunrunner, Righteous Warriors Guild. My main account is Cold Death's Hay. Quinn scoffed. Getting right to it, huh? Some display of self-confidence. Quinn kept it short. Hey. He recognized the Righteous Warriors Guild as one of the three great guilds. But, Cold Death's hand wasn't a player he knew much about, unlike Hugo Sands and his sword saint severed devil. Sunrunner assumed his prestigious in-game identity would impress Quinn. What are you doing today? While Sunrunner was fairly popular at the unprofessional guild level, he was still an unprofessional player, and not in the circles Quinn was accustomed to knowing. Not having had a team battle against the Righteous Warriors, he never needed to study the player's gameplay, let alone learn who their players were. Controlled by Quinn at the same time, Bloodhawk and Smokeshy were bound for the Green Forest. Cleary! Sunrunner didn't get the hint. Oh? Where? Which dungeon? Green Forest! Sunrunner rushed toward the forest. He wasn't far away. Being in the beginner village looked for Bloodhawk. He caught up to Bloodhawk and Smokeshy. He paused for five seconds, watched the paced out movement of the two avatars, and then guessed the only possibility he could think of. Carrying a friend? Quinn shrugged. Looks like it. Sunrunner extended his hand. The righteous warriors are missing a member for clearing Frost Forest. Are you interested in joining? He dropped the guild name like it would impress him. Quinn-eyed Sunrunner. I don't think I'm your man. This response left Sunrunner baffled. A day ago, when Bloodhawk's party secured two first clears in Spider Cave, it caused the Righteous Warriors Guild to lose face. But this lack of respect was a new limit. Initially frustrated. The guild members later discovered some things they found odd about Bloodhawk. A member of Bloodhawk's team had previously slandered him. Wolfclaw accused him of cheating during the hidden boss encounter when Bloodhawk soloed the Midnight Phantom Cat. The slanderous messages claimed that Bloodhawk planned to have the party do most of the damage, then refused to heal them mid-battle, causing the party's demise. So, he could kill the boss for himself and get the loot. Sunrunner narrowed his eyes. How did Bloodhawk, supposedly a shameless and despicable individual, end up forming a party with Wolfclaw? Sunrunner cleared his throat. I don't know the exact details of what transpired with you and your last team, but it's clear that the party, which secured two first clears in Spider Cave, weren't friends to start with. They're not even strangers. That wolf claw tried to throw you under the bus. We've heard about him before. It's tricks. Gwyn kept moving. Your points? Th the point is, it was evident that you stood as the leader and expert of this team. That shameless novice, who I can only assume was the real one responsible for causing the early party's demise, had stained your name out of resentment for not being able to pull off his scheme. I assume because no one trusted you enough to dungeon with you, somehow he talked you into joining his party. You should know that some guilds out here do their homework and know you're not the cheat Wolfclaw makes you out to be. So, who are you? Just a guy who likes to play. Another thing tickled my curiosity. Uh, your team that snatched two Spider Cave first clears had different player orders on both occasions. Wolfclaw was the first player as the party's leader. The second time, you took the position. Quid looked straight ahead. I wouldn't read into it that much if I were you. Sunrunner placed a hand on Quinn's arm. A party leader is a serious position, involving the authority to remove players and assign the player order. 
For them to willingly make you a leader, someone who they say shamelessly stole a boss, it raised the question, why? Quinn was cool and silent. Sunrunner scratched his cheek. What I think is all signs point to their reliance on you. Without that, securing a first kill would have been impossible. You have talent and hold the high likelihood of being a solo talent without guild affiliations. A talent from a guild wouldn't venture solo into a new server, and you also wouldn't be available 24 hours a day. Quinn tightened his lips. Me not being an affiliate leads you to send 18 consecutive friend requests? To be honest, we're currently gearing up to break the Frost Forest clear record, and we're in need of a peak-level expert like you. If we manage to set a new record, we're willing to forfeit the best equipment for you. How does that sound? Our guild is solely focused on achieving the record. Sunrunner didn't rush to recruit this player into their guild. Given the longevity of glory, everyone is aware of the famous guilds. Yet this guy seems indifferent. He's either a casual player from a renowned guild exploring the new server, or an unaffiliated expert from the WoW. If Bloodhawk belonged to the first category, there was little they could do. He wouldn't be easily recruited. If he fell into the second category and had no interest in guilt, they stood a chance. Evaluating Bloodhawk's strengths was crucial to determining if he was worth recruiting. The promise of equipment served as a gesture of goodwill and a bargaining chip. Quinn combed his hand through his hair. I don't need the equipment. That low-level loot is yours. I want something else. Sunrunner gave a smug look. Say the word. Quinn leaned against a tree. Uncommon materials. Sunrunner laughed. He saw Quinn wasn't smiling. Oh, you're serious. Uncommon materials it is. I'll say, very easy to please. Sunrunner understood that Bloodhawk wasn't naive and valued uncommon materials over low-level equipment. At this stage of the game, these materials held the most significant value being useful in the late stages. Quinn took a breath. 72 strong spider silk. Sunrunner was unfazed. No problem. Strong spider silk fell into the category of uncommon materials. They were available in beginner dungeons, even dropping from normal bosses. As a result, they were considered relatively inexpensive. Quinn held up a finger. One more thing. Sunrunner lifted his eyebrows. A white witch's mithril pendant. Sunrunner agreed with a smile. I can give that to you. The mithril pendant, similar to the saber Quinn hit off the skeleton warrior, held ornamental value without any practical use. It was the kind of accessory a fashion gamer might wear purely for its aesthetics. Quinn smirked. Also, white wolf's sharp fangs. I need eight. Sunrunner's smug smile dropped. You need strong spider silk, the mithril pendant, and now sharp fangs? Isn't this a bit too much? Quinn walked from the negotiations and continued for Green Forest. If you say so. White Wolf and White Witch were the hidden bosses in Frost Forest. The mithril pendant was ornamental, so Sunrunner let it pass. But... The White Wolf sharp fangs had significant value. Frost Forest differed from the beginner village's dungeons. Each person could enter four times at most, making it uncertain whether they would encounter a hidden boss within those attempts. There was a two-third chance that the hidden boss wouldn't be a White Wolf. Sunrunner stayed by his side. If you only wanted eight White Wolf sharp fangs, I wouldn't hesitate. The rest is a bit too greedy, reminiscent of a shameless novice who sacrificed his party for a hit ball. Gwyn had a measured pace. Tell you what, then I don't need the mithril pendant. Sunrunner found himself unsure whether to laugh or let Bloodhawk walk away. We all understand that we don't care about the mithril pendant, but as for the strong spider silk and white wolf sharp fangs, Gwyn grew impatient. 
You're the one tracking me down, sending me friend requests 18 times. You tell me how much is pity. Pick one of the two, Quinn sniffed. This is a hard choice. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Then the white wolf sharp fangs. Sunrunner clacked. Okay, good choice. Quinn grinned. Some strong spider silk as a small gesture of goodwill. Sunrunner was speechless. Quinn tallied the count in his head. How about 40? Sunrunner stared with a blank expression. Quinn wrinkled his nose. 30? Uh, 25 then. 25 is fine. You can do 25. Sunrunner remained silent for a long time. He struggled to find suitable words. Sunrunner's heart suddenly softened. This guy had already started reducing the price one by one. For the Grand Righteous Warriors Guild to haggle over some strong spider silk. Shameful. Sunrunner rubbed the back of his neck. Fine, we'll settle it at 25. You got yourself a mercenary, Quinn replied. Sunrunner let out a sigh of relief. Quinn's lips curled. Then you should give me a few more mithril pendants. I mean, you said you didn't care about them. Sunrunner almost stumbled backward. What is this? Mithril pendants aren't worth anything, yet he still needs to haggle for them? Sunrunner couldn't understand. What do you need these items for? You never know what others will find valuable. One man's trash is another man's bargaining chip. Sunrunner knew Quinn was referring to cosmetic-driven players who liked these kinds of ornaments. Did this guy really want these? If he wanted one, then fine. But wanting so many at once. Sunrunner was deeply irritated by Bloodhawk. How many do you need? Quinn mulled over. If you don't care, all the ones you got. Sunrunner lied. We don't have that many. Only two. The pendants didn't have much value, but they were still worth something as uncommon ornament. Sunrunner was getting angry. That's settled. Quinn was satisfied. If a hidden boss comes, how do we split it? Everyone rolls for it, he replied. Quinn scowled, not giving a response. Sunrunner and the others were all fret. If this lone outsider rolled, their chances were four to one giving them a significant advantage to split the loot they wanted amongst themselves. He clearly understood the game they were playing against him. Sunrunner clenched his fist. I can see this doesn't work for you. After killing the hidden boss, we probably won't be able to beat the time wreck, so we don't want to be busy for nothing. You can pick from the items dropped by the hidden boss first. How about it? Quinn held out his hand. Okay. And it's settled. Sunrunner shook his hand. Then, Bloodhawk, when do you want to take the dungeon? My guild is waiting at Frost Forest. Quinn looked at the forest in front of him. Just chill a minute for me to crank out this dungeon. Sunrunner nodded and glanced at Quinn in his friend list. You should choose your class before you do that. Should I stop smoking and start jogging too? I know what I'm doing. I'll go like this. Sunrunner was startled. This. Quinn brushed him off. Chill, dude. I need to hurry up and finish this dungeon. Sunrunner left without another word. He reflected on the conversation and contemplated the things to come. He sensed that something wasn't right. What was I thinking? My initial purpose was to dungeon with this guy to build a friendship, but this constant haggling over rewards changed the situation entirely. It gives me the impression that I'm recruiting him for the guild. And not just one run. Had the esteemed Righteous Warriors Guild stooped so low as to hire mercenaries for their tasks? Sunrunner regretted the extensive negotiations for rewards. He felt as though he had given them away for nothing. Then a sudden realization struck him as he considered the conditions for these items, breaking a clear record. Sunrunner stared blankly, missing a person, breaking a record. These were excuses. The Righteous Warriors Guild had brought 40 experts to the new server. Performing a full party was well within our capability. The absence of a person was just a pretext to extend the invitation. 
As for breaking a record, it served as a means to unite everyone under a common goal. Sunrunner didn't really believe that inviting a new person could lead them to break a record. Shortly after midnight, the dungeon record had already been shattered. Sunrunner had led a party of Righteous Warriors Guild's strongest experts in the Frost Forest three times, maintaining a steady gap between their record and Shallow Grave's record. If this newcomer could genuinely help them set a new record, wouldn't his strength surpass that of their guild's elites? Sunrunner acknowledged Bloodhawk as a talent, but didn't think of him as a stronger talent than their guild's players. I negotiated over the clearing rewards. Was it truly worth it? Bloodhawk was only level 20 and hadn't changed classes yet. Could someone at his level break a new clearing record? Sunrunner arrived at the entrance to the Frost Forest. Brazen Fool, a member of the Righteous Warriors, approached. Sunrunner, have you finished talking to him? Sunrunner addressed the party. I've invited him. He'll be here pretty soon. But who's going to give up their position? Hoodoo Demon dusted himself off. I'll rest for a bit, having slept in 19 hours. Hoodoo Demon left the party. The remaining members positioned themselves outside the dungeon entrance, eagerly awaiting Bloodhawk's arrival. Sunrunner still harbored hesitation. Is this a good idea? I guess we'll find out. Quinn rolled out of the range of the Midnight Phantom Cat's pounce. He popped up and flung the Thousand Chance Umbrella Battle Lance into the ribcage of the hidden boss and drained the beast's life to less than half. The boss went blood red quicker than expected, but Quinn knew how to avoid attacks and land hits with precision. Quinn held his weapon high. Keep up the move cadence. He swiftly dispatched the Midnight Phantom Cat and gathered the cat's loot he was seeking to earn. Having achieved his goal, he felt a sense of satisfaction. Quinn acquired four Midnight Cat Claws. Assisting the Righteous Warriors Guild in breaking the clear record, he anticipated they wouldn't hesitate to exchange the items he negotiated for. Quinn exited the dungeon. He logged out of the game for Smokeshy and returned to the beginner village. He utilized 1,255 skill points to acquire new skills. Players had 1,250 skill points when reaching level 20. But Bloodhawk, having obtained a skill book, had a slight advantage. Mastering the new skills, he made his official entry into Glory's mainland. The area surrounding Frost Forest teemed with players. In Frost Forest, the entire expanse served as a dungeon accessible from any direction. Quinn messaged the Righteous Warriors. Which side are you guys on? I've reached the outskirts of Frost Forest. The surroundings buzzed with activity as the marketplace expanded beyond the beginner village. The areas outside Frost Forest became the primary market, with numerous players setting up shop. After quickly scanning a few stalls and finding nothing, Sunrunner promptly responded to Quinn's message, providing their coordinates. Quinn hurried to the location. Sunrunner's team noticed the name, Bloodhawk, and they gasped in surprise. The first expert who piqued their interest on the 10th server was remarkably distinctive, sporting a set of mismatched equipment in various styles. What on earth was this? The force stared in bewilderment as they identified Bloodhawk's equipment. On Bloodhawk's person were five different types of armor, cloth, leather, light, heavy, and plate armor. This style was common in the beginner village, but appeared extremely unusual in Glory's mainland. Those who ventured beyond the beginner village were level 20 and had already changed class. After this transition, each class had its preferred type of equipment. Ordinarily, Players usually selected equipment aligned with their class's proficiency, occasionally incorporating a few different types to build something specific that was slightly off the typical progression path. Players like Bloodhawk, adorned with equipment from all five types, were unique and rarely competitive. The force sat there, bewildered. Bloodhawk came up beside them. Sup, 
everyone. Gunrunner motioned to the other three members of his party. Hi, I'll introduce ourselves. Brazen Fool, Fire Blossom, and Loud Danger are all elite experts from Righteous Warriors Guild. Quinn's character stopped moving. Chill for a bit. I won't take forever. Seizing the moment before Bloodheart joined the party, they began voicing ridicule. Fire Blossom was first. You didn't find the wrong person, right? Sunrunner shook his head. Nonsense. Loud Danger squinted at Bloodheart. He hasn't class changed yet. Sunrunner bit his cheek. He said he would soon. Fire Blossom expressed doubt. You sure he's going to help us break the record? Sunrunner stopped the others. If we can't, then we can't. The main purpose is to see his background. Loud Danger rubbed his hands together. I know his background. He ridiculed him. Look at his mildly armor. He's here to make a fool of himself, right? Sunrunner jumped at defending Bloodhawk's unconventional gear. Everyone, don't judge people by their appearances. This player hasn't changed classes yet, so wearing equipment like this is still normal. Despite his quick defense, Sunrunner couldn't exactly nail down why Bloodhawk mixed and matched his equipment. Throughout his years in Glory's mainland, he had never seen anyone dressing so freely. Brazen Fool suddenly chimed in. Is this purposeful? Does he want to play as an unspecialized character? Brazen Fool was a player when unspecialized characters were popular. It was a trend that had long passed the current player base. Fire Blossom recalled that era too. Unspecialized player? That's a thing in the past. Wasn't that because level 50 awakening quests hadn't been introduced? Preventing them from continuing to level up? Sunrunner remembered reading about this on a game's online forum. During the opening of Glory's third server, the level cap increased for the first time from level 50 to 55. To progress beyond level 50, characters had to complete a class awakening quest. Unspecialized characters lacked an awakening quest, keeping their level cap at 50. While five levels might seem to be a minor difference in terms of equipment and skills, this was only the beginning. As the level cap increased, the gap between unspecialized characters and specialized classes continued to widen. It was widely understood that remaining as an unspecialized character held no meaning. Fire Blossom frowned. Could it be that he wants to play until level 50 before changing classes? Loud Danger was unconvinced. Wouldn't he lack attribute points playing like that? Fire Blossom rested on a rock. Who knows? Are there still people who care about this issue? Sunrunner knew the old way well as he spent more time than he cared to admit on the forums where playstyle debate raged endlessly between users. Each class had different attribute growth and the contrast in attributes between level 50 Blademaster and a level 50 Elementalist without equipment was pretty significant. Unspecialized characters naturally experience distinct attribute growth from other classes. A thoughtful silence followed. They were experts, yet they had never paid attention to this matter. They had never needed to. Who wouldn't change classes at level 20? Such individuals were assumed to be doomed to uncompetitive play. Fire Blossom proposed, approaching Bloodhawk. Why are we guessing? Let's just directly ask him. Bloodhawk, if you're not going to change classes... Then are you planning to play as an unspecialized character? No response. Fire Blossom called out. Are you there, Bloodhawk? Sunrunner stepped forward. He's AFK. Fire Blossom growled. You can't AFK from VR. Sunrunner rolled his eye. You know what I mean. AFH, away from headset. Happy? Loud Danger curiously circled around Bloodhawk two times. If he's an unspecialized character, is he carrying weapons from every class? Bloodhawk's hands were empty, not holding a weapon. This was because the weapon, Thousand Chance Umbrella, had already been taken by Quinn and placed into the equipment editor. The weapon no longer displayed its original 
appearance. Instead, it showed a blueprint automatically extracted by the editor. The Thousand Chance Umbrella was highly intricate, revealing several pages of the design on screen. Gwyn was delicately extracting the Midnight Phantom fingernails and meticulously aligning them with the pointed ends of the umbrella ribs. On the Thousand Chance Umbrella blueprint, Quinn's face wasn't showing the bored out of his mind expression he typically wore. His eyes remained unblinking and his expression reflected intense concentration. With a steady hand, he carefully inserted the midnight cat fingernails one by one. After flawlessly placing eight of them, Quinn released a small sigh of relief. He shook his right hand and selected the blueprint featuring an inverted umbrella. Although the runner's model was intricate, Quinn set it aside next to the dark opal. Clicking on the copy option, a progress bar appeared as the dark opals continuously rotated, undergoing the polishing process. The progress bar transformed into the exact shape of the Thousand Chance Umbrella's runner. Quinn meticulously inspected it before finally releasing a sigh of relief. Gazing at the blueprint in the editor, he lit a cigarette and stared into the distance, his mind wandering. The primary advantage of self-made equipment lay in researching blueprints and the required materials in the editor. The research for the Thousand Chance Umbrella was mostly complete, and he had a basic understanding of how to handle the remaining incomplete parts. Closing the editor, Quinn returned to the game. He opened Bloodhawk's inventory and examined the changes in the Thousand Chance Umbrella's attributes. With a movement, Bloodhawk shook the umbrella in his hands and it seamlessly transformed into a battle lance shape. The lance tip and the eight midnight cat fingernails served as effective stabbing and hooking tools. A cool glint reflected off the tip, showcasing its exceptional sharpness. Reviewing the Thousand Chance Umbrella's updated attributes, the changes were impressive. While the magic attack hadn't increased significantly compared to the original Umbrella, the physical attack had risen by an impressive amount. Bloodhawk's sudden transformation of his weapon startled Sunrunner and the others. Despite their expertise, none could recognize the battle line. Sunrunner approached him and extended a party invitation. Bloodhawk, you good? Gwyn joined the party. I was born good. Sunrunner sent him a guild invitation. Why don't you join our guild first? This way, the dungeon clear record will be under our guild's name. Guilds could be established after players left the beginner village at level 20. Righteous Warriors Guild had promptly set up and prepared it right after departing from the beginner village. Only if a party with five members from the same guild broke a record would the achievement be credited to their guild. Gwyn accepted and became a Righteous Warriors Guild member. Understood. Fire Blossom placed her hand on her hilt. Then let's start. Gwyn paused, examining everyone's equipment to determine their class. Hold on. Fire Blossom groaned loudly. Gwyn ignored her and studied each of them closely. Sunrunner, a swordsman class blade master, wielded a level 20 flaming sun, a light elemental sword. Brazen Fool, a priest class cleric, carried a level 20 saint's cross. Fire Blossom, a priest class knight, brandished a level 20 guardian of justice battle axe. Loud Danger, a mage class elementalist, held a level 20 copper staff. The equipment suited their respective classes. Within just a day of the new server's opening, their gear had reached such a level. This wasn't luck, but rather a demonstration of their guild's influence. Fire Blossom crossed her arms and tapped on her gauntlet impatiently. Is there something else? Gwyn casually looked at his fingernails. If we want to break the record, then I suggest that we change up the classes a bit. Sunrunner was distracted. Change? Gwyn was blunt. We don't need the cleric. Brazen Fool, the cleric, hadn't said anything when Fire Blossom shook a fist. Don't need a cleric with a joke. Quinn held his hands up in peace. Drop the cleric and add a high DPS class. Sunrunner expressed some patience. 
isn't your proposal a bit unreasonable? Quinn has his reason. Listen, noob, the pressure will be a bit high, but everyone here is an expert. If you concentrate on your positioning and dodging, there's no need for heals. Loud Danger interjected. We never needed heals! The heals are for the main tank! Quinn nodded in agreement. Duh! So what I'm saying is the MT isn't needed. The knight has low DPS too, so we should all change him for more damage. Fire Blossom wanted to come to Brazen Fool's defense, but she didn't anticipate being kicked off as well. No MT against small monsters, maybe. But what about the boss? Who's going to control the aggro? You? Quinn smirked. Slow on the uptake, aren't you? Fire Blossom boiled in anger. Are you serious? You're going to control the aggro? Gwyn stood strong. I'll control aggro like you've never seen, babe. The entire team was left speechless. Now that Quinn was in their party and guild, the four couldn't privately communicate. Sunrunner furrowed his eyebrows. So you're saying that all five part members should have high DPS? Gwyn clapped his hands slowly. Exactly. This is the fastest clearing party. Fire Blossom spat. Did you do this in the beginner village? Quinn grinned from ear to ear. It doesn't matter. In the dungeon, an all-DPS team is obviously the fastest. Sunrunner clenched his fist. That's true, but the problem is an all-DPS team can't last the dungeon. Quinn was calm. It's the way. Let me lead. Sunrunner felt as if he had been shot by a gun. After kicking two people, this guy also wanted the leader position. Fire Blossom scoffed. Fine, I get to laugh when you all wait. Brazen fool, leave the party and call for others. After speaking, Fire Blossom left the party, but Brazen fool was still hesitant. Loud Danger rushed up to Fire Blossom, who was still standing. Hey, hey, you guys are leaving the party so that you won't lose out when we die, right? Fire Blossom scorned Loud Danger. What a loser. The fight hasn't even started. Brazen fool, hurry up and leave. Brazen fool proved to be less impulsive than Fire Blossom. He remained at the party without making any hasty moves. He private messaged Sunrunner. What should I do? Sunrunner left it up to him. What do you think? Brazen fool thought for a second. I'm curious. I do hate being kicked out, so I can't witness it myself. Sunrunner commented. Alt meta is always going to feel weird. I mean, it rarely works. Brazen fool reasoned. Maybe it's because he hasn't changed classes that he's bold enough not to bring a cleric. If it's urgent, he can still heal. Sunrunner typed. Yeah, I don't think he's a troll and just here to waste everyone's time. Let's give it a shot. Brazen Fool accepted. All right, I'm leaving the party. Fire Blossom messaged this in the guild's chat. Vengeance coming head over. Most of the guild has reached the dungeon entry limit. Any players able to run Frost Forest? The more damage, the better. Hurry up and help us beat the clear record. How come? Someone finally responded. Fire Blossom noted that it was Grace of Night. Grace, you come. Vengeance Coming and Grace of Night arrived, joining Sunrunner's party. Vengeance Coming, being an original member, was familiar with the situation. Grace of Night seemed somewhat lost. The party lacked a main tank and a healer, and there was an unfamiliar person. Fire Blossom sarcastically called out the Bloodhawk. Oh, great God, are these two suitable? Gwyn walked around the avatars, carefully scrutinizing them. They'll do, assuming they have skill and, more importantly, know how to listen to what I tell them when I tell it to them. This beautiful mouth doesn't speak just for exercise. Vengeance Coming was an elementalist, wielding a level 20 vivid staff. Both level 20 staffs, vivid staff and the copper staff, had similar attributes with the key difference lying in their additional property. One added one level to flame explosion, while the other added one level to frostball. 
These staffs revealed the different elemental paths the elementalist had chosen. Grace of Nut, on the other hand, was a witch, a choice among the magic classes known as the scientists among mages. They utilized many magic items in battle and possessed some close combat strength. Grace of Night wielded a level 20 crystal wand. Gwyn couldn't discern her skill path from her weapon. What path, Grace? Dark style path? She responded. Quinn nodded. Weird weapon choice, but I'll save that talk if it's necessary. Tell me you added points to Dol Shururu. Dol Shururu was a witch skill that taunted monsters. Grace Knight indicated that the skill automatically leveled up when possible. Auto level. Wynn snapped his fingers. That's one thing going for you. Fire Blossom was in a ridiculing mood. Is the god satisfied? Gwyn weak. Yep, it's good. By the way, I prefer God of all things for all eternity. Let's make this happen. Grace of Night still hadn't grasped the full situation. She heard Sunrunner. Everyone, listen. For this dungeon, Bloodhawk leads. Grace of Night expressed extreme surprise. Yours leading? Gwyn nodded and tipped an imaginary hat. Yep, that a problem? Grace of Night couldn't comprehend it. Why? Gwyn walked towards the dungeon. I'm about to carry. You should be thanking me instead of questioning me. Sunrunner tried to catch up to Quinn. Hey, hey. But Quinn had entered the dungeon. Sunrunner felt a pang of irritation. They needed to discuss their plan. Once inside, the timer would start, and there would be very little time to spare. Fire Blossom laughed out loud and shouted sarcastically. Our god has already entered. What are you all waiting for? Hurry up and go tremble at his might, O oh mortals. Sunrunner cursed, entering the dungeon. When I come, I'll be looking for you. Frost Forest was inhabited by green-skinned, blue-nosed goblins, featuring long-range, melee, and magic types. They were not as predictable as the monsters in the beginner village, and until they attacked, it was impossible to discern their type. Sunrunner and the others entered the dungeon. The timer officially started. No one lingered near the entrance. They rushed forward, hearing Queen's leadership. Having a witch will make things easier for you, Bunch. We'll do a one-way rush. Sunrunner jumped in surprise. How do we do one-way rush? Queen was astonished by Sunrunner. What's not to understand about one-way rush? Get a guidebook, Sonny. One wave rush means we pull all monsters and eliminate them in a single turn. Sunrunner gritted his teeth. I know what it is, but this method was typically used when the party level is much higher than the dungeons. It requires a powerful main tank. Parties at the same level as the dungeon don't attempt a one wave rush. Gwyn Grick. You're no longer a party at the same level. You got me. He popped his eyebrows up. Grace of Night ran with the others. I just don't get how you're going to execute one way rush. Quinn never stopped running on the offense. Jeez, am I working with a bunch of playtesters? So many questions. I'll pull the monsters. Then you doll Shururu to group up the monsters. Raging Flames and Blizzard to attack. Yada, yada, yada. Then... Sunrunner's cheeks flushed red. I know with the basic course of action, but the crucial point rests on us pulling the monster. If you couldn't bring back a wave of monsters alive, it'd be a problem. Gwyn downplayed the crucial phrase, I'll pull the monsters, and glossed over the most pivotal point. The other three shared the same thoughts as they looked at Sunrunner, accepting their fate with a waterfall of cold sweat washing over their face. Gwyn typed out a smile emoji. I'm going in. You can follow or stand out here and twiddle your thumbs. Bloodhawk darted out. Sunrunner and the others watched his back, feeling as if he would never return. Loud danger, Mark. I have to say, he's quite heroic. I admire him. A shout came from in front of them. Everyone, Real. keep up. The four dreaded the outcome when catching up with Quit. They observed that Bloodhawk had already approached two goblins. One started throwing rocks, while the other began casting ice arrows. Fire Blossom sighed. Tis tis, what a tragedy. We start and there are already two long-ranged ones. The rocks and ice arrows flew, 
but Bloodhawk seemed to shake twice, and the projectiles missed. Sunrunner watched. Damn, could it be Z-Shake? Z-Shake was a swift directional movement a quick left and right shift while continuously moving forward. When executed rapidly, the distance covered became minimal. If the character completed this movement in the blink of an eye, it appeared as though they hadn't moved at all, just a mere shake. Vengeance coming blinked twice. Using the Z-shake requires a player of high skill. Relying on that movement to dodge attacks takes precision and control. Loud Danger marveled at this refined play. Bloodhawk swiftly approached two goblins and struck them with his palm. A gust of wind followed, sending the two goblins flying. Fire Blossom grunted. That's a level 15 battle mage skill. Falling flower palm. The blow away effect can push those lightweight goblins several meters into the distance with a single palm strike. Bloodhawk didn't pause. His figure darted to another side where two more goblins awaited. As soon as a player entered their aggro ray, the goblins brandished their big stick, ready to engage in combat. Bloodhawk didn't approach the two goblins and instead continued past them. Ahead, the two goblins previously blown away were on their feet. One was preparing to throw a rock while the other was casting ice arrows. When Bloodhawk was two meters away, he swung his battle lance. The rock wasn't thrown and the ice arrow was interrupted. Bloodhawk swept with his lance, and the two monsters fell. Stepping over them, he continued running forward. The next targets were two goblins to his left. One held a stick, and the other was casting an ice arrow. As the ice arrow was released, Bloodhawk jumped, conveniently flying over the goblin with the big stick. In midair, he readied his lance and smashed the goblin ice arrow. After landing, he whirled around and moved behind this goblin. One of the goblins turned to face, while the other lifted its big stick and gave chase. Bloodhawk raised his hand and used Balling Flower Palm. The two monsters were blown back and, with perfect accuracy, collided with the two ranged goblins. The two unfortunate goblins tumbled. In every court, whether they were standing guard or patrol, every goblin became alert due to Bloodhawk. Either through pulling or blowing them away, the melee goblins fervently brandished their big sticks, shrieking as they chased Bloodhawk. The ranged goblins were occupied using their skill. Sunrunner chased behind, hesitating. No one could deny Bloodhawk's skill. It seemed like a high-level player had come to roll through the dungeon, creating chaos as if birds were flying about and dogs were jumping around. Sunrunner lost sight of Bloodhawk. In front of them, a large mass of shrieking goblins relentlessly pursued whatever was in their path. As for Bloodhawk's whereabouts, Sunrunner could only infer that he was alive for two reasons. First, their party list showed Bloodhawk's health was still over half reasonably healthy. Second, they could occasionally spot Bloodhawk jumping. In a flash, he landed, his figure momentarily obscured by the goblins again. Vengeance Cummings' voice slightly trembled. There, there's already 20 of them. Achieving this at level 20 is impressive. Grace of Night was ready to use Dull Shuduru. Still not killing them? Loud Danger observed the massive goblins that had been pulled. I just want to know how he's going to come back to us. Grace of Night was concerned. He doesn't want me to just throw out the Dull Shuduru like this, right? It won't work. With both ranged and melee goblins, it was essentially two separate armies. One group wielded big sticks and pursued their target, while the other maintained a distance and only closed in if Bloodhawk went out of range. Sunrunner was at a loss. What's he up to? Are you asking me? I don't know either. Loud Danger bounced up and down to observe the situation behind the mass of monsters. Despite the amusing sight, no one liked. Sunrunner couldn't see. What's the situation, Loud Danger? The crowd's been gathered quite beautifully. Sunrunner felt the urge to bounce up and down, but as one of the five great experts of Righteous Warriors Guild and the guild leader in the tenth server, he needed to maintain a bit of dignity. How does he do it? Loud Danger continued bouncing. How would I know? In any case, they're coming in group by group. A series of whacks echoed. 
Loud danger turned to his guilt. Falling flower! Ah, that palm was so crisp! The other three also noticed the goblins in front of them in a state of confusion. Dozens of goblins had been blown away by the falling flower palm. Those with big sticks collided with the ranged goblins in the rear, resulting in a large number of them falling. The view in front of the four players opened up. Bloodhawk, carrying his lance in his right hand and his left palm forward, maintaining the falling flower palm pose. Goblins lay on the ground, scattered and disordered. Bloodhawk's powerful pose was indelibly imprinted on the four players' minds. After a brief pause, the disorder goblins had already climbed back up, ready to rush. Bloodhawk leaped. Loud Danger immediately ridiculed him. What is he doing? Is he planning on flying over? What? He's flying. He's actually flying. After Bloodhawk jumped, he executed a 180-degree turn. Shortly after, a gun sound echoed. Quinn abruptly flew back towards them. The others knew this move in an instant. It was a gunner mid-air movement skill. In the air, the player opened fire, using the gun's recoil to fly backward. The greater the recoil, the farther they would travel backward. The recoil seemed as if it came from a rifle or higher-grade gun. Flying backward, Bloodhawk soared over the heads of the monsters. Landing, he swiftly ran behind the four players. The goblins crazily turned and rushed at the players like a high tide. The four warriors started sweating. Bloodhawk flew past them. What are you waiting for? Major Tech, get ready to use Dolce. They looked forward with great alarm. A horde of goblins thirsted for blood. The ranged monsters unleashed their attacks without moving, while the melee goblins raged toward them. As planned, Quinn directed a wave of goblins to charge Sunrunner, Grace of Night, Vengeance Coming, and Loud Danger. Sunrunner rushed at the wall of goblins. Quickly, attack! The most challenging part of one wave rush was luring the monsters. To their surprise, the one who accomplished it was a motley garbed level 20 who hadn't even changed classes. Eradicating the entire mass of monsters posed another challenge. Loud Danger and Vengeance Coming acted immediately. Loud Danger unleashed Raging Flakes while Vengeance Coming cast Blizzard. Two spells from each mage weren't sufficient to wipe them out. Both spells were powerful, but they belonged to different paths with distinct effects. Fire Magic excelled in burst power. As Raging Flames erupted, a wave of flames surged beneath the goblins' feet, reaching as high as three meters. The attacked goblins were thrust into the air, screaming as the raging flames surged on. The pillars of red rage fire burned goblin flesh as they leaped and scattered in less than a second. As they disappeared, the goblins plummeted to the ground. Vengeance Cummings' blizzard hammered down. Hailstones the size of a baseball relentlessly descended on the goblins, crushing skulls and bones on impact. Raging flames ended abruptly. Blizzard continued to rain down for four seconds. In terms of total damage, Blizzard surpassed Raging Flame, but the latter was more ferocious in burst damage. These were the distinctions between the ice and fire paths. Gwyn stayed vigilant. You got a brain, right? Dol Shururu! Grace of Night cast Dol Shururu in the center of the Goblin Mon. Dol Shururu functioned as a ragdoll taunting monsters in a two-meter radius and forcing them to aggro onto it. There were restrictions. Dol Shururu's level couldn't be lower than that of the monsters, and it had no effect on elites, bosses, and emperors unless accompanied by the passive skill Dol Shururu Upgrade. Grace of Night hadn't reached the level required for Dol Shururu Upgrade, but her basic Dol Shururu was auto level eliminating any issues. As she cast it, the goblins rushed towards the summit doll shooter. Grace of Night's spell expanded. The taunt won't last long. Doll shooter effect lasted 20 seconds. The small rag doll didn't have much HP. Monsters that were taunted attacked with fury. With such a large mob of goblins, doll shooter would be destroyed in the blink of an eye. 
Loud Danger's raging blaze and Vengeance Cummings' blizzard had cooled down. One needed six seconds, the other needed eight seconds. The two mages frantically threw out their single target spells to attack. Faced with this giant mob of goblins, their spells weren't as effective to hinder the monster. Bloodhawk rushed forward. Take the battle to them, face to face. With dull shooter effect, the goblins were more bunched up and roused into a crazed mob. The melee goblins surrounded Dol Shururu, and the ranged goblins had begun attacking. Dol Shururu lasted only a second before it was destroyed. At the time, Bloodhawk rushed up close to the goblin horde. His battle lance was gone, replaced by Tumbus. He grabbed a goblin and executed a backthrust. Backthrust's shockwave rippled out, and the surrounding goblins fell down in a condensed pile. Quinn gripped his Tumbus. Blade Master, Falling Light Blade, don't hesitate. Use it when they get up and keep it coming. Sunrunner, who hadn't received any instructions until now, quickly responded. He lifted his sword, flaming sun, and advanced at great speed. The furious goblins were chaotically staggering to their feet. Sunrunner leaped into the air and targeted the middle of the mob. His two hands launched his sword. A tail of blazing fire drilled the sword as it rapidly crashed down. For Falling Light Blade, the higher the user jumped, the higher the damage, and the larger the radius of the shockwave. Sunrunner deserved to be called one of the five great experts of the Righteous Warrior Guild. After Quinn yelled out the command, Sunrunner immediately leaped above the goblin mob, preparing his fire skill. Falling Light Blade was executed perfectly. After the shockwave spread, the goblins were hit with a swell of flames and collapsed again. The successive AOE, area of effect, attacks weren't used for damage but to ensure the bunched up monsters stayed down without a chance to get up and attack. Back throw and falling light blade also had cooldown. These two skills alone wouldn't be enough for complete crowd control. Dol Shururu's cooldown of 30 seconds couldn't be counted on to be used twice in such a short time. Sunrunner Pond. What other AOE attacks does this guy still have? His minds recalled the skills that could be learned before changing classes and had effects similar to backthrow or falling light blade. He heard the next command. Shadow Cloak! Loud Dagger laughed. Just wait until we're on team! <laughs> in glory, players referred to being featured in the system announcement as on TV. The war party was invested in battle when Brazenful messaged. Thou art thee. Fire Blossom followed the battle with intensity. A horde of goblins are pushing forward through their one wave rush. Brazenful was also confused. One wave rush? Sunrunner eyed the chaos. How long do we need to wait? Normal main takes pulled by fighting the boss alone for a few seconds to accumulate enough aggro so that others wouldn't directly off-tank it when they attacked. Quinn circled the goblins. There's no need to wait. Once it's pulled, just go in like a drunk at an open bar, on a mission and with nothing to lose. The four players gasped. Once it's pulled in, go in. Bloodhawk advanced on the mob. Yeah, we have to do this fast. We're trying to beat the record and these monsters won't die on their own. I'm going in for the kill. Sunrunner was startled a bit, but he didn't dare complain. They had saved a lot of time clearing the small monsters, but even so, he still felt that they should steady the boss first. As a result, he didn't move and just watched as Bloodhawk stabbed towards the goblin patrol guard. Quinn performed consecutive skills without delay. Dragon two, Guy strike. Double stab. Normal uppercut. Normal stab. Guy strike. Quinn rolled his eyes as the others held back. If I do this alone, I'm writing a note on the leaderboard postgame that your rules were just party cheerleaders. Hearing this, Sunrunner woke up as if he had been sleeping, but was still at a loss. Starting from when Bloodhawk had began pulling, this goblin patrol guard had been tumbling in the air the whole time. Grace of Night couldn't help but count how many times Bloodhawk could combo. What an outstanding, endless juggle! Vengeance coming landed a basic strike. I can't wait to see when this goblin patrol boss is gonna drop. 
Loud Danger shook off his amazement, stopped admiring the attack, and began casting. Flipping over their magical items and taking out his sword, he rushed to the onslaught. Blades, ice, starshine, sword light. The irregular hits of the four arrived with a destructive effect. None of them blocked each other's lines of attack. Every one of them held a threat of wariness in their heart, afraid that their attacks would do too much damage and the goblin patrol guard would switch his big stick to target any one of them. Sunrise, vengeance coming, loud danger, and grace of night attacked moderately, allowing Bloodhawk to draw the goblin's aggression and focus on him. Bloodhawk struck, dodged, and countered. Everyone, spare no effort and attack! He wasn't a specialized main tank. Specialized MT, like a knight, after changing classes, gained many new aggro control skills and also had many aggro-related skills from before level 1. Bloodhawk could learn these skills. He hadn't brought these types of aggro control skills with him. They were attacking and attacking until they suddenly heard Bloodhawk say, Go all out! It won't OT! The only thing you should leave on the battlefield is your corpse. I'll say a few words at your funeral. Quinn smirked as he dominated the goblins surrounding him. Everyone began gnashing their teeth and madly attacked with all their might. They attacked in unison and with great skill, professionally controlling aggro. Swords swung, glided, stabbed. Glory didn't have assist tools for aggro calculation. Damage and healing were done after they cleared the dungeon. The four were all experts and all had their own set of ferocious battle methods. Before, everyone was holding back, afraid of OT. Now, in the depths of their hearts, it seemed as if they were hopeful for OT. If they didn't OT, then it would appear as if their damage was insignificant. The goblin patrol guard didn't even glance at the four of them. Its big stick only swung for Bloodhawk. Bloodhawk moved extremely quickly. Vengeance coming glanced back and forth from the goblins to Bloodhawk. Amazing. None of his shakes, slides, or rolls have any effect on his attacks. He's never not moving, running around the goblin and landing every hit. Thunrunner was also a melee class. The more he looked, the more he was fearful. With Bloodhawk's method, the goblin patrol guard responded extremely quickly and continuously turned around to chase him. No matter if he turned left or right, the boss was on Bloodhawk's heel. Quinn could only barely dodge the boss's attack in all his twists and turns and leaping flip kicks. This sort of battle method would be enough to make a player vomit from dizziness. Bloodhawk dropped a heavy sky strike. He followed this with a triple combo double stab, and before he landed, the goblin patrol guard collapsed. The four never came close to attracting a bit of the boss's attention. Stunrunner felt somewhat embarrassed to say that what he had done was battle the minions as Bloodhawk faced the boss one-on-one. -on -one. He had attacked the goblin patrol guard and spared no effort to attack, but it felt like his damage was no more than a nuisance. Like a buzzing fly at the goblin pointy feet, the boss never turned to acknowledge his existence. Grace of Night scratched her head. How did you pull it so steadily, Bloodhawk? With a specialized main tank like Fire Blossom, her damage would have caused the boss to off-take several times and risk all their lives. Wind cracked his neck. It's pretty easy. I just have a certain je ne sais quoi. Oh, and I have my strikes hit harder and more precise than yours. Bloodhawk had done more damage than that, and nothing more. Sunrunner stiffened. Vengeance coming was shocked. Grace of Night was speechless. Loud Danger was still reeling from the battle. He originally wasn't an MT. He was also a damage dealer. Without stopping to rest after the boss was defeated, Bloodhawk pulled the mob of Gop. The four followed after him and whispered. Vengeance coming breathed heavily. And his damage was easily greater than ours. Grace of Night gripped her weapon. And quite a bit, too. How else could the aggro be so stable? Sunrunner swung his blade at the goblin horde. To be able to bowl it off so steadily, his attack is definitely beyond level 20, it seems. Do any of you guys recognize that, Lance? Loud danger chuckled. 
<laughs> I don't. It looks strange, like a big clove of garlic. Vengeance coming joke. Your family's garlic looks like that? Loud dangerous scar. It was an exaggeration. Do you know what a hyperbole is? Vengeance coming gray. Get lost. Sunrunner pulled his sword from the goblin corpse. All of you shut up. He started pulling. Concentrate. In front of them, Bloodhawk began striking monster. The war party followed suit. They had already battled the first horde and weren't afraid of taking too much damage. But still, they were fully aware of the risk. If they made any mistakes with their skills timing, they might let a few goblins get away. The results would be disastrous. Pull monsters, gather monsters, kill monsters. Each player completed their roles perfectly. After two waves, they killed all of the monsters en route to the second boss. Facing the second boss, Sunrunner and the others attacked with all their skill and strength. As they caught up to Bloodhawk, the final boss attacked. The Frost Forest's greatest boss, the Goblin Emperor Frostbane, was a force to be reckoned with. Just from the name, players knew that this boss had a greater significance than the hidden bosses in the beginner villages. Thane's size was typical of a goblin, but his fierce grimace was more sinister. Absent was the whimsical blue nose common among regular goblins. The Frostane's skin boasted a striking sky-blue hue, clutching an ice blade in his right hand, almost as tall as his diminutive frame. Thane sent a frigid wind swirling. The range of his attacks surpassed what an average player could perceive, prompting the need for a new strategy. The boss possessed unique attack, often keeping the main tank under constant pressure. Guides for the Frost Forest strongly advised players to include two main tanks, easing the strain during encounters with the initial boss, the Goblin Patrol Guard. Quinn wasn't one to adhere to conventional strategies. Observing the arrival of his war party, he went on the offensive and charged. Last one to attack is a noob! Bloodhawk charged forward, battle lance raised. The party's exceptional skill level allowed for a direct approach. Substituting them with snake tongue, hooded vulture, and shark hide would mean lengthy explanations and additional supervision during the battle. Sunrunner and the righteous warriors proceeded without hesitation. Blood Arc took the lead, aiming to draw the frost thing. The boss displayed reaction speeds twice as fast as regular goblins, its short legs spinning like wheels as it closed in on Bloodhawk. In a second, Skystrike launched the Frostane into the air. Sunrunner silently observed, this wasn't an easy attack. Considering the Frostane's agility, hitting the target and pulling the boss required skill. A typical MT, like Fire Blossom, would struggle to land the first hit. Small combos were essential to establish aggro fully. In a normal party, the MT might endure significant hits before securing aggro, sometimes leading the healing cleric to accidentally draw the boss's aggro. Bloodhawk propelled the Frostane into the air, executing a series of mid-air skills to form a seamless combo. The Frostane was too formidable to be juggled for long. In mid-air, a sudden blue light flashed, and the boss vanished. The war party remained composed, aware of the Frostane's teleportation skill. As they sought to locate the boss, a distinct sound echo. Drawing their attention of Bloodhawk's battle lance repeatedly jabbing the Frostane's chest. The sight surprised Sunrunner, who glanced back to find Bloodhawk still at his original spot. Shadow Clone Technique. The other players recognized the skill, while not unprecedented. What astounded them was Bloodhawk's speed in his immediate pursuit of the Frostane. Loud Danger was somewhat horrified. The frost thing typically signaled its teleportation, akin to a mage's chanting. But where it teleported was supposed to be unpredictable. However, a player of Bloodhawk's experience could spot the spawn pattern, and he accurately identified the teleport location. The frost thing's teleportation had a cooldown. After a failed attempt, it once again fell victim to Bloodhawk's onslaught. The boss seemed visibly frustrated, yearning to strike and cast spells. But Bloodhawk outmaneuvered it. 
Sunrunner observed the others engrossed in the duel. Everyone, attack! Fighting the Frostbane had initially posed a perilous challenge, demanding precise aggro control between the boss and the lone MT to avoid over-aggression. Under Bloodhawk's method of flawless, potent attacks, the party had little to worry about. Even if the Frostbane's primary focus wasn't on them, they rarely hurt. The Frostbane vanished again, frustrating Sunrunner and loud danger. As soon as the skill cooldown expired, the boss would repeat the skill, today facing this formidable opponent. Bloodhawk employed the Shadow Clone technique to teleport with comparable speed. Win broke focus. It's almost that red blood. Make a mistake and I'll TK you myself. The warriors had long been vigilant about the red blood status, a critical condition. When the frost thing reached this phase, it would gain super armor, rendering its magic impervious to normal attacks and accelerating its spell casting. A teleport combined with an area of effect ice whirlwind posed a grave threat to a party. Sunrunner spotted a foreboding gleam in the Frostane's eyes. Hurry! Retreat! The sizable ice blade whirled, creating an intricate pattern. As the ice whirlwind was on the verge of unfolding, Sunrunner took the initiative to move the party away from the Frostane. The ice whirlwind scattered randomly like an unstable tornado. A rumble resonated. The ice whirlwind failed to materialize. Bloodhawk's skilled back throw flung the frost thing to the ground. This move had the unique ability to break super armor. Gwyn rolled to the right. Sunrun, the iron's hot, if you know what I mean. This is the perfect chance for Wave Wheel Slasher if anyone wants to take bets. Wave Wheel Slasher, a spell blade skill, could also break super armor. Super armor break skills could interrupt magic during the super armor state. The issue was that this was the Frost Thane, a boss notorious for aggro shifts to the healer. Sunrunner tried to comprehend it. Who would risk their entire team's fate on the damage of a super armor break skill? He wasn't uncertain of his capabilities. He chose the safer option due to the potentially catastrophic consequences of a mistake. Nonetheless, he was called out and had to act. Sunrunner scrunched his face. Yeah, I didn't learn it. Gwyn skillfully executed a dragon tooth. Hoth, you should learn it. Breaking super armor is pretty useful in times like, oh, I don't know, fighting bosses for a record-breaking run? But that's just me. Sunrunner was currently receiving a crash course in basic knowledge. Sunrunner was tinged with embarrassment. I know, I didn't have enough skill points, so I haven't learned it yet. Sunrunner returned to the attack. I want to use Wave Wheel Slasher on the Frostane to regain my dignity. But I just admitted I hadn't learned it. If I suddenly use it, how do I explain? The mere thought made his face flush. The menacing ice whirlwind should have been the greatest threat. But Bloodhawk's skills quelled all fear. The Frostane revealed no new tricks. The boss succumbed to the relentless assault. Equipment dropped, but Quinn was the only one paying attention. The others were fixed on the server announcement. Congratulations to Righteous Warrior Guilds player, Thunrunner, Loud Danger, Bloodhawk, Vengeance Coming, and Grace of Night for breaking the Frost Boar's clear record. Time, 20 minutes and 24 seconds. Ever since their first one-wave rush, the warriors knew that if they avoided mistakes, a new record was inevitable. The result didn't surprise them, but the substantial difference from the previous record did. The prior clear record, established by Shallow Grave Guild, stood at 26 minutes and 12 seconds. In a single attempt, they slashed this record by over 5 minutes. Usually, when a record was beaten, it was by less than a minute. Directly improving the time by 5 minutes was, truthfully, a bit unreasonable. Other players on the server were shocked. Nectar, Hooded Vulture, and Sharkeye, having changed classes at level 20, ventured into Frost Forest seeking a player to join their party. Battling through the dungeon, they hadn't even cleared halfway when they caught sight of the announcement. Diamond Ruff gasped. Look, it's God! God's on TV! Snake Tongue was sad. Yeah, you're right. 
A tinge of bitterness lingered in the Iron Beast's hearts. Righteous Warrior Guild was well aware that it belonged to Glory's three great guilds, and only such a top-tier guild could rival Bloodhawk's strength. The trio carried a burden of sorrow. Diamond Ruff couldn't help herself. Frost Forest, that's what we're doing now. Snake Tongue sighed. Yeah. Diamond Ruff shifted on her heels. Twenty minutes. We've been at it for twenty minutes ourselves. Where are we now? Snake Tongue mumbled. Halfway. The toxic influence of becoming acquainted with Bloodhawk was evident. Comparing their progress to Bloodhawk's achievements placed them in an entirely different realm, causing a serious problem of self-doubt. The new fifth member of the Iron Beast, a cleric named Last Chance Over, focused on healing. Did you guys rely on this guy to achieve those first clear records you got? Snake Tongue was taken aback. They had indeed been on TV before, and Diamond Ruff joined them for this reason. Recruiting strangers became even more challenging as they feared encountering someone like Diamond Ruff, who recognized Bloodhawk as their champion. Embarrassment loomed. After last chance over, joined the party. He hadn't expressed any amazement. A few normal greetings and communication during monster battles led Snake Tongue to assume he hadn't noticed their first clear team status. Last chance over spit. We've only completed half of the Frost Forest in twenty minutes. While this Bloodhawk broke the record. I'm starting to think that in the first clear you had, Bloodhawk was a mega hard fairy. Snake Tongue felt helpless. Right. It was because of him. Damn. Thought so. I've been with you guys for 20 minutes and I don't see any of you as experts. Hooded Vulture was in a sour mood. What's your point, Last Chance? Last Chance Over suddenly brightened up. Okay, okay, starting from now, follow my lead. Shark Hyde shook his head no. Why? I'm an expert from threatening death deal. Last Chance Over. Before, I wanted to see your strength, so I didn't say anything. Your directions are all over the place. I'll do it. The original leader, Snake Tongue, became irritable. Screw that. What kind of players do you think we are? And what type of person would call themselves an expert? Bloodhawk was so modest, he never called us expert. Snake Tongue wasn't intimidated by the fame of threatening death. Last Chance threw his arms up. Don't be like this. We need to hurry and clear this dungeon. I still have things to do. No one said a word to Last Chance Over. Last Chance Over clasped his hands together. I'll do it. I'll lead you through the dungeon. Just let me. I'm begging you. Snake Tongue conceded. Ah, you do it. Hooded Vulture used finger quotes. What kind of an expert is this? In the blink of an eye, Last Chance Over switched equipment, holding a cross in his hands. Okay, follow my lead from now on. The silvery light gleamed off of the crossbow, indicating it wasn't an ordinary Fido. Shark Hyde finally saw through it. Damn, this guy was faking it the entire time. While Last Chance Over led, he sent a message to his guild. We made a mistake. In that first clear party, only Bloodhawk is an expert. The rest are trash. A message responded to him. It's too late. Bloodhawk has already been taken in by the Righteous Warrior Guild. They beat the record by five minutes. Too scary. It must be because they added this guy. Last chance over sigh. Figures. I can't believe I wasted a run through the dungeon with these noobs. His guild type. What are you doing? Last Chance Over replied, I'm carrying these bots through this dungeon. After the clear record had been broken, the previous holders, Shallow Grave, were in an uproar. Dead Ringer, Shallow Grave's guild leader, and the expert who led the previous record setting party through his weapon in rage. Prevent him! No way! That's insane! Sunrunner doesn't have that kind of strength! Corpse Forgotten pointed to the list of names. It's that Bloodhawk. He cleared those other dungeons. 
he must have brought a lot to the guild. Dead Ritter said, I'll get to the bottom of these. As elite experts of the three great guilds, they were acquainted with each other in the heavenly domain and added each other as friends. Dead Ringer messaged Sunrunner. Hey, I've seen you going to Bane Bruce to join your guild. <laughs> Sunrunner laughed. Oh, 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 you mad? Don't worry. You can break our record when you're level 25, maybe. When Sunrunner exited the dungeon, Brazen Fool and Fire Blossom lingered outside. As the original party members, they understood the party's strengths. They knew Bloodhawk was the reason they shattered the clear record by five minutes. Fire Blossom had doubted Bloodhawk. Now she felt like she owed him an apology. She took a deep breath. You really are a god. I bow down, I bow down. Uh, sorry about before. Brazen Fool approached Loud Danger. How was the dungeon clear? Loud Danger made an exaggerated expression. Oh, oh, Braz, you wouldn't believe what we saw in there. Vengeance coming and Grace of Night raised their eyebrows in agreement. Quinn grabbed an apple from his satchel. He tossed it in the air and caught it on the tip of his lance. Like I promised, sunny side up. The clear record is broken. Your guild name is in lights, and you can claim the credit, but we'll both know, won't we? Gwyn winked and bit the apple. Sunrunner wriggled his nose and nodded subtly. Right, right, you held up your end. Gwyn cleared his throat and rubbed his fingers together. The items, bro, I'm here for the items. Sunrunner perked up. What items? Oh, I almost forgot. Brass, the items? Sunrunner hadn't carried the items. Confirming the record-breaking success, he sent Brazen Fool to retrieve them. Brazen Fool requested a trade with Bloodhawk. Quinn accepted, and the items were placed into the trade box. There were 72 strong spider silk, two mithril pendants, and eight white wolf shark fangs. Quinn didn't understand. This was his initial proposal, not the deal he had haggled for. There's gotta be some mistakes, Sunshine. Are you going senile or something? Sunrunner shrugged. Leading the clear wreck by five minutes saved a lot of effort. Quinn grinned. Didn't think I was worth it at first, did you? I guess you live, you learn. Sunrunner forced a laugh. <laughs> You're welcome. Bloodhawk, look, did you? And you left. Great. After accepting the items, Quinn left the guild right in front of the team. Sunrunner was about to ask him to join their guild permanently. He gave him more items for two reasons. One was to reward him for clearing the dungeon. The other was because he recognized that he was a great expert and deserved to be bribed. Sunrunner fiddled with his button. I think we should continue to work together, Quinn chewed. Maybe, with another team. Some of your mages act like second-rate magicians performing at my nephew's birthday party. I'll be back soon. Sunrunner's cheeks burn. Oh, oh, see ya. Loud Danger, Brazen Fool, and Vengeance coming had already seen the Bloodhawk has left the guild mess. Vengeance coming watched Bloodhawk exit the area. Why did he leave? Sunrunner frowned. Work's done. Brazen Fool sniffled. Why didn't we keep him? Sunrunner scoffed. He left before I could ask him. Everyone was shocked. Brazen Fool rubbed his chin. Roping in this type of expert, just relying on benefits won't work. With his skill, coming over to help us would be the same as the benefits we can give. So he didn't have to think twice. Grace of Night brushed herself off. We need to build a relationship. Sunrunner bit his lip. Right, I originally thought that, but... Loud Danger snapped his fingers. Let's use a honey trap. Hurry up and notify the leader to bring some hot-sounding girl players over. Then, let's match him with Grace of Night. Grace of Night remained silent and only looked at Bloodhawk, who hadn't completely disappeared out of sight yet. Fire Blossom rolled her eyes. 
You know anyone can use a voice changer, right? What a dumb idea. Loud Danger laughed. Hey, hey, it works for guys all the time. Fire Blossom groaned. Idiots. Why am I playing this when I could be playing like, I don't know, The Sims World or something? Grace of Night quickly changes the subject. Don't you guys feel that he's too much of a skilled player? Everyone was startled and immediately went silent. Grace of Night was suspicious. We're top-tier experts in glory, right? Even if we weren't, Sunrunner definitely is. But it looks to me that this guy's still better. Where did he come from? No guild, no club. What level of an expert would he be? Sunrunner coughed. I haven't played on a low-level account in a while. Grace of Night flicked her wrist. We're all low-level. Sunrunner grunted. His weapon was better than mine. I think it's a self-made weapon. Loud Danger threw his index finger in the air. He still hasn't changed classes. In short, everyone had their good and bad points. Sunrunner couldn't salvage his pride. Vine, I can see. I'm afraid this person's skill is higher than mine. But Glory has so many players. How can there not be some hidden experts? It's not like we haven't seen one. Remember that player Coastal Reef? When Sunrunner mentioned Coastal Reef, everyone suddenly went silent. They all knew that this was a name Sunrunner didn't like. Grace of Night, a somewhat recent addition to the team, saw their sullen behavior. Who? Sunrunner gritted his teeth and stepped away from the group. Vengeance coming looked from Sunrunner to Grace. In the ninth server, Coastal Wreath was the Righteous Warrior's guild's focus of attention. He didn't have much of a reputation before, but in a short period, his strength in various battles in the Heavenly Domain made him popular. As we placed more value on him, his equipment improved. Many warriors discussed whether the five great experts should be updated. Of the five great experts, the one most compared with Coastal Reef was Death's Cold Hand, Sunrunner's main account. They were both blade masters. Brazen Fool tapped his blade. Blade masters with their martial arts like playstyle are Glory's most popular class. After Coastal Reef became a topic of discussion, he wasn't modest. He flaunted his damage records, kill counts, victories in arena battles, single-handed duels in wild areas, and everything. He clearly wanted to assert his superiority over Death's cold hand, who almost challenged him to a duel. Vengeance coming frowned. Before that happened, Sunrunner was appointed as the leader in the 10th server. There were many rumors saying that the guild deliberately moved Sunrunner away to make a spot open for Coastal Reef. Brazen placed a hand on Vengeance's shoulder. Sunrunner felt the weight of mockery from Coastal Reef as if his very face would fall off. But finally, he took the initiative to invite Coastal Reef to compare notes in the arena. And Coastal Reef, eagerly waiting for this opportunity, happily accepted Grace of Night shook her head. Why would he do that? Brazen Fool swayed. Embers of the same guild were often sparred in the arena, but it wasn't unusual for our guild. The victor would earn the qualifications to be recognized as one of the Righteous Warriors Guild's five great experts. Grace of Night gasped. What happened? Brazen Fool rolled his eyes. The battle never reached its conclusion. Sunrunner was summoned by the guild leader to bring members to the Pioneer in the 10th server. Vengeance coming drank from his flask. Sunrunner temporarily left the heavenly domain, immersing himself in the new server. The sad part was that he was temporarily set aside by the guild he helped make great. Fire Blossom pouted. The sudden appearance of Bloodhawk brought Coastal Reef to Sunrunner's mind. I hope he doesn't think that'll happen again. Silence enveloped Sunrunner until he received a message from Deathringer. Ha ha ha, why did the experts suddenly leave after breaking the record? Sunrunner grew angry. 
Have you planted a spy in our guild? Deathringer responded. Don't be like this. It's not like you haven't planted any spies either. Sunrunner was insulted. You know I haven't. While mutual spying was common, Sunrunner hadn't done so yet, especially on the second day of the new server. Dead Ringer kept ridiculing. If you're honest, you better not plant any. Sunrunner took the joke. Ha <laughs> ha, if you've actively recruited our players, then blame your poor judgment. Dead Ringer was startled. What do you mean? Sunrunner chose not to reply. Dead Ringer typed. I know you're just trying to scare me, old son. Don't use this small trick. It's beneath you. Sunrunner scout. I don't have time for you. I'm going to level up. Sunrunner went about his business, leaving Dead Ringer in confusion. When his spy reported to him that Bloodhawk had left the Righteous Warrior Guild, Dead Ringer laughed out loud. He was preparing to recruit him. Sunrunner's response took him by surprise. It seemed as if Bloodhawk had been intentionally let out for the other big guilds to recruit. Corpse Forgotten noticed Dead Ringer's worry. What's going on, Ringer? Dead Ringer flicked his teeth. Spies. Oh. Dead Ringer paced back and forth. Dealing with spies in this game isn't easy. And having to be paranoid about one in my rings would only add to my worries. Corpse Forgotten didn't understand. And don't recruit this guy. Bloodhawk is different. As a great expert, if he joined the guild, he would undoubtedly become a crucial figure. He wasn't the type of casual character that could be dismissed. But if this kind of player turned out to be a spy, it would be a disaster. Dead Ringer writhed his hands together. You're too new to remember, Corpse. Glory had once witnessed the downfall of a powerful guild as strong as three great guilds, all because of spies. The guild was destroyed when it was revealed that all of its highly regarded experts were spies from other guilds. As their influence matured, the spies unmasked themselves, causing a mass exodus of players and goods, greatly weakening the guild. To make matters worse, when the guild began recovering its power, central core figures also turned out to be spies, causing another significant loss. The once mighty guild collapsed like the Roman Empire. Glory's guild soon became cautious about their top experts. The larger the guild, the more cautious they were. In the aftermath of the major spy event, champions in the new server became particularly scrutinized. Newly recruited players in the world would start from the bottom and work their way up to the heavenly domain. And now, this Bloodhawk, he suddenly springs up in the tenth server and becomes the center of attention. A person like him would undoubtedly be sought after by renowned guilds. But, is he a spy? Would a spy really be so high profile? Dead Ringer sighed with sorrow, but still decided to contact Bloodhawk. As long as he took precautions on how much power to give him, it would be okay. Bloodhawk, having left Frost Forest, headed towards Bowles. Bowles was a nearby town. After Bloodhawk left the beginner village, he ran directly to Frost Forest and didn't have time to register Bulls as his resurrection location. In this location, after the character died, they would resurrect there. Bulls Town wasn't large, but it had the basic facilities. Gwyn had Bloodhawk go to a warehouse to deposit his newly obtained strong spider silk. Gwyn took his items to the equipment editor's material library. Right when he was about to enter the equipment editor, a message suddenly popped up. He opened it and saw that it was from Snake Tongue. Congratulations, Bloodhawk. We saw your Frost Forest clear record. How awesome. Gwyn laughed. <laughs> All in a day's work. Well, 20 minutes of a day's work. Have you joined the Righteous Warrior Guild? No, I just beat the record for him. I've already left the guild. 
Snake Tongue was astonished. Huh? How many times have you and the Iron Beast run the dungeon? Snake Tongue didn't have to think. Two times. Quinn thought about the run he finished and how the more skilled players asked too many questions, which slowed the record. He enjoyed leading players who listened without backtalk. I can still run it three more times if you're looking for an easy, low-stakes run with a good amount of loot at the end. Snake Tongue was startled. But we do. Of course we do. Bloodhark left the warehouse and hurried to Frost Forest. I'll be there when I get there. Snake Tongue, Hooded Vulture, and Sharkhide were ordinary gamers without the skills of righteous warriors. Quinn preferred to go with Snake Tongue. He saw through the big guild's attempt to recruit him and understood that joining a guild would come with certain responsibilities and commitments. And he'd fall right back into the same situation he had just been fired from. A guild would provide a party for dungeons, leveling, and completing quests. He would also expect him to assist others with the same. Quinn didn't want to have his hands tied. For peak experts like him, not joining a guild meant having the freedom to cooperate with any guild. Today, he helped Righteous Warrior Guild set a new clear record, and next time, he could assist in other guilds. People with some ability to judge would recognize his value. Every guild aiming for a new record would seek him out for assistance. Remaining as a commodity for hire was preferable to joining a guild and restricting his options. How could anything go wrong? Snake Tongue, Hooded Vulture, Shark Hide, and Diamond Ruff left the dungeon, guided by the leadership of Last Chance Over. The second half of the dungeon went smoothly under his guidance. Last chance over smirk. How is that for having a leader with superior skills and extensive expertise? Snake Tongue didn't hold him in high regard. Diamond Ruff, along with the rest, had been influenced by Bloodhawk. Last chance over may be considered highly skilled among players, but they refused to appreciate his ability. Last chance over stood arrogantly. Expecting prey, he received a blunt message. You have been kicked out of the party. Last chance over erupted in anger. What did it is, Grace? How could you kick me out? Snake Tongue waved goodbye. Don't you have something to do? Hurry up. Go do it. Last chance over was fuming in anger. Hooded Vulture threw some loot at Last Chance's feet. Sorry. There's no space anyway. Here's Severance Pay. We have a friend coming. Last Chance Over's eyes brightened. Is it that, uh, Bloodhawk? Snake Tongue furrowed his brow. What does that matter to you? Last Chance Over shamelessly circled around them. Snake Tongue, vexed, considered chopping him to pieces, but being an expert from threatening death restrained him. Hey, Last Chance Over. What's your plan? Get out of here. The annoyance deepened. Facing such a skilled expert, victory seemed impossible. They were fortunate to have Dungeon crawled with him a few times. If a threatening death expert chose him now, would Bloodhawk still play with them? Amidst the turmoil of his thoughts, Bloodhawk approached. Diamond Ruff couldn't contain her excitement. God! Bloodhawk stowed his battle lance. Snake Tongue smiled and went to welcome him. Last chance over darted forward faster than a rabbit. Are you Bloodhawk? It's great to meet you. I'm last chance over, an expert from threatening death. Gwyn lifted an eyebrow and turned to Snake Tom. In the habit of hanging out with fanboys, are you? Last chance over slapped Snake Tongue's back. Snake Tongue and I became good friends in this dungeon. I've heard a lot about you. Snake Tongue was baffled by last chance over's shamelessness. Who are you? Last chance over rubbed Snake Tongue's shoulders. Snake Tongue, bro, don't be like that. Snake Tongue twisted out of Last Chance's grip. We're going. Go do your own thing. Last chance over was very persistent. Bring me too. Let's do some dungeon thumping. Snake Tongue puffed his chest out. There's no space. 
last chance over I Diamond Rock. Good sister girl, can you give your spot to me? Being a newbie, she appeared unsure. Gwyn held up his index finger to intervene before a decision could be made. Are you a cleric? Last chance over presented a bright silvery crop. Yup, my skills are good. Expert, one could say. Hooded Vulture and Sharkhide didn't recognize the weapon, but they could tell it was of high quality. Gwyn clapped his hands. Whoa, a crystal cross! Last chance over caressed his crossbow. You really are an expert. Good eye. Why don't you bring me along? Gwyn shooed last chance with a flick of his wrist. Are you a good shot? Last chance huffed on his fingernail and polished them on his robe. Best shot in the tent server. Gwyn's face lit up. Good for you. Then you'll have no trouble finding another team, because we don't have any need for a cleric. Snake Tongue laughed. Instant kill. Hooded Vulture enjoyed the moment. An instant kill indeed. A five-word instant kill. Last chance over squeezed the grip out in his crossbow. Everyone needs a cleric. Gwyn nodded. Sorry, did I say we don't need one? I meant we would rather die in a pit of tree slugs than bring you along. Snake Tongue genuinely admired Bloodhawk. Go in, go in, go in. The war party rushed into the frost forest. Last chance over was left standing like a statue. Snake Tongue turned. Bloodhawk, how do we do this? Gwyn slammed his fist into his palm. I'll pull, and you guys deal some damage. Got it? I pull, you damage. One wave rush placed significant demands on the main tank's ability to pull monsters, and it required high performance from the other players. Quinn lacked confidence in their damage. Diamond Rock was blunt. Can we set a new record? Snake Tongue felt the shake. What is she doing? Setting a new record is out of the question. Because of Bloodhawk, but our own limitations. The war party progressed through the dungeon, handing dropped items to Quinn. If there was equipment he didn't need, he let them have it. They completed the dungeon twice. The hidden boss was nowhere to be found. No extraordinary equipment dropped. Bloodhawk could run the dungeon once more, but the others had hit the entry limit, forcing them to leave with regret. Outside the dungeon, they found Last Chance Over waiting for them. He rushed over immediately. Last Chance Over knew they could only run the dungeon twice more. No more runs left? A strong urge spiked in Snake Tongue to beat him up. Quinn lifted his chin. I can run it once if the situation calls for it. Last chance over jerk. What a coincidence! I can run it once more, too! Gwyn chuckled. Is that so? Last chance over gestured to three individuals who had joined them. There's something even more coincidental. I have three friends who can only run it once more, too. Don't you think that's even more coincidental? Threatening death flashed above their heads. Gwyn rubbed his chin. That really is a coincidence, or a forced happening. I'm not sure if you know the difference. Since it's such a coincidence, why don't we all run it together? Gwyn looked at the three arrivals. Why don't we set a new record again, right now? Last chance over was brimming with excitement. Okay, okay. Gwyn pointed at the new group. If we're going to set a new record, then I have two conditions. Let's hear it. Gwyn wrapped his arm around Last Chance's shoulder. One, I charge a fee. Last Chance over nodded. Oh, that'll be easy. And the other? Gwyn smiled. We don't need a cleric. Snake Tongue burst into laughter. <laughs> that was good. Hooded Vulture, Shark Hide, and Diamond Ruff all laughed. Last Chance over gritted his teeth. Then what class do you need? Gwyn tapped his chip. Three fire elementalists with magic attacks greater than 430, a level 22 doll shururu auto-leveled, and a witch that can use shadow cloak, if you can spare them. Their technique needs to be good, and their hands need to be steady. They can't make any mistakes or talk as much as you. Last chance over stared blankly. Bringing three elementalists means having a party with the highest damage. 
We're good, but we don't have that. And witches, our party has a high attack. But with our defense, making one mistake could be disastrous. Quinn shrugged. It's a zero mistake mission. Take or live with the sorry excuse for a dungeon time I assume you have. Last chance over scratched his head. I might not be able to gather for a party like that right now. 430 magic attack meant a level 20 fire element staff. Not an easy find. Threatening death had three elementalist weapons, but none were fighter element. Quinn waved his hand. When they've been gathered, you know how to reach me. Last chance over frowned. Besides that, are there any other options? Level 25. Level 25 marked a significant shift. New equipment, new skills, and increased strength for everyone. Last chance over agreed. Fine. I'll add you first as a friend then. Once last chance over, who initially pretended to be decent, befriended him, he revealed his true colors. Then we don't need to set a record right now. All of us can do one more run. Why don't you come with us for a run? Snake Tongue gasped in surprise. What? Hooded Vulture leaned in and whispered to Sharkhot. Last chance over truly is an immortal, invincible, shameless, ultra, unequaled cockroach. Sharkhide agreed. Quinn rocked his head back and forth. I can lower the fee a bit then. Just a bit. Last chance over threw his hands up. You need to charge a fee for this too? Don't tell me you charge them a fee too. I didn't charge a fee, but all the equipment was given to me. Last chance over agreed delightfully. That's fine. We can do the same. Snake Tongue felt uncomfortable hearing this. Quinn gestured to his wardrobe. As you can see, I still haven't changed classes, so I'll take all the equipment. Last Chance Over enthusiastically sent party invite. It's just a few pieces of equipment. Go, go, let's head out. Quinn left his party, and Bloodhawk joined Last Chance Over's party. It was a standard 1MT, 1 healer, and 3 high damage war party. Last Chance Over passed the party leader position to Bloodhawk. Quinn directed Bloodhawk into the dungeon. Get moving, man. I don't want to be running around with you all day. Last Chance Over led the others. He wanted to see how good Bloodhawk really was. Ice and snow drifted in frost forest, casting a silent atmosphere. The five players stood in a line, motionless. The static screen lingered for about half a minute. Last Chance Over tested his headphones. Hey, hey! Gwyn scrunched his face. What are you haying for? Last Chance Over tapped his microphone. Did someone say something? I haven't heard anyone say anything. Gwyn shook his head. No one said anything. Get your act together. Last Chance Over looked at Quinn. Why aren't you talking? Gwyn leaned back. Who are you asking? You! Pointed Last Chance Over. Why do I need to speak? To lead! Gwyn pursed his lips. Who said I was leading? Seems like you got the wrong information on hand. Uh, will you? Gwyn put his fist to his chin to think. Oh, sure. Good uh, for a second there, Gwyn smirked. Leading fee. Last chance over his face dropped. You're not going that far, are you? Gwyn laughed. Last chance over sighed. What's the leading fee? Gwyn counted on his hand. One, two, three, oh, uh, we'll say ten white wolf bristles. The four players expressed contempt. The white wolf's hair wasn't the bristle. The bristles had a chance to drop from Frost Forest's hidden boss, the white wolf, which was considered an uncommon material. Quinn dusted his hands clean. I'm up for a leisurely game. If you want to do this dungeon in uh, half an hour, lead the way. Or do whatever you think leading is. I guess prance on and I'll follow. Last chance over thought for a bit. Fine, but I can only give it after we exit the dungeon. I didn't bring any with me. Gwyn glanced at the other players. Can I trust his word? Last chance over grunted. Big guilds won't go back on their work. I'm sure you trusted those nobodies outside the forest. Quinn 
to express his doubts. Last chance over, in the very short time I've known you, you've shown yourself as an outrageously shameless worm. Night Baron motioned to Bloodhawk. You can trust him. Okay, then. We have ourselves a regular old-fashioned dungeon crawl. Last chance over shook with excitement. Hurry up and go! Quinn directed. MT, pull the monsters. High damage flares, go up. Healer, support the MT. Don't ask questions. The four stared blankly as if they all glitched at the same moment. Last chance over was confused. That's it? Quinn slapped his forehead. Of course, I can't play your avatars for you. Last chance over grabbed hands full of his hair. What type of leading is this? You're all experts. You should know what to do. If they followed the standard routine, their party didn't need any leading. They could handle it themselves. Last chance over felt duped. No, no, no good. This won't work. I have to make sure these ten white bristles are worth their price. You have to lead a step by step. Gwyn sighed. Let me spell it out in noob terms. Knight, pull the two goblins at ten o'clock. There are three possibilities. If both are long range, get close to them as fast as possible. If attacked while closing in, use descending phoenix hammer. You'll jump over their attacks and the shockwave will flip them over. When close, pull aggro from one steadily. If there's one melee and one long ranged, use falling star hammer to interrupt the long ranged one's attack. When the melee one comes close, use repel. Pull the long ranged one's aggro first. If there are two ones, use descending phoenix hammer and then repel one of them. Establish the remaining one's aggro. Understand? Good. Let's get to this boss and get me some gear. Bloodhawk strutted out of Frost Forest 30 minutes and 8 seconds after entering. A smug smile was stretched across his face. Last chance over hung his head and soul. His teaming up with Quinn marked an uneventful run through Frost Forest, a dungeon that could easily be conquered by ordinary five-man parties in about 30 minutes. Quinn flicked a speck of dust off his glove. That went well. I thought. Last chance over simmered with frustration. He clenched his jaw as he reluctantly forfeited Quinn's leading feet, an act that left last chance over seething. This so-called strategy you shared was best. No one could benefit from it but useless beginners. This whole day was nothing but a fruitless dungeon run. Throughout the whole thing, you were no better than one of our mid-level guild members. Bloodhawk, from start to finish, refrained from guiding them directly, opting instead to provide instruction. Bloodhawk led them with an air of oppressive expertise, making even these seasoned players appear foolish. Last chance over turned red. I'm starting to believe your fame incompetent. We're expecting me to make mistakes. You're trying to make me look weak. Bloodhawk tilted his head. Oh, no, you don't need any help for me to look weak and stupid. Stupid? Last chance over shoved a finger in Bloodhawk's face. You couldn't wait to call on my errors and make me feel like a fool. Bloodhawk listened patiently. Again, you're doing pretty good at that on your own. Probably the only thing you've been an expert at all day. Last chance over squeezed his fists till they shook. Are you trying to pull a fast one on us? Quinn feigned sadness. Oh, don't say that. It'll hurt my feelings. If you think you could have done better with this lot, go ahead. I'll even bet you my payment. Double or nothing. Last chance over found himself at a loss for words. Bloodhawk's leadership was ordinary, but lacked any discernible flaw. The run went well under his guidance. It just wasn't the record-breaking run he wanted. Last chance over acknowledged Bloodhawk's solid foundation, attempting to salvage the belief that the dungeon run was not a complete waste of time. Wynn polished his boot buckle. Let me know when you're planning to collect the white wolf bristles. Last chance over felt his head about to explode. You tricked me! After obtaining the white wolf bristles, Quinn departed. 
We're talking in circles. Let me know if you want to test that record any time when you get the team together. Win quickly turned back to last chance. Oh, and have my payment. Last chance over remained motionless, mirroring the bewildered state of the player behind the avatar. Night Baron tapped him twice. Turning his head, last chance over saw the fellow adventurer engrossed in a post on the glory forums rather than the game. Night Baron revealed the chat. When I heard him lead, I thought it felt familiar. Look here. A quick glance at the screen caused last chance over to shriek. Quinn's basic skills were nothing but a blatant copy from a guy down to the last word. The frustration mounted as last chance over understood the depth of the deception. Night Baron cracked his knuckles. We've been duped. Eight white wolf bristles traded for a hundred percent clear rate guide. Last chance over felt a sense of helplessness. He had willingly allowed himself to be deceived, forcing Bloodhawk to dungeon with him and demanding leadership that wasn't promised. The repercussions were painfully clear. Last chance over gritted his teeth. That underhanded cheat. He sent a furious message to Bloodhawk. You're a scoundrel. You tricked us with a guy. Gwyn typed. I wouldn't. That guide is worth its weight in gold. I should know. I wrote that guide. Last chance over turned to Night Baron. Who wrote that guide? Night Baron checked. Let's see. It was. He scrolled to the top of the guide. Gutter Zion. Last chance over boiled with anger. He slammed down on the keyboard. What are you boasting for? That guide was written by the battle god Utter Zion. Quinn kept it short. Yup, like I said. Last chance over was speechless. A parting message from Quinn added. I got things to do, last chump. Get in touch later when you're ready to hire me. Last chance over kicked the air. Escape. This was an escape. What could he possibly have to do at three in the morning? The Area 51 cafe hummed with the low buzz of computers and the occasional frustrated sigh of defeated customers. Quinn busied himself by slouching behind the reception desk, absent-mindedly glaring at the bright screen of the front desk computer. The nut had been exceptionally quiet. A wearied-eyed customer approached Quinn and pointed at the soda fridge. Hey, can I get a soda? Wynn glanced up. Well, isn't that a novel request? The customer raised an eyebrow. So can I get it or not? Gwyn reached for a soda without look. Sure, sure, here you go. Enjoy the pinnacle of refreshment. The customer took the soda, shooting Quinn a disapproving look and wandered off. One person waved for attention. Hey, my internet is down. Can you fix it? Gwyn glanced at them, unfazed. Internet down, you say? Have you tried turning it off and on again? That always works sometimes. Or try another one. He looked at the first open terminal. Fifteen. I'll open it from here. By seven in the morning, the patrons began shutting down their computers one by one and departed. Bloodhawk had reached level 21. Beyond the beginner village, leveling became slower. The required experience surged and there was now a dungeon entry limit. While level 20 characters could endlessly run the skeleton graveyard, the experience gained had seriously diminished. Post level 20, players had to rely on completing quests and defeating wild monsters to progress. On the 10th service level leaderboard, Quinn noted names like Sunra and Last Chance over, all at level 24. These players dedicated themselves to the new server day and night to achieve such heights. A distinct contrast emerged between these guild-nurtured players and the ordinary one. The level 22 and level 23 positions were nearly vacant behind the top level 24s. Levels 20 and 21 were commendable because they meant the dedication of hard-working players. Most players had yet to leave the beginner village. Marsha arrived for the day shift on time. Morning, Quinn. Quinn logged out of the game and shut down the counter's computer. Yeah, yeah, good to see you on time. He motioned to the gaming station. Everyone's busy. I'm off work. Have fun. 
Marsha began to open up her soap operas and unenthusiastically waved by. Okay. Wynne stretched and headed back to the second floor in her rooms. He opened the door and heard the sounds of a TV from the living room. Wynne entered. Jenny, up so early? To his surprise, he found Jenny sleeping on the sofa without any blankets, curled up like a shrimp. Gwyn playfully nudged her twice. Jenny, go to your room and get some sleep. You're taking up the whole couch. Jenny flipped over with a look of disdain for the disturbance of her sleep. Gwyn noticed that Jenny's bedroom door was open. He entered, searching for something to cover her. He assessed the room with a few glances, noting that the floor, walls, and ceiling were relatively new. The decorations and bed appeared old-fashioned. A few posters of professional glory avatars hung here and there. Quinn didn't dwell on it, taking the blanket from Jenny's disheveled bed to cover her. After turning off the TV, he headed back to the meager storage room to catch some sleep. Jenny couldn't recall how many times she had fallen asleep on the sofa while watching TV. She would wake up with a shiver from the cold and slowly crawl into bed. But waking up today, she had a warm wrapped blanket around her. It felt familiar, undoubtedly hers, leading the half-awake Jenny to believe she was in bed. Contentedly, she wrapped the blanket around herself and flipped resulting in a loud thud as she tumbled off the sofa. Clutching onto the blanket, it took Jenny a while to shake off the day. It was only then that she realized she had fallen from the sofa. Holding the blanket, she climbed back up. Jenny rinsed her mouth and washed her face in the bathroom. As someone rang the doorbell, toothbrush in her mouth, she went to answer. At the door stood a girl with various bay, offering a smile. Jenny had a mouthful of toothpaste foam. Oh, Tara, you're back. Tara, laden with bed, found it inconvenient to retrieve her key, so she had rung the doorbell. Yeah, just got up. She asked. Yeah. She looked at the clock. It was late for Jenny. Work the night shift again. Jenny continued brushing her teeth. No, I got a new guy for that. I just slept late yesterday. Foam leaked down her chin. She cuffed it. Tara placed her bags on the floor. You could have finished brushing your teeth first. Jenny jogged to the bathroom. Tara leaned on the wall outside the bathroom door. Who's this new employee that you let smoke in the lobby? Jenny stood in the doorway, wiping her chin. Did Marsha tell you? Tara scrutinized the storage room. Yeah, but she didn't have to. I could smell it when I came in. Jenny pulled Tara away. He doesn't have a spot to stay, so I've let him sleep there for the time being. Tell me about your trip. Tara shrugged. It was fine. Family is good. I want to hear about this new guy. As the gossip goes, he managed to get you pretty upset on his first day. Jenny bit her lip. Marsha loves drama. It's perplexing, to say the least. Last night, I had the urge to strangle him to death. On the one hand, he infuriates me, but on the other hand, put a blanket over me this morning. Good things, bad things, he seems to cover the options. Tara felt Jenny wasn't saying everything. What's wrong? Nothing. He's really good at glory. Tara chuckled. How good, like you? Jenny rolled her eye. You're dead, girl. Jenny had a pang of discontentment as she brought up the topic. Tara wasn't in to playing glory. Jenny had tried to introduce the game to her earlier, hoping they could play together. Tara had given it a try. In the first round, she was defeated. She asked Jenny about specific action, and in the second round, Tara faced another bitter loss. Jenny explained a few more tactics to watch out for that opponent might glory. By the third round, Tara turned the table and thoroughly dominated her opponent. This is so easy! Jenny was dumbfounded. A completely new player needed only two rounds to grasp the controls. Understanding the strategy allowed Tara to shine. Jenny was glad to see Tara had picked up the game so fast. They decided to duel. She lost to Tara. Jenny refused to believe it. 
Dara, who initially didn't want to continue playing after her first loss, was coerced into another round. Jenny managed to win a few times, but Tara consistently demonstrated raw skill. Jenny now understood why Tara could inexplicably beat her. Action per minute! Girl, you're blessed with astonishing speed. Jenny, having played Glory for three years, believed she was on the brink of becoming an expert. But watching Tara play, she questioned how good she could get. Tara had a natural talent, pure and simple. If someone with this level of talent didn't play Glory, it would be a waste. Jenny practiced, trying to defeat a swamp monster so she could level, but she kept failing. She damaged the reptilian beast to half-life at best before dying. Then Tara took her account card. After a few attempts, Tara successfully completed the challenge. Jenny was left speechless. Whenever she encountered a formidable opponent in the last two years, she dragged Tara to try. Each time, Tara did some wild moves and slaughtered the monster, and then she turned and asked, It was that easy? It was that easy? Maybe for you? This constant refrain wore Jenny out, facing opponents she couldn't beat. Tara would casually say, That was easy. Jenny stopped having Tara play with her. Jenny tossed her towel on the couch. What do you say we grab some breakfast? Tara yawned. I don't know, girl. I'm kind of tired. Let's have a slow morning relaxing. Whatever you say, we can order some eggs and bacon from down the street. I'll go get Quinn and you can meet him. Tara immediately pulled at Jenny. Oh, it's fine. Didn't he just finish the night shift? Let's wait until he gets up. I have to stay, Jenny, and don't take it the wrong way but you might have a crush on this guy. Jenny blushed and then snapped back. I don't have a crush on him. He's an unemotional, impertinent robot who cares about nothing but that game and whatever else is going on in his head. He's just an employee. Tara put her hands up. Okay, okay. Strong defense for just an employee. Take it easy if you say so. Jenny grabbed the TV remote. I don't like him never cares to listen to me or make any time for me or... Oh my god, do I like Quinn? Quinn woke and splashed water on his face. He looked at the mirror and saw a sticky note. I bought you breakfast. Quinn ripped the tough meat with his teeth. Who in the world eats faux bacon and soy egg? Gwyn scanned the cafe for an open spot in the smoking area. He felt his pockets. His cigarette box was empty. This was more agonizing than eating fake bacon. To make matters worse, he had no money. Quinn considered asking Jenny for his pay in advance, but given her aversion to smoking, making this request seemed futile. While lost in thought, Jenny patted his back. He twisted around. The tough bacon hanging out of his mouth nearly smacked her face. Jenny had a fiery temper. You hold cigarettes in your mouth? You hold bacon in your mouth? What can't you hold in your mouth? You don't know how to use your hands? Thinking of hands, Jenny remembered. How elegant Quinn's hands are. Having them tainted by smoke or grease would be a shame. Stop it. Don't think about him. Jenny shook her head and glared at Quinn. This is giving me a headache. Come with me. Gwyn followed Jenny to the reception desk. When Tara saw Jenny bringing Quinn, she stood up and smiled. Jenny introduced the two. Tara, Quinn. Tara extended her hands. Hi. Quinn mumbled with a faux bacon in his mouth, making his pronunciation unclear. Hi. Jenny interrupted the meeting. Come, come, come. You guys fight around. She went straight to the main subject. Looking as if she had waited all day and had to restrain herself from dragging Quinn out of bed. Quinn was taken off guard. Fight? While there are some people I'd like to hit, I don't think punching a girl is going to do me any favors. Jenny laughed. In glory! You think I want you brawling in the alley like a bunch of drunken idiots? Quinn glanced at Tara. Oh, you think you're pretty good at glory, do ya? 
Tara smiled. No, I don't know how. Gwyn laughed. Jenny heard this and tightened her face. If you can't play, then what am I? Tara gestured her hands as if weighing the facts. You really can play. I'm just so-so, that's all. Gwyn didn't understand. So-so? Is that a skill level in the new server? Jenny dragged the two to their station. Don't listen to her modesty. She really can play. Ara, use my smoke shy. She turned to Quinn. And you? You reached level 20 last night, right? What class did you change to? Quinn shook his head. I haven't changed. I am what I am, which is great, whatever the class. What? You're not going to change? Unspecialized, baby. I don't do labels. Jenny's eyes bugged. Unspecialized. And don't call me baby unless you want to go look for another job. Even in her five years, the era of unspecialized characters was long gone. She had only heard a few veterans bring it up, and using their words, it was just a legend. Jenny kicked up an eyebrow. How do you play as an unspecialized character? How are you going to level after 50? Quinn put on his gaming gauntlet. You think I'd be wasting my time if I didn't know what I'm doing? Have a little faith. How are you going to level? Heavenly domain. Jenny's jaw dropped. Are you joking? You want to complete the heavenly domain challenges at level 50? You got to admit, pretty cool, right? Jenny tried to analyze how difficult that would be. But after a while, she couldn't figure it out. It seemed too challenging and she didn't even know where to start. She put her face in her hand. A level 50 challenging the heavenly domain? You're mad. Quinn laughed and logged into his account. I'll make it fair for you, since I'm level 21. I'll play against your level 70 in the fixed field. Jenny shook her head. You want to use that lousy account? No, I'll borrow whatever class you want to play with. This was why Jenny asked what class Quinn changed to. With many frequent customers, Jenny was confident she could borrow an account. Quinn smirked. Unspecialized. Jenny hit Quinn's arm. Get lost. Tara observed the interaction, quite interested. She deserved that he was, just as everyone described, very adept at making Jenny angry. We can just casually fight one round. There's no need to be so serious. Quinn rubbed his hands together. Last thing I want to do is get serious. Jenny wagged a finger. How is a level 21 and a level 70 going to fight? Big spiel. Jenny was speechless. Tara looked at Jenny. What's a fixed field? Jenny helped Tara with her VR headset. The fixed field is for practice. Victory or defeat won't be recorded. In the fixed field, the system standardizes attributes and equipment. It doesn't matter the level, but a level 21 definitely wouldn't have skills that could be learned after level 20. Wynn took the opportunity to wag his finger this time. You forgot. I'm unspecialized. Level doesn't matter. Jenny finally understood. Right. An unspecialized character. The level didn't matter because unspecialized characters couldn't learn level 20 and above skills anyway. Okay, today I'll open my eyes and see this so-called unspecialized character. Jenny stood behind Tara, pointing. Make a room, okay? Pick that map, right? The smallest one. Invite him, Blood Hawk. Right, those two words. Tara sent the invite and the system prompted. The player you have invited is not in the arena. Jenny slapped Gwyn's arm. What are you doing? Hurry up! Blood Hawk had leveled up the previous night. Hold your horses, I'm adding my skill points. Leveling, clearing dungeons, and completing quests had earned him quite a few skill points that he hadn't allocated yet. Jenny mumbled to herself. So slow. Tara remained calm and unhurried and observed Smokeshy's equipment. Have you recently gotten any good equipment? Jenny growled. No, it's not so easy for everyone, Tara. Quinn waved his hands at her, wanting for her to come over. Wanting me and her to battle around, you don't have any particular reason, do you? 
if you're expecting me to lose, you'll be sadly disappointed. What do you think? I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. This is your dog and pony show. You don't need me to let her win, right? Jenny propped her fist on her hands. Let? Say it after you've beaten her. Quinn nodded and let Bloodhawk enter the arena. Okay, okay. You say so. Ready. Tara invited and Quinn accepted. Jenny ran behind Tara. Quinn wasn't in a rush. He stretched out his neck. Fight like this? Quinn thought about smoking a cigarette, which he couldn't afford. Do you want to do a little betting? Jenny snarled. What betting? Quinn feigned thinking on the spot. Oh, I don't know. Maybe, uh, for, uh, hmm, a pack of cigarettes? Jenny almost died from anger. Right when she was about to roar, Tara interrupted. I don't smoke, and I don't have any cigarettes either. Let's bet 20 bucks. Quinn looked forward to a smoke. You got a deal. Do you mind advancing me so I can smoke while I beat you? Jenny scoffed. Play first. Tara took out a $20 bill and gave it to Jenny. Then I'll put the money down. Jenny was flabbergasted. Do you both agree? Tara laughed. It's just for fun. Jenny took Tara's money and eyed Quinn. And you? Quinn felt inside his pockets. I, oh, that's nothing. I have a rare cigarette box. He held out an ordinary cigarette box and smiled. Jenny took out a 20 and waved it in front of him. You've gone mad from poverty, haven't you? I'll let you borrow this. I'll deduct it from your salary. I'll pay it back immediately, after my percentage, of course. Taro spun in a circle. How confident. We're starting. The scene changed, and the two entered the arena. The map was the smallest stage, and the opponents stood on opposite sides. Jenny served as the coach outside the stage. He still hasn't changed classes. This is called an unspecialized character. He'll have many skill variations. By looking at his weapon, you can figure out which class of skill he's going to use. Tara hadn't officially played Glory for over a year. She had played many rounds of player killing for Jenny and knew about some of the different classes. Tara pointed to the screen. Then what is the weapon in his hand called? Jenny looked for a long time but couldn't recognize it. This, this, uh... She threw a pencil at Quinn to get his attention. What's that weapon? Quinn smirked. If you have to ask, you probably won't get it. Tara moved Smoke Shy a few steps and zoomed in. It looks like an umbrella. Jenny leaned forward to get a better look. Umbrella? There's no such weapon. How to be a broom, right? Tara hung. Is a broom more of a weapon than an umbrella? Jenny nudged Tara. Just play. Bloodhawk ran forward in a straight line towards Smokeshy. Heads up! Tara reacted quickly. As Bloodhawk moved, she had already moved her instantly and shot accurately. In a blur, Bloodhawk shook and avoided the shot. Jenny watched from the side, recognized this move as Z-shape. The principle was simple, but extremely difficult to execute. After dodging the shot, Bloodhawk closed the distance, lowering his body and slide kicking towards Smoke Shot. Jenny was impressed. Crafty. Slide kick was a gunner skill, a body skill, so the weapon didn't matter. He waited to use the thousand chance umbrella. Aura's reaction speed didn't disappoint Jenny's expectations. Before the slide kick hit, Smoke Shy rolled out of the way. She quickly got up, prepared to use a body skill to hit back. Her dodges, moves, and attacks were executed with quickness. The screen flashed with a shining white light. Bloodhawk's right hand drew a sharp sword from the unknown weapon in his left hand. This shining light was the Blade Master skill, Sword Draw. The attack surprised Jenny. Tara's left hand had already tapped the gauntlet twice. Her right hand swung, causing Smokeshy to leap backward and prepare to fire another shot. This move dodged the sword draw attack and counterfired. After the shot launched, using the recoil, she flew backward to increase their distance. 
Just as Jenny was about to cheer, she didn't anticipate that after Bloodhawk used sword draw, his sword had already returned to the sheath. He seized the opportunity to chain sword, belt, and sheath, and chase after the mid-air smoke shot. He had closed in. This change happened rapidly. Jenny couldn't figure out which Blademaster attack involved a sheath, but she felt that there was still a bit of distance between Smokeshot and Bloodhawk. The umbrella in Bloodhawk's hands opened up and flipped. The umbrella bones turned upside down, concentrating on the tip as if it were a lance. It stabbed towards Smokeshot. Immediately following, Bloodhawk flipped the handle, and this lance drew a semicircle, bringing Smokeshy along with it and flipping her upside down. Jenny was shocked. This wasn't any ordinary attack. This was a skill called Circle Swing, a battle mage skill. This wasn't a rare skill among unspecialized characters, but the problem was that Bloodhawk had used that thing to execute sword draw, so it should be a swordsman class weapon. How could it suddenly turn into a battle mage lance in the blink of an eye? Tara was more stuck by his technique. After fighting for a bit, she was actually slower by a level. This was something she hadn't expected. Due to Glory being a first-person perspective game, skills like Circle Swing were relatively strong. Having the sky in fur flipping upside down in an instant destroyed people's sense of direction putting the victim in a loss of direction. This sudden viewpoint change was too much for Tara. What just happened? Jenny, what do I do? Tara figured out the direction and twitched her body. Smokeshy was unable to turn over. Her character raised her head. One of Bloodhawk's feet had stepped on her. While the other was on the ground, that thing in his hand had returned back to his original shape. This time, it looked like a close-range pose. Jenny and Tara finally saw that it really was an umbrella and that the umbrella's tip was aimed at Smokeshy's head. The two still hadn't recovered from the shock when the umbrella tip unleashed a tongue of flame. At the height of the friendly duel between Quinn and Tara, Bloodhawk had Smokeshy at a disadvantage. The edge of his thousand chance umbrella was aiming point blank. Flames fight. Gunner class sharpshooter skill. Punish her. Jenny was dumbstruck. Damn, what is that thing? The weapon in Bloodhawk's hands was a trinity. Sword, lance, gun. Tara's fingers quickly jumped, and Smokeshy executed a roundhouse kick. After Bloodhawk leaped to avoid it, Smokeshy raised her hands and launched an anti-tank missile. Tara acted fast. The skill itself activated fast. The distance was close. Bloodhawk took the explosion head on, turning into a cloud of smoke. Tara and Jenny were both startled in the fixed field. Players couldn't be killed instantly like this. Even if they were, the dead player would leave a corpse. Tara looked for Bloodhawk. Dead or alive. How could he just turn into a cloud of smoke? Oh no, not good. It was too late. Blood blossomed from Smokeshy's neck. Ninja class assassin kill. Cutthroat. This skill had to be used from behind the target, adding to the armor ignoring back attack. It was a low level skill, but still dealt considerable damage. As for Bloodhawk, who had been turned into smoke by the anti-tank missile, the two both understood too late that it was the Shadow Clone technique. After dodging her roundhouse kick, he used the skill, leaving the clone in front of her while his real body split behind her, complete the cut throat. Tara suffered multiple attacks. She wore a look of extreme concentration. After a series of rapid movements, Smokeshy flew through the blood blossom like an arrow. She completed a 180-degree turn in midair, not even half a meter above the ground. She moved with speed, searching for Quinn to fire at. But when her character turned, she only saw a sword light chopping down towards her, ringing along a bloody mist. Swordsman class berserker skill, collapsing mountain. The skills learned by unspecialized characters didn't have the damage bonuses given if they were done by the skill's original class. 
their original effects would change. Collapsing mountain chopped down toward smoke shot. After hitting the ground, there was a short knock-up effect. Bloodhorse quickly seized the opportunity and kneed her, smashing smoke sky higher into the air. With a shake of the thousand chance umbrella, the mid-air smoke shy was gunned down repeatedly. Launcher skill, BBQ. After being barbecued by gunfire, smoke shy fell to the ground and immediately turned over to fight. She couldn't find Bloodhawk, but she saw a green goblet swaying around, throwing rocks at her. Tara and Jenny both collapsed. Mage class, summoner skill, summoned pet. Raising her hands, she bombarded the goblet. Bloodhawk suddenly dropped from the sky, stepping on top of Smoke Shy's head. Fighter class striker skill, eagle stamp. Tara no longer had that previous, just for fun attitude. Being stepped on was the final straw. Smoke Shy pointed her gun up toward the sky, ready to gun him down. To her surprise, Bloodhawk's umbrella tip aimed at her. A flame tongue shot out and more blood blossomed from Smoke Shy's head. Bloodhawk used the recoil of this gun and easily blew backward with aerial fire. Gross combat was disadvantageous towards launchers. Tara had wanted to use aerial fire the entire time to pull apart the distance, but this time, Bloodhawk unexpectedly took the initiative to distance himself. After being hit multiple times, Smokeshy didn't have much life left. Bloodhawk didn't even seem like he had been tucked. Tara hadn't given up hope. She prepared to continue attacking. Quinn turned to her. How about we save you some base and stop fighting? Why? Quinn let out a deep, Audible exhale. How do I say this mildly? It turns out you have no idea whatsoever how to play. Unless you consider a blind cat slamming their paws down on a game gauntlet playing. He smiled, thinking that eased the insulting and blunt comment. Tara didn't know what to say. Aside from Jenny explaining a few things to her, she really didn't know much else. But even like this, relying on her speech, she helped her defeat opponents Jenny couldn't win against. She had even completed the Heavenly Domain skill challenge, which was difficult for the majority of the players. Tara didn't quite understand glory, but she played with tenacity. Jenny didn't know Quinn's strength. His professional background suggested he was stronger than ordinary players. At worst, Tara would dismiss it again with a casual, So it was that easy. This was Jenny original intention. Every time she encountered Quinn, he managed to infuriate her. Frustrated, Jenny abandoned her initial idea and positioned herself behind Tara, hoping Tara would defeat Quinn to release her anger. Then, Tara was beaten without a chance to retaliate. It was only after Quinn remarked, You have no idea whatsoever how to play, that she gave up hope. Jenny found his comments somewhat excessive. Don't know how to play? If that was considered not knowing how to play, then what about all those opponents she defeated? You're just a bum who has nothing better to do but play this game. Tara has a life outside of glory. Quinn held a smug look on his face. He stood up. Your technique is quick. I'll give you that. But your hand-eye coordination is a chaotic mess. Like, you just figured out you had thumbs. When your viewpoint suddenly changes, your adaptability and judgment pretty much turn into a drowning victim. You flail and do yourself more harm than good. You don't understand the equipment and have no idea how to use your skills. Your real combat experience is too little and your tactics are too rigid. If you want to beat me, then practice a bit and come back in about a uh, hundred years. Jenny jabbed a finger in Quinn's chest. Hey, you're going too far. Do you really need to be so harsh? Quinn stepped back. Okay, I'm sorry. It was a little excessive. The hundred years part was too much. You don't need to wait that long. If I somehow lose my hands in an industrial accident, then you'll stand a chance. But even then, Jenny became so furious that her nose almost went crooked. You just can't say anything good. She glanced at Tara. Quinn scrunched his face. I said her technique was quite quick. I said that. Didn't I? Uh, she doesn't sweat as much as you do when she plays? Jenny was shaking from anger. Sweat? 
Uh, what else? Quinn thought hard, shifting in his seat. What else? She's pretty good looking. Jenny almost had a stroke. He said she's pretty good looking, but didn't that mean there wasn't a single good point about her playing? Tara's going to be angry. She is going to be angry. Jenny lowered her head. Tara was biting her lips, her right hand tightly balled into a fist. If she were Jenny, she would have grabbed the closest sharp object and started stabbing him with it. But Tara was her. Tara rubbed her nose. Say it after we finished fighting. Gwyn sighed. There's no need. I was going easy on you before. If not, after the eagle stamp, I would have used falling light blade, sky strike, swept the floor, dragon tooth, falling flower palm, and then you'd be dead. Doorknob central. Tara smirked. Then why didn't you continue? Quinn rubbed his hands together. If I did that, then I'd have won and taken your 20 bucks. But you really don't know how to play. He stared at Jenny for emphasis. To put it kind. So if I completely destroyed you, that would be too messed up. Even though I need a smoke, it'd be too much to take your 20 bucks. Like taking candy from a baby that doesn't know how to hold on to candy. Or how to eat candy. Or that candy even exists. Nah, forget it. Gwyn pointed at Jenny's $20 bill. However, that 20 bucks is mine. You can deduct that from my salary. Jenny was so angry she was shaking. You, you. She crumpled the 20 bucks into a ball and threw it at him. Take it. Gwyn caught it. Thanks. Care for a snack from the gas station? Tara stood up and handed over the 20 bucks she bet. If I lost, I lost. You take this 20. Gwyn waved his hands in refusal. Forget about it. I can't take it. Not like this. I'm no saint, but I don't want any enemies here. Jenny glared at Quinn. You could have fooled me. She looked at Tara. Take it, she shouted. She knew Tara's temper. If Quinn insisted on not accepting the money, things wouldn't end well. She feared that Quinn might be someone who would bash his head against a brick wall to prove a point. If he didn't take the money no matter what, what could she do? Quinn motioned to Jenny. Then give it to her. I owe her money. Jenny was furious. You selfish jerk. Don't kick the ball to me. Don't make me take her money. Tara had different intentions. She handed the 20 to Jenny. His debt is clear now. Tara put on the VR headset. Let's fight another round. Unless you're afraid, that is. Tara wasn't like Jenny, and she wouldn't start yelling and strangling Quinn when things went awry. She was a firm believer that facts spoke louder than words and would use her strength to make others speechless. Due to the nature of the fixed field, there was no victory or defeat. The players were also free to enter or exit whenever they wanted to. Tara sat down. She selected the again option. Without waiting for Quinn, she pulled another 20 bucks out of her pocket and put it on the table. It's still one round. I don't really know how to play but I hope you'll treat this challenge seriously. Wynn turned to face Jenny. Jenny spread out her hands and carelessly struck. Fix your own problems. Quinn geared up in the gaming equipment. He sighed. If you want to lose again, I'll beat you again. It's your funeral. Digital funeral. You know what I mean. The round started. Jenny stood behind Tara, but this time she quietly watched without saying anything. She also wouldn't fuss too much about nothing. The situation was the same as the previous round. Smokeshy lost without even touching Bloodhawk's clothing. The difference this time was Bloodhawk didn't show any mercy. He depleted Smokeshy's life without hesitation. Smokeshy dropped dead. Tara, without expressing any emotions, said, Again! She pulled out another 20 bucks and slapped it down. Loss. Again! Loss. Again. Loss. Quinn didn't say a word. Jenny looked at him. He played like he always played. No thought, all instinct. She saw that Bloodhawk didn't show the slightest amount of mercy. Concentrated and cautious. He didn't let a single opportunity go. Vicious and merciless. Cafe guests gradually noticed the competition. A few regular customers had left their stations and gathered to watch, and then more and more. 
They knew Quinn from the front desk. He arrived a couple of days ago and did the night shift. Seeing the battle, customers behind Tara watched in awe. Bloodhawk? That's the 10th server's Bloodhawk! He's the destroyer of dungeons! Tara and Quinn weren't disturbed by the crowd. They continued to battle without worry, if it could be called a battle. Quinn defeated her and didn't take any more damage than a scratch. Jenny looked at the group of spectators. They were eager to watch Bloodhawk. She grabbed Clayton by the collar. What do you know about this guy? The 10th server's most popular player. Three first clears, Frostbore's clear record holder, and has joined one of the three great guilds, the Righteous Warriors Guild. Jenny frowned. I know that guild. He's not a part of that guild. He's a lone player. Dara put another 20 down. Quinn rolled his eyes. Yeah, yeah, I'll do my best to let you keep it, but losing to you is like jumping off a mountain and expecting gravity to put up a fight. Jenny tried to stop Tara. Another 20? Tara, no, 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 no. Tara lost 10 rounds in a row in those 10 rounds. Bloodhawk dodged every one of her attacks. He didn't take a bit of damage. Tara remained unmoved. She pulled out her purse. Again! 